Many of today's programs are made possible by a grant from the Dana Corporation. Many of today's programs are made possible by a grant from Panel Processing Incorporated. Hi, I'm Jess Smith, and next time on Three Ancient Cuisines, we're going to celebrate the ancient dumpling from China, the infamous pot sticker. How about easy to make pot stickers shaped like cigars? Or boiled dumplings, wonderful wonton soup from Italy, potato gnocchi. Potato gnocchi served with a wonderful beef and tomato sauce and wonderful filled ravioli when we celebrate the dumpling on the Frugal Gourmet. Join us Thursday evening at 6. Stay tuned to CMU Public Television, a public service of Central Michigan University. Many of today's programs are made possible in part by a grant from Martin Marietta. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. Part of that challenge is that we are replacing a barn that unfortunately had to come down. This was a very young barn and people didn't care for it. There are some disadvantages to having a fireplace, right, Tommy? Right, and we have a key example here when we have a, an envelope of an R30. And you want to cut a hole in it and actually leave a window open is what you're doing. It smells like Christmas. That's exactly what it is. This is balsam fir. And this is widely used in this area for Christmas trees. I wouldn't give you two bucks for this one. Funding for this old house is provided by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health, like a good neighbor. State Farm is there. Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to this old house. Oh, it's a three-ring circus around here today. Over there in the field in those yellow and white tents is where Steve is. He's supposed to be here opening the show, but he'd rather be over there learning how to timber frame. And I'll go and take you over there to meet him in a few minutes. But first, I want to show you the progress that's going on here. Tommy Silva and his crew have been working all week on the foundation, and now they've actually started to set some wood. Hi, Tommy. Hi, Norm. How's it going? Good. I see you've started to set some sills here. And yeah, we have the walls. pressure treated down. Got a pressure treated sill, and from that, the walls will go up and we'll start some construction. But, you know, I haven't been here every day for the last week or so, and I'd like to go around and talk about the progress that you've made. Sure, sure. You know, here's one of the pilasters. Yeah. You did a nice job with those. Now, up here, I see you use some foam insulation. Yeah, that was just to keep the uh, cement from oozing through. It's easier to do that, no, I'm than cut a piece a of wood. wood yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then you've got a whole series of pilasters, one here, another one over here. And you did a real nice job scribing your forms in to keep the concrete from falling out. It looks great. Thanks. Now, up here, there's a pocket. Yeah, that's for the, uh, the beam that's going to run across from from pilaster to pilaster to cut the span of the floor down. That'll be, there'll be two of those running through and then the floor joists are gonna go across. Right. Now over here, I see you've used that new curtain wall technique with the concrete block. How do you yeah. like it? I like it, Norm. It was easy and fast. Uh, we've already coated the interior and then I just wanted to get this stripped away. Now we're gonna coat the whole thing with it, that. It has a fiberglass strand in it and it's like a mortar. Makes it real strong. So even with one side coated, it's real solid. And they say that you can use it just as a structural foundation if you want to. Yeah, that's what they build say. Build a house on it. I thought it was great. Now what's going on? I see we've got the utilities here. Yeah, we have our, one is for water. And then the other line is this three electrical lines that run down to the submersible pump in the well. And that'll control it from here, the That's power and the control. Right. And so the small one uh, is for the wires, the large one is for the water supply. Right. And down here, uh, you've put in some, something a little ahead of time, uh, sort of an investment. What is this about? Well, this is a dual purpose thing. One is a perimeter drain. Right. And then we have the perforated pipe for that. Generally, we do that all the time. Yeah. And second is, in case this tests uh, radon, we have a, a, a vent in there 
that'll run around and take the air out uh, in case we need it. Right, especially in foundations like this where there's big stones and chunks of granite, there's always a fear that you might have some radon. That's so right. we're ready for it. It's a cheap, it's a cheap time. It's a cheap time to do it. That's right. You know. Now up over here, I, you've got some foam stuffed in here, and that's where the uh, sewer line is going to come in from our septic tank. The boy time, it seems awful high. Well, you know, Norm, we had that problem that you have the, the groundwater, and we have to be up high. You know how we would love to have come down low, sure. but we, we just weren't uh, weren't able to. Yeah, well, it's a good thing that we've had to level this foundation and put <laughs> that 8-inch cap, because now we can get enough pitch to get the sewerage to exit the building. Yeah, it worked out pretty good. Well, it looks great. All the utilities are in, and you're really just starting with the lumber. You don't have to worry about busting holes through the foundation. You've got all the stone down in the basement here, nice ready for level. the slab, a yeah. nice clean place to work. Do you have any problems? Uh, I think we've got all the bases covered except for we, we have to know the issue on the fireplace. We're doing it, we're not doing it, we're, you know, it's going back and forth and I think we have to sit down and settle it. Well, let's see if we can find Lynn and have him make a decision right now. Sounds good. Okay. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Hi Lynn. Lynn. How are you? Good, how are you? Boy, there's a lot of things going on around here. It's real exciting. How are you holding up? Oh, I'm having a ball. I really okay. enjoy this. And I see you're uh, playing around with your chimney possibilities. Yeah, I uh, put together a rough approximation, guessing at the scale as to what a fireplace uh, would look like okay. and how big it would be. Well, really, what are your reasons for wanting this fireplace? Well, Barb and I've talked about this a lot, uh, looked at the pros and cons. I think it's a couple of factors. One is aesthetic. Uh, we like the romantic idea of a fireplace. Uh, secondly, uh, I've seen some studies that show that you get 86% of the cost back when you resell the house. And in talking to local brokers, we found it's a factor. Uh, there's a house in the next town that hasn't moved because it doesn't have a fireplace, and it's the only thing wrong with it. Well, you know, even at that, with the advantages from that point of view, there are there are some disadvantages to having a fireplace, right, Tommy? Right, and we have the key example here, Lynn. We have a, an envelope of an R30, and you want to cut a hole in it and actually leave a window open is what you're doing. No matter how good the fireplace unit is, it'll still leak, and yeah. it'll still draw some of that heat yeah, out. Sure. It's just something that you're going to have to think about. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and looking at it from, from my point of view, there's some design considerations also. Obviously, if the chimney goes right here, yeah. we're going to have to change some of those yeah. window layouts. And it looks a little short because, you know, according to the code, we've got to be 10 feet from the roof. The chimney has to be 2 feet higher, so I think it should be about there. So you're looking at about a 32-foot chimney. So I was yeah. off a little. A little bit. So that's going to add to the cost. But, you know, if cost is really an issue, some preparation could be done now, and you could always put this chimney in later. Mm -hmm. All right. But if you want to do it now, you know, we've, we've got the budget numbers we've been working with, and granted they're conservative, but you have to have estimates at this point. Even at that, with the budget as it is, we're over about $30,000. And if you decide to do the chimney, I would say five to 10000 additional dollars, depending on, you know, mm -hmm. the brick or stone sure. that you yeah. use. Yeah. But the decision is really yours. Okay. Um... Well, we we thought a lot about it. Barb and I talked about it last night. Uh, I recognize that it's going to cost more to heat the house, uh, but we like the idea of a fireplace. Uh, so we've decided uh, let's put one in. You heard it, Tommy. I heard it. You're going to do it. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Tommy. <laughs> well, with that problem solved, I guess you can go back to work, and I'm going to go see if I can find Steve. Okay. Boy, will you look at this? It's like going back to the 19th century, seeing the timber frame start for a new barn. We've got men sitting on pine beams. Some of the larger beams are actually Douglas fir, but they're hand chiseling some mortises. They're using mallets. Boy, it's like stepping right back into the past. And down over here is the intrepid host of this old house, Steve Thomas. Steve, can you take a break? I mean, I already opened the show for you. Maybe you can give me a couple minutes here. <laughs> I'm having a great time, Norm. Well, could you tell me, first of all, who all these people are that we have? They're from all over the place. This gentleman, Chiseling, here is a clothing retailer from New York City. Beltier over there is French-Canadian. He rode his motorcycle down here. There's some professional carpenters here that have come to learn from Ted. 
Uh, there is a gentleman from Indiana with the red beard over there in the tent. He okay. came all the way out here especially for this. And then back in the tent, we've got stockbrokers, lawyers, people from all walks of life. Do we have any women who are working on this? Yeah, we've got a, we've got a dancer. She's back there. Oh, that's great. Now, all these people actually paid money to come and timber frame this building. Pretty good deal, huh? Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> now, what did they assign you to do? Well, they gave me something that uh, I could easily complete without embarrassment. OK. <laughs> I'm doing this curling post here. Remember, that's the one that Ted was hammering away on a, right. a couple of shows back. Slightly canted, just like the original barn. That's right. Okay. So you got the plan that tells you which piece you're working on and what was next. Well, the computer generates these layout sheets. Find the one I here it is. Mine, right in front there, so I wouldn't lose it. <laughs> so these are all, they give you all the dimensions, all the bevels and everything there. So these dark areas show a mortise and these points are tenons. Right. Okay, so you you then learned how to lay it out. Right. Ted spent a long time yesterday telling us the importance of a good layout. It's the old uh, measure twice, cut once rule that really applies in particular when you got an 8 by 8 Timber beam. Framing. Okay, now when I came down you were working on this tenon. What were you doing? Well, in the old days, Ted said, you would have chunked this out with a handsaw, yeah. and then you come back with a, a timber framing chisel to do the fine work. Okay. So that's that's where I am now. I'm just I've chunked it out, and I'm down to the to the fine work now, cleaning so up you, this joint. You just don't cut it out. You actually rough cut it, and then you trim it. That's now, right. That looks pretty sharp. Can I try that chisel? Boy, that is a sharp chisel. I imagine that's an important part of uh, timber framing is having nice sharp chisels. Yeah, Ted spent uh, several hours with us yesterday teaching us just how to sharpen chisel. Boy, this pine uh, trims up like butter. It's yeah, yeah, it's gorgeous. Huh. Well, you know, I kind of imagine that this whole job would all be done with chisels and mallets, but boy, I see an awful lot of power tools in the background. Yeah, well, we're not as, we're, we're kind of lazy, Norm. We take after you. We, we have plenty of power tools around. So you got to use some of those, too. This is a gorgeous circular saw here. Uh, a little bit large. But a little bit large, but uh, it's got a special blade for timber framing. Okay. And you can do all your big cuts with this with this machine. All right, so what are you going to do with that today? Well, it's all set up to finish cutting out this tenon here. Okay. Believe it or not, this thing is really easy to handle. Is that right? Oh, yeah, it's, it's incredible. It looks like a knot. Yeah, watch me blow it. <laughs> bad. Not bad for a rickety. So you'll trim it up later. Well, you know, it looks like you've learned a lot over the first couple of days that you've been here, but where is the high priestess of this, priest of this school? <laughs> well, I don't know where the high priestess is, but the high priest, <laughs> the guru Ted Benson himself is off. He's just about ready to give a State of the Union address, so let's go find okay. him. Okay. Well, listen, it's about uh, nearing noon on Tuesday. It's just the second day of the course, and I want to remind you about a couple of things. When we started out yesterday, I told you that we had a challenge in front of us. Part of that challenge is that we are replacing a barn that unfortunately had to come down. This was a very young barn, and people didn't care for it, and therefore it came down as a young puppy. And I was sad about that. Part of our challenge we decided yesterday is that the building we put up is going to last much longer. It ought to last three or four hundred years. And we will be successful in that challenge in relation to the craftsmanship that we give to these timbers and to that structure because our craftsmanship will cause it to endure. How tight we make the joints, and frankly, how much of ourselves we put into it, it does make a difference. The other part of the challenge is that we have only one week to make this happen. And it's a big project. 
But I'm here to tell you that we are ahead of schedule. We're moving very quickly. And that worries me a little bit. It worries me because the kinds of mistakes that are likely to happen are major. We could cut a, a timber a foot short and only discover that on raising day. And that would stop the raising dead in its track. We don't want that to happen. So please, we're going to measure twice before we complete our layout. Please, there's always going to be a check and a double check. And one of the instructors will sign off on your timber before anything is cut. And that means that everything is laid out to the 32nd of an inch. And that's important. Because then, if we split those lines with our chisels and with our slicks, then that building is going to fit the first time. And those fits are going to last centuries. Steve, if tell me, is Tim the only the one teaching this course? No, no, we've got a, a lot a of real instructors in the That gentleman over there is Jeff Arvin. He's the president of the Timber Framers Guild. I also he taught a heck of a that, seminar on tending uh, the other day. The, Let's have a look. Well, several okay. over well fellas, what I've done is uh, basically rough out a tenon here. I've removed the chunk of waste. And you can see that I have left my layout lines describing this joint all the way around there. And what I want to show you now is a couple of routines and a couple of tool options that will give us the refinement of the joint to give us the tightness and quality of the joint that we're, we're after. The first part of my routine is to clean up this shoulder joint. I want to get it first. And the options are uh, basically either your frame and chisel or your block plane. I'm going to use the block plane for right now and simply get down here on the side. The block plane is nice and sharp. I think I want to add a little depth to my cut here. I love the sound. Now you guys can take a look here and see that our knife line is starting to, to break away. And we we're just about in a point of perfection there. And the proof of that pudding is to take the frame and square and hold it right up here against the line. Now, I'm not quite satisfied here. We're really tied up at this edge. We've got about a space for half a microbe in, in here. So I'm going to try to very delicately just clean a little bit off this edge right here. And I like the sound of that. It sounded like it was cutting wood right where I wanted it. And now you can see that we're getting much closer. I'm just a little fuzz yet. You also notice that this has only taken just about 30 seconds to get this line to this point of perfection that we want to last as a, an indication of our craftsmanship. OK, now I've got this top established. I have to pair the joint on down this way. I prefer my frame and chisel for that. I'm going to put the chisel in and just pair lightly to the line, and you remember that I've cut these lines with a knife. Okay, got that. My check is with my frame and square. Set the depth here. Notice I don't just assume that the layout line is correct. I want to get a picture of this. I want to see. And I see daylight up here. I don't want to see daylight up there. I want this to be perfectly square so that this edge of the timber all around contacts the, the plate that this joins. And there we have it. No microbes can sneak between the square. The other thing that I need to do at this point is to refine this tenon, this part of the tenon, the cheeks. Now again, we got a couple options. One is the block plane. We can use the block plane across this face of the timber. I like to work across grain in this instance. Our other option which is a little bit more fun, is to use a slick, which is basically a big old long-handled chisel that uh, just gives you a little additional leverage. And this is kind of a dance. I really kind of enjoy this. Working across grain with hardly any effort at all, I can just pick up these peelings 
and split my layout line, leaving about half of it right there. How am I doing over here? Okay, it's looking good now. I'd say that's an acceptable joint. I've shown you everything that I've learned in the last eight years. Now you take it and give it a try. Well, Steve, uh, this is quite an experience. I can see why people would actually be willing to pay money to come here and spend a week. This is great. Yeah. Now, I noticed that we've got a lot of pine beams sitting around. Where did they come from? Well, the pine all came from Wiscasset, Maine. In fact, we were up there the other day watching them harvest. Harvest our timber. Let's go have a look. Okay. Scott of Maine, where the name of the game is lobster and lumba. That log you just saw headed south is going to the mill. Earlier today, I had a chance to talk with forester Bill Calderwood. Bill, you're a forester. Now, yep. how does a how does a forester look at a patch of woods like this? From our training as foresters, where uh, we look at a patch of woods mostly from the commercial value uh -huh. standpoint. Uh, good forestry means growing the the most amount of value per acre per year that's uh, possible with what's growing on the land. And what, what species do we have here? You stopped right here. We have uh, one of the most valuable species in this area is northern red oak. And why is that valuable? Red oak is used, uh, has been used over the years as boat building material for lobster boats, lobster trap stock, uh -huh. uh, things of that nature. It's also uh, becoming more popular in post and beam frames. Uh -huh. Now, uh, I see a little tree over here. What's this? Let's uh, just see if you can find out what it is by taking a smell. Smells like Christmas. That's exactly what it is. This is balsam <laughs> fir, and this is widely used in, in this area for Christmas trees. I, I wouldn't give you two bucks coast. for this one, though. This uh, is not certainly not worth 50 cents. It's uh, spindly because it's been growing in the shade all of its life. It mm -hmm. hasn't had the sunlight that it needs to develop good lush foliage. And what about these trees behind? These. Uh, trees behind are eastern white pine, and this is probably the most valuable species in this section of woodland. Um, Why are they valuable? White pine is valuable because of its versatility. It's, it's used uh, in all sorts of uh, lumber for home building, uh, quite widely used for finished lumber. Um, it's also the material that was selected to make your this old house post and beam frame. Well, what else do you have here, Bill? Uh, one of the other species uh, Right over here is another hardwood. This is uh, red maple. Um, What's that used for? Red maple is uh, not really a terrifically valuable tree commercially. Uh, it's used in this area mostly for firewood. Sometimes it will grow into a, a small log, but it's a low-quality, low-value material. Well, do you have any trees that are harvestable on this patch? Yes, we do. Right over here, we we're planning to take this uh, white pine out uh, right, right over here. Why this particular one, Bill? This tree is uh, getting to the size where it's approaching maturity. It's certainly a good valuable saw log at its present size. It's taking up a lot of growing room that some of these smaller trees could better utilize than this one. timber no yelling timber went out with the uh, the cowboys of old i guess <laughs> so what will happen to this log next next as you saw earlier the the skidder will come in pull this tree out of the woods we'll cut it to length put it on a truck take it to the sawmill and saw it up into whatever we want boy i'd love to see that operation we certainly can let's go great Norman, how long have you been in the lumbering business? I've been in lumbering business all my life. My father started the sawmill business in the mid-40s, and the family's been in lumbering logging in the state of Maine for several generations. And what are you sawing today? Today we're sawing some eastern white hemlock. What for? 
The Soren is an 8x8 and 6x8 to build a dock down in Friendship, Maine. What's the stick? This is a state of Maine international log rule. This is used to calculate the number of board foot in the log. We take the average diameter inside the box, which in this case is 15 inches. We know it's 16 feet long from looking at it. 15 inches in diameter, 16 feet long, 160 board feet. What's a log, 160 board foot log worth, he said? Today that log is probably worth about $28. 28 bucks, huh? Yes. What happens to this log next? Here we take it to the sawmill. First it goes to the docker. Well, I'll show you. Norman pointed out that removing the bark before the log meets the saw keeps the saw blade sharp. Skidding the trees out of the forest, as we saw, embeds all kinds of grit in the bark, which would dull a blade quickly. Another reason to remove the bark is that the bark itself is a saleable byproduct. Once the bark has been removed, the log is transferred to the saw carriage, where a 150 horsepower motor turns a 50 inch blade at 750 RPM. The sawyer adjusts the carriage under a pencil thin beam of light that indicates the path of the saw blade. These instant decisions, made routinely by the sawyer, determine the pace profitability of the sawmill. We notice that nothing is wasted here. The first cuts, or slabs, are dropped below to a chipper. Norman pointed out that the chips are sold off to make paper. The sawdust which they used to pay people to haul away, is now saved and sold for animal bedding. Even these shavings from the board planing operation are bagged and sold as high quality bedding for horses. Well, Norman, I am impressed. Between sawdust and shavings, you Yankees really don't throw anything out. But I guess this is the bottom line. Dimension lumber all ready to go. That's right, Steve. Whether it's those 2 4 or 2 6 that Friendship dock, or those 8 by 8 down to this old house. It all comes down this line onto the customer. Well, thanks for showing it to us, Norman. You bet. I'll play here. Well, Steve, it looks like you had a great afternoon up there in the backwoods of Maine. Yeah, those Maine folks are real nice. And uh, I'll tell you, the lobster's not half bad either. Oh, I can imagine that. Well, meanwhile, back here, you and your fellow classmates are doing quite well. And I don't see any reason why you're not going to meet that schedule for Saturday. Well, if our luck holds and the weather's good, in just two days we're going to have a good old-fashioned New England barn raising with clog dancers and fiddlers and plenty of good food. It's something that I wouldn't miss for the world. Sounds great. And that, of course, is the subject of our next show. So until then, I'm Steve Thomas. And I'm Norm Abram. For this old house. Come on, let me show you this uh, new chain mortar tool we've got on this job. Okay. Funding for this old house is provided by... Yeah, for There's great programs. Public broadcasting. It's entertainment and you're learning at the same time. Come see for yourself here on Channel 6. From the majestic Notre Dame Cathedral in Montreal, enjoy the sounds of the season in a Christmas special with Luciano Pavarotti. See the world's favorite tenor in an unforgettable performance, including Ave Maria and Adeste Fideles. Luciano joins the celebration Sunday at 7.25 here on 6. This is Channel 6, KRMA-TV, Denver. Presentation of the Victory Garden is made possible locally by Channel 6 members, who provide more than half the station's funding. Hello, I'm Bob Thompson, and welcome to the Victory Garden. Combine a truly great garden with a first-class hotel in the Australian countryside, and you have a gardener's vacation dream come true. And that'll be our story today, when Peter Seberg visits Milton Park Country House Hotel near Sydney, Australia. Marion will join Peter to sample some of the local and unusual cuisine. And back home, Roger Swain will be checking in from the suburban garden. That's today's show, and it's just ahead, so please, stay tuned.
Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television stations and by W.R. Grace, makers of Peter's Professional Potting Soil for all home gardening needs, indoors and out. By Monrovia Nursery Company, major producer of container-grown plants, supplying garden centers and nurseries nationwide. And by the American Rental Association. 30 I love here to look at it, and it is fantastic. Oh, it was amazing. We had timber framers all over the place. We had come-alongs. Everybody was wearing hard hats. We had a commemorative t-shirt made for the occasion. The whole thing went up in a day. The weather has been lousy all week. It's been raining. It cleared for six hours. There, it was almost magical. Well, you know, there were a lot of people down back cutting mortises and making those tenons. Did it all fit together? That's what I wanted. There was one mortise eight and a half inches out of position. Somebody had just flipped their layout, and that was all. We hauled a chain mortiser up there, and in about 15 minutes, we had the whole thing fixed. That's it. That was it. That's it great. It was incredibly smooth. But looks like we're really rolling today. What's happening? There's a lot going on now. You know, the stress-skinned people have been here for the past two days in a lot of rain, yet they still managed to put up about a third of the building. And, you know, this is like nothing we've used before. Yeah. No studs and, and sheathing, just panels. And I've spent some time talking to them about how the system works. And let's go see Give what's happening. Yeah, sure. I'm really anxious to see what's happening. Well, Steve, you know, I've read a lot about these systems and seen them in trade journals, but I've never worked with them. Yeah. And it's, it's real interesting. Now, of course, here's the nice timber frame that you put up last weekend. And what they've done is they've started out by installing some 12-foot drywall on the outside of the post and the beam, just tacked it on. Yeah, how come? Well, because later they're going to come along and set the panels on the outside. Mm -hmm. And by doing the drywall first, you end up with only one horizontal joint, mm -hmm. nothing in the corners, no vertical joints. But you still use a standard pattern to fasten the drywall with screws, just like you would on studs. Well, that's pretty smart. Well, how does this whole thing go together? Well, on the outside, they're getting ready to set the panels on the drywall. Let me take a look. Now, Jim Leroy and his crew have been working on this the last couple of days. And of course, here's one of the panels that you showed us how it was made last week. Right. You've got the oriented strand board on the outside and the inside, and then your polyisocyanurate sandwich in the middle. That's right. Now, where does, how does this go up on the outside? Where do you guys start? OK, they're going to start over here in the corner. But before we set any panels, we took advantage of the situation. You know, we're going to have a lot of lights up on our post, yeah. and uh, we don't want the wires to show. So the drywall was held back about two inches or mm -hmm. so, two and a half inches. And because it's half inch thick, you can get a wire chase in here. So now there's a half a dozen or so wires all running up to different locations, and we won't see any of them. Uh -huh. So are they ready to start on they're this? They're ready to here? start. And the first thing that they're going to do is they foam the corner, and now mm -hmm. they're going to run some foam on the sill. Now, isn't that kind of overkill? foaming the corners and the sills and everything? Well, not really. You know, the panel is has a very high insulating value. And you want to keep that continuous throughout the building. And if you don't seal the little gaps down at the sills or at the corners, or even have that panel run over the band joist or the rim joist, which is right here, mm -hmm. you could lose as much as 11% of your efficiency. Geez, that is really significant. Now, what are these guys doing here? Right, first, they're going to plumb the wall up, and then they're going to nail it in place. I noticed the nails are already set here, half set through the panel. That's right. Well, you know, that's a good idea because remember those wires are back there, yeah. so they preset the nails so they won't drive them through any of the wires. And, yeah. and they're pretty serious nails. They're a they sure are. galvanized nail, like a ring nail, uh -huh. so it really holds. And of course, as you know, Steve, the softer the wood, the longer the, longer the, nail. the nail. That's right. right. Now, what are these grooves in the, in the ends, Norm? All right, well, that's where the next step comes into uh, place. What they're going to do is on the inside and outside groove, they're going to set a plywood spline. Now, that's just normal plywood? That's right. It's 5 8 plywood. And notice they have a, another worker up at uh -huh. the top. To... Now, is that nailed? That'll get nailed later. Right now, it just sits in between okay. there. Okay, I see a foam can here. All so right, they're going to bring in, and again, another joint. So in the center groove of the panel, they're going to put down a bead of foam. Now that hole there is a, uh, is what? That's just a wire chase. Okay. So That's that uh, you'll see some of that later. Okay, now it's all foamed and they're ready for the next panel. Move out of the way here. just 
keeps going on and on all the way around the building. That is an amazing system. And the thing that I really like about it is that you get a wall that's already insulated with the drywall installed in just a few easy steps. It's going to put us carpenters out of business. I don't know. Now, now what's going on up, up on the roof? Then? All right, that's a little bit different system. Let's go up and take okay. a look. Okay. Well, Steve, over here is a pile of the roof panels. They're four feet wide and 12 feet long. All right. I know they're beveled here. Why? Right. Well, that's where it's going to meet at the peak. Uh -huh. Already pre-cut. Good idea. Now, notice that on these, the drywall, and actually in this case, blue board, is already installed. Uh -huh. Now, why blue board here when we've used drywall down below? Well, you could, it gives us an option. You could treat it like drywall or you could plaster it. You know, uh -huh. you could do a textured plaster or whatever. Uh -huh. Now, Norm, I noticed that there's oriented strand board only on the outside, nothing on the inside. Right. Are these panels strong enough for the roof? Oh, yeah, you bet. Remember, up on the roof, we have rafters that have four-foot centers. Mm -hmm. So this panel is designed to span that four-foot span. And believe me, it'll hold any snow load that we're going to have here. Great. Can we see one go in place? Sure, let's climb up. But uh, the sling is just suspended from little two-by cleats. I mean, that's that's, right. that doesn't look like it's going to hold anything. Well, you got to remember, this panel only weighs about 190 pounds, so there's no fancy uh, equipment necessary. It's just a couple nails held in there. Well, four guys can handle 190 pounds without any problem. Why bother with a crane in the expense? Well, that's true, but you got to figure 190 pounds, if you had to lift that over 35 feet mm -hmm. up to the top of this building, right. you'd be pretty tired. Yeah, the I bet crane, in the windstorm, you'd really appreciate the crane. Right. Yeah. The crane is safer, yeah. and believe it or not, it's a lot cheaper yeah. to have the crane. Yeah. Now, are we splining these panels well? Well, on the bottom here, where this lower panel is going to join that one, it'll be splined just like we saw down below. Yeah. But on the sides, they don't need splines because the solid bearing, they'll just foam the joint. Okay. And I also remember in the plans, they called for a whole bunch of skylights, but I don't see any openings for skylights. <laughs> That's here. right. Well, in this situation, it's much better to cut the skylights in after the whole system has been laid down. But I was pretty impressed the way the windows were already pre-cut in the yeah. panels. Yeah. Yeah. That was great the way they did that up at Anderson's shop. Let's go have a look. Okay. Well, Steve, the factory tour that you gave us where they actually manufacture these panels was real interesting. But the thing that really fascinated me was that automatic router system which cuts out these window openings, oriented strand board insulation and all. Yeah, it's incredible. All they have to do then when they, on site is to insert these 2 by 4s Right, they put these 2 by 4s in and nail them from both sides of the strand board. And that'll provide some nailing for the window and the trim later on. The real time saver. Sure is. Now, the thing I think we should review again about this building is that it's a hybrid building. We've got a timber frame, three bents, which stop here. Right. Now, from here all the way back to the, to the back wall of the building is a completely different framing system. That's right. It is a hybrid, and there's a reason for that. Remember, the, the Whitwires wanted a view of the pond. Right. So our architect designed the house with these big window openings right. so they could get that. Now, if we had a post in this corner, that would indicate some kind of brace here. And that would give us all kinds of problems to, uh -huh. to get this opening. But more importantly, over in the kitchen, you know, a kitchen is a terrible place in a post and beam construction because you're always fitting countertops right. around it, trying to find a way to hide the posts rather right. than make them show. Right. You spend all this time building the frame, and then you spend all this time hiding it. Right, now we can hang cabinets anywhere we want with no interference. Okay, well, give us the drill on this system. Well, it's a pretty straightforward system. We start out with... Uh, 
these wooden I-beams which span across to create the second floor. There's a bedroom going to be above. Right. And they're on this wall. They actually hang from these joist hangers, which are top mount. They hang over the top of the mm -hmm. wall. Believe it or not, there's not even a header in this wall. Incredible. And it can still carry the load and the whole structure above it? Sure. What's really happening is that between the 2x4 that's at the top of the wall on the flat and the 2x4 yeah. that's down here, sandwiched be between this plywood, you've created a box beam. Mm -hmm. And the amount of strength, strength that, is, that makes is incredible. You'd have to put a ton of weight up there even to sag this just really? a little bit. Well, you sound sold on it. I can see the twinkle in your eye. You just can't wait to to eliminate uh, all carpenters. But, you know, there is some skepticism still about this system. That's right, and I still have a few questions of my own. Well, here's the guy to answer it. Amos Winter, whose name is on the side of the packages of all these panels here. Great. Hi, Amos. Hi. You know Norm Abram? Norm, Amos Winter. Hi, Amos. Nice to meet you. Same here. I had a couple questions about the panels. One is about the insulation. I've read a lot about polyisocyanurate insulation about this aged R value controversy. In other words, it, it's not as good an insulator over time. How, how much does that affect us here? The, the insulation does actually diminish over time. Right off the press, it's an R value of about 35. But it, it does diminish down to something in the order of 28 or so. We actually, if you read our literature, we quote 26. We've, we've tracked it over uh, several years of testing, and found that it, it does seem to plateau at 27 or so, and in, in quoting it at 26, we're being very conservative. You're playing it safely. So it, we'll, we'll get a nice 26. That's pretty incredible, because a typical 2x4 frame with bad insulation is only about an R13, and it isn't anywhere near as uh, uniform as the insulation value here. The other concern that I have, is there anything in the products that you use to manufacture the panels that that will give us problems with air quality since we're creating air quality in the house since we're creating such a tight house. Well, the, the, the isocyanurate in the panel really goes to completion when we make it, when we react so it. No, no so there's no outgassing yeah. there. The uh, OSB has a phenol formaldehyde adhesive in it, which outgasses some formaldehyde, but typically it, it's gone by the time you move into the house. It's a, it's a fairly short light thing. So, so the materials are not a problem, but if you make a house this tight, you automatically create some interior uh, pollution problems, uh, carbon dioxide from people breathing, uh, dust, mold. Uh, do we have to worry about that? Yes, actually, uh, probably the best way to deal with that is an air to air heat exchanger, an actual mechanical ventilation. One issue is energy efficiency. To get energy efficiency, you need to make the house airtight. To get good air quality, you need to provide some type of outside ventilation. You also need to get rid of moisture. So in addition to the air to air heat exchanger, you may want fans in moisture generating areas like bathrooms and kitchens. All right, well, we'll have to keep that in mind as we move along. Great. Thanks, Amos. Thank you. Well, meanwhile, I see Paul Kennedy, our electrician, busy at work in the kitchen. But before we go check in with him, I want to show you a sequence we shot the other day where we struck water on the site with Dave Haynes, our water well driller. In the back. Oh, Dave. Oh, hey, Steve. Hey, you're right back, right on schedule. Hang on a second, yeah. How, How are you doing? doing? Say hi to my brother, Joe. Welcome Steve. to this old house. Nice to meet you. You got a beautiful rig. Oh, thank you. What do you take for it? Oh, it's 400 and she's yours. 400 bucks, you got it. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Add a few zeros on the end and we're getting close. <laughs> Give me the tour, will you? Well, basically, we got truck-mounted rotary drill here, okay. where we've got our main group of plus that it makes a run, and we've got an engine, it's this developed about 426 horsepower. Okay. And we've got a compressor up here that drives the pneumatic drills to make it fly. Okay, so it's air compressor. Correct, it's compressed air. And on the back side of that's your hydraulic pumps that make the uh, rotation and everything else do what it's supposed to primarily. Drill pipe here? Or? You got drill pipe and drill tools which is stored in the tray on the side of the machine. Okay. And then we come back to the back of the rig. What are these big cylinders here? Well, these are the two leveling jacks here. There's three of them on the machine. There's two mounted on each corner of the rear, and then you've got one located in the front of the truck in the middle. Mm -hmm. And this is where you level the machine off so you can drill a straight hole. Looks like a bunch of levers here. What, what's this all about? Well, this is the control station or the command center, whatever you want to call it, where the drilling operation will take place. Basically, you've got two different tiers of levers there that control all drilling operations from leveling the machine out to uh -huh. raising the tower, 
to uh, adding sections of drill pipe, controlling all drill functions will be formed right here at this station. Okay, and the dials, I guess, tell you what's going on with your... Well, this will keep the driller informed of what conditions are developing in the hole. It'll tell him how his engine's performing and how the, uh, you know, all the uh, heat functions, make sure that everything's running true to form. The first objective was to drill a hole down into the bedrock. I wondered how deep that was going to be. This is the actual bit where we're going to start the primary drilling operation. It's what they call a tri-cone roller bit. It's got three wheels. And basically, those three wheels we're going to be rotating to a section of grind and pulverize up and make a hole down below. That's a lot of action for a short amount of time. Well, it goes pretty quick when you get started. What's next? Well, the next thing we got to do, Steve, is we've got to mix up our drilling fluid, which we're going to be mixing up in this barrel. Okay. It'll be coming from these bags here behind us. This is this is what a clay type mixture. Well, it's a bentonite clay. It's a naturally mined material, which when we add water to it, and mix it up, it'll have about the same consistency as pancake batter, basically. That pancake batter was going to be pumped down into the center of the drill screen, into the hole where it served three purposes. It flushes out the cuttings, it cools the bit, and perhaps most importantly, it lines the length of the wellbore, preventing caving. As the drilling fluid is pushed out of the well, it is collected in this pit, or sump, where the cuttings settle out, and the remaining liquid is recycled back into the well hole. So Dave, you got your pancake batter. Yep. Looks real tasty. What's next? Well, we're ready to start drilling. Okay. Yeah, the next step we're going to do is be pumping the solution out of the pit over here, uh -huh. through the drill string, and creating a borehole from surface grade to bedrock. About how far do you think that is? I'm going to estimate roughly 40 feet. I might be wrong. We'll put a case of beer on it. Okay, you got a deal. Then from this point, once we get down to the bedrock, we're going to drill a minimum of 10 feet into it. Once it's good and solid, then we'll extract that drill string from the uh -huh. hole and then insert these steel pipes. Okay. And the first thing we got to do is thread on one of these known as a drive shoe. Uh -huh. This threads onto the bottom of the casing and actually makes a nice flat hardened sealing surface right into the bedrock. Okay, so that just seals the, the casing to the Correct. bedrock. Correct. Once sure. this is down to the bottom of the hole, your threaded casing sections will be run into the surface. Okay. Then we install a driver on the top with a pneumatic drill, and we actually beat on it and set it like a nail, okay. basically. Okay. Just so it's nice and sealed down there. Correct. This stuff is steel. How come it doesn't rust in the ground? Well, primarily, once it's in the ground, the air can't get to it. You need air to make oxidation happen. Okay. So the, it's got a real long life expectancy too, Great. as far as it goes. I'll stand back and watch you do it. Okay, let's go for it. This part of the operation went fairly quickly. As one length of drill pipe disappeared into the ground, another was threaded on, and the process continued. Lucky for me, I was winning my bet with Dave, as 40 feet came and went. Finally, at 71 feet, we hit bedrock. Dave could tell by the way the drill behaved, and by the look of the cutting. They then removed the drill pipe and got ready to lower the permanent metal well casing into the hole. And when it reached the bedrock, they drove it home with the air hand. Well, Dave, for uh, 
four hundred thousand bucks, you got a machine that puts on quite a show. Of course, yeah. you guys yeah. aren't too bad yourself. <laughs> oh, thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. So, uh, how deep are we, Dave? We're Seventy-one feet right now. Seventy-one feet, eh? I guess I owe you. You won the bet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's next? Well, the next thing we got to do is we got to change the head on that drill drill bit with this one over here. This is a new sharp one. It's been all dressed up and it's ready to go in. These are what, uh, tungsten? These are tungsten carbide inserts. And what we're gonna do is change the one with the one that's on there. And then we'll drill through the center of that casing that we've just installed through the bedrock till we run up the refractor zone that creates enough water. Okay, about how deep do you think we have to go? Well, this is a four bedroom house and we'd like to see at least five gallon a minute yield out of it if we can get it. So but in other words, you go deep enough so you get the flow of water and mother nature's going to tell us how deep we got to go okay you know, we're looking anywhere between 100 and 500 just pick a number you want to bet on that too <laughs> <laughs> well it's been 36 hours since we were last with our well drillers joe and dave when we left them the other night they had just set a steel casing in bedrock about 73 feet down and they were beginning to drill good morning gentlemen good morning steve sorry we couldn't be with you yesterday well, I can tell by the no smiles on your face that uh, you're not happy. What's happening? Well, we didn't make out too good as yesterday as we anticipated. What happened? Well, we managed to drill from 71 feet where the casing's been set to approximately 405 feet deep. And you find water? Well, we found a little bit. About, about, about a gallon, gallon and a half. And, and you it, wanted like five gallons or something like that? Well, that, but also we suspect this water's been heavily laden with iron. So what we'd like to do now is continue down deeper and hopefully find a more productive zone of better quality. So the program is keep going. Correct. This stuff wasn't here yesterday. What's this? Well, that's just uh, the drill cuttings that came out from yesterday's drilling operation. And it's all basically just stone dust that's been evacuated with the hole with water. So it sounds like a bit more of this before we're done. Well, it kind of looks that way. What's the first thing on the agenda this morning? Oh, Joe. Okay, well, last night, while the machine was sitting here, the hole filled with water. 600 gallons sitting in that 400 foot hole right now. And we gotta get it out. The only way that? to get it out, we start the machine, build a head of compressed air, and we're gonna blow it out. Just like a geyser. Yes, sir, it's gonna get awful wet. If we get rolling, you probably ought to back up a little bit or you're gonna get awful wet yourself. Okay, let's go. Okay, let's do it. After they blew the water out of the hole, they resumed drilling. Just 20 feet deeper, they must have hit a fracture zone, because more water was now running out of the well. They stopped to measure the flow. Ready? Yep. about the iron content that you guys are worried about? Well, it doesn't look like it's going to be so bad. We've diluted it with more water than we had before. I think it's going to be a, a pretty decent well. Good. Well, we'll be able to take a, get a pump thrown in there and take a sample to a laboratory, and they'll tell us exactly what contents we have and what we'll have to do about it later. Good enough. All right. You guys put on a good show. Thank you. Well, all we got left to do is break down. We're out of here. Well, this is incredible. Five days after construction started, we're wiring. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. You know, a lot of electricians wouldn't touch a timber frame with a 10-foot pole, but you're gridded. Well, Steve, I've done wiring for 17 years now. And a few years ago, a contractor friend of mine built a timber frame home in Andover. Uh -huh. And doing that, I worked closely with him and the panel people and the timber frame people to know where to put the wiring. And the whole key, Steve, is to get the wiring in early. You have to get it in early. So what you've got to do is plan where you're going to run your outlets uh -huh. and things, and let me just show you over here. We have a window that's scheduled to go in. Now, with the window out, we have an opening, a chase at 16 yeah. inches, okay? It runs all the way through. We can fish our wires through. We can bring our wires down into the basement, drill into the basement, come back around, up to the other side, and over to the next outlet. Very simple right now. Okay. Two, two days from now, this window goes in. Our opening is closed up. It's much harder for us. 
but we've got a lot more work to do. Okay, I get the picture. Well, we'll be checking in with you throughout the project. Right now, I see the crane's hooked up for a pick, so I'm going to go check that out. Take okay. Care. What are we about to pick here, Norm? Well, Steve, they've taken several panels and joined them together to make one big structural roof panel. Structural roof panel. That's right. There's no raft. There's no ridge. This is it. We're just going to pick the whole thing and set it up on the end of the building, and about the only thing that has to be done is shingling it. That is amazing. It's like 15 more minutes, we're going to be closed in. That's right, and then we'll be ready to put some windows and doors in next time. Well, that's the subject of our next show. So until then, I'm Steve Thomas. And I'm Norm Abram. For this old house. Funding for this old house is provided by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Asking questions of India, we may perhaps learn something about ourselves too. This is only an impression, only one Westerner's journey, an outsider's point of view. I simply went to see. This is John Hemingway inviting you to come along on a journey of discovery. Darshan, an Indian journey, next time on Travels. You could make a lifetime's worth of journeys and still not see all its variety and richness. See it Monday evening at 8 o'clock. From the campus of Central Michigan University, this is the CMU Public Television Network. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. Tell us about the challenges and the well, opportunities. Well, first of all, I think it's pretty obvious. We've got a big mass of uh, structure here looking directly at us. So right. that's one challenge is how to make that all kind of come down into the scale of this small site. You're enjoying sweat equity? Oh, we're having a great time. Can't you tell? <laughs> I can see it. And on top of it, it has a real interesting feature. It's electrically operated. It'll automatically open when it gets too hot in there in the summer, and it'll close if it starts raining. So you don't have to do anything. Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Good morning. I'm Steve Thomas. Welcome to this old house. Well, last time you were with us, you saw us installing the stress skin paneling. That's the high-tech sheathing that covers our barn. I think you have to agree, it looks pretty good. Since then, we've got a roof and some skylights. Now, it looks real simple, but it's a whole complex system that Tommy Silva, our general contractor, will give us the rundown on later. We've got a load of custom windows that we're going to start to install. And later on, Tom Worth. Our landscape architect is going to show up with his plan. But there's some question as to whether we can implement it because our homeowners are facing some budget options. Speaking of them, they spent the whole weekend staining clapboards. Let's go check in with Norm. Hey, Norm. Tom. Hey, Steve. Hi, Steve. Well, I was going to ask you about this roof system, but first, uh, how come you shingle from the top down, Tom? <laughs> It does look a little strange, doesn't it? Yeah. But there is a reason for all of this, and maybe if we go down over here, okay. we can explain it to you. You know, any roof surface, the finished surface, like these fiberglass shingles, can act like a moisture barrier. Right. To trap moisture underneath the shingle. Right. And a black roof surface like this can build up a lot of heat. Right. You know, the sun beating on it, it, uh -huh. it builds up heat. And if you trap moisture and heat underneath these shingles, not only will the shingle deteriorate quickly, but you could have failure of this oriented strand board. So Tom's come up with what's called a cold roof system, which is placed between the stress skin panel and the finished roof surface. Okay, now the whole point of this system is to ventilate hot air and moisture 
from the That's from right. The you got to get rid of it or it's just not going to last very long. Okay, so what's the system tell? Well, right here, you can see a cross section pretty easily. We've cut out a section here for the chimney that's going to be coming up. Uh-huh. So now you can see our finished ceiling inside. Right, our blue board. Right. Our insulation. And then our outer OSB skin. Okay. This is the panel that's come from the factory to okay. us. Okay, so this is the whole thing. And then from this point up is the part that you guys have added on site. Right. What we've done is we've strapped the roof uh, all the way from the lower section, from the faceboard, right. all the way up to the ridge. And the strapping is space 16 on center. Okay, now you just used common one by three boards for strapping. Right. That's this stuff right here. That's right. Okay. Now we've just taken another skin or layer of OSB and just run it on top of that and that creates a chute for the air to run. Okay, so this air gets warm and as it rises it goes out the top. Right, there's a slot at the top. At the okay. ridge. So how do you keep insects out of here and out of the top too? Well, we have a drip edge that's going to go on the bottom, but this drip edge has holes in it for vents. Uh-huh, that's pretty neat. Right, and all we've done is we're going to take it and lay that on there. Uh-huh, this, this abuts your Fascia. Pine fascia. That's right. correct. Okay. Now the air will go under this, up here, all the way to the ridge of the roof, where we've kept the roof back. Uh-huh. So now we've got a slot up at the top. Right. All right. And we're going to lay this material on top of the ridge. And this enables the air to come out through these holes. Uh-huh. This sort of looks like cardboard here, corrugated. Yeah. Sort of a plastic. Yeah. That's pretty neat stuff. Yeah. And the air just will come out and come out and just be vented into okay. the air. So what do you do on top of this? Okay, all we're going to do on the top like that, we'll cut a shingle and we'll install it on top like uh -huh. that and that'll cover this. So it's a nice, neat job. You yeah. can hardly tell it's there. That's right. right. It goes right up, right up there. Now, this seems like a lot of extra material and labor. Is, it, is this system really worth it? Uh, we think it's worth it. It's going to protect the roof and, give, like Norm said, it's going to give us a maximum life out of the materials that we're using. All right. Well, nothing but the best from the Silver Brothers, huh? Yeah. Well, so... Uh, how come you're roofing from the top down? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think about it, this is a two-roof, two-system. Yeah. Tom had to start at the bottom, strap it, put the boards on it, build staging. You know, these planks and the brackets that hold them all the way up to the top. He had three layers. Yeah. Why bother taking that all down? You just leave it there, start at the top, shingle to the ridge, remove oh, that section and come down. So it's a labor saver, and oh, it's safer. Good. Yeah, it's a safer way to go. Pretty neat. Well, I see you've got some roof windows going on. What, what's the story on those? Yeah, we're getting ready to install the last one. They go in great. Come on down, we'll take a look at Good. it. Good. Tom, you put a bunch of these windows in. Yeah, we're putting in 14, Steve. And with our budget, we want to make sure that we can put them in fast and easy. And this is the window that does the job for us. Yeah? Well, what are the features? Well, it's a solid PVC frame that makes up the body of the window. And then on the outside here, we've got an extruded aluminum cap that holds the glass in place. And is this glass something special? Well, it certainly fits well with this building. It's an insulated glass, but it has a film in between it. And that gives you two air spaces. Plus that film keeps out the ultraviolet light, reflects the radiant heat back in in the wintertime, and keeps it out of the building in the summer. So we've got a window that's up to the performance thermally of our really highly efficient building. That's right. And on top of it, it has a real interesting feature. It's electrically operated. It'll automatically open when it gets too hot in there in the summer, and it'll close if it starts raining. So you don't have to do anything. Pretty sophisticated. Yeah. So how does it go in? Well, it goes in pretty easy. The beauty of it is we don't have to contend with the messy tar and uh -huh. all that other stuff. We Isn't have a one-piece flashing. Uh-huh. That's and this all is... attached to the window. It's not a separate kit. This is the way it comes out of the box. It comes out of the box. Like now, this that. feels like a rubber or a PVC or something. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a soft PVC. The first thing we have to do is we just install two clips on the bottom. Uh-huh. And we just take the window out of the box, slap it on the roof, drop it down onto the clips. Okay. I see it goes into a little slot here. Right. And then we just have the clips. We run three up each side. Yeah screw it down, two across the top, and shingle it, and that's it. There's Boy, that's no, amazing. There's no messy uh, tie or mastic, no step flashing to contend with, incredible. nothing. Incredible. That is incredible. Yeah. Well, let's do it. Okay. Well, by now, in a regular window, we'd be thoroughly covered in tar or fumbling with step flashing. <laughs> you better believe it. 
So you got a starter strip that goes under there. Right, we just lay this down. Oh, that is really easy. This goes right on the top, and that's it. Now all I'll do is shingle up the sides, and we're done. Boy, that is an amazing system. Now, Tom, not only do you uh, shingle from the top down, but I noticed you're not using any tar paper underneath your shingles. What's the story? Well, it's a steep roof, and we feel that because of that, we don't really need the, the uh, tar paper. Underneath. So there's really no place for the moisture to collect. And That's correct. Why use material if you don't need it? You got it. Hey, you just saved us some more money. That's <laughs> terrific. Let me grab you some more shingles. Okay. That's it. That's it, Nance. That's it? Boy, in less than a half hour, you got the whole unit in. That's, that's amazing. That's the beauty of them, nice and easy. Well, Norm, can I drag you away and have you show me the installation of the custom windows on the sidewall? Sure. Tom, I'll leave you to your one-way roof. <laughs> no, thanks a lot. It's really amazing. Thank you, Steve. All right, we're really rolling. Well, Norm, you know, we have a lot of roof windows, but we have acres of windows in the sidewall. <laughs> we sure do. And you should have seen the size of the truck that rolled out to deliver them. Really? It was incredible. We also have with us Susan Marvin from the company to tell us about it. Hey. Hi, Susan. Hi, Steve. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi, right. Norm. Hi, Susan. Susan, we've been calling these custom windows, but are they really custom windows? Technically, Steve, they're not. These are standard size double hunks, but your architect has chosen from a long list of options. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've got them right here on the order form. Well, let's hear them. Um, well, first of all, he was very specific about the light patterns he uh -huh. wanted. Normally, a, a double hung this size would have 12 individual lights mm -hmm. on the top sash and 12 individual lights on the bottom sash. He chose to have four lights on each sash, and that's very unique. Uh -huh. What else? Well, he also asked for flat casing, so he could frame out these windows like a picture frame. And the flat casing not only has come with the windows, but it's been applied in the factory. Instead of a brick mold, you know, picture framing looks much nicer with these flat cases on a mm -hmm. building like this. Yeah, I guess it probably looks a lot more like a barn. That's right. That's right. Um, another option the architect specified was an interior prime and an exterior prime. Mm -hmm. So the windows are, are ready to accept paint. Oh, that's great. That's right. I noticed that even the hardware is white. Did he specify that also? Absolutely. Normally mm -hmm. you'd get a bronze color, but he wanted white because apparently you're going to paint the inside right. white. Right. That's right. Um, another specification that was important to him was the width of the jams. Mm -hmm. He specified an extension jam, and that's been applied in the factory. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's real important to us later because, in this case, it's like a five and an eighth extension jam. And what it means is, as the window is set in place, this inside edge is going to be perfectly flush with the drywall. So all the carpenter has to do to finish it is put the casings on. No building the window. Oh, that's a that's a terrific labor savings yeah. right there. Absolutely. Are there other features too, Susan? Yes. He wanted insulating glass. Yeah. And we could have provided insulating mm -hmm. glass, Steve, right here. But what that would have done is that would have required making the months wider than he wanted them. He mm -hmm. wanted a thin profile oh, I see. here. Right. So what we did was we made the months the way he wanted, and then we put an energy panel mm -hmm. on the exterior of the sash so you have the insulating value of insulated mm -hmm. glass. Well, a nice solution. And also, the, I assume the windows in a lot of cases here are closer than 18 inches to the floor, mm -hmm. which means the glass is special. Good point. This is tempered glass mm -hmm. because it is so close to the floor. Right. Well, these are beautiful big windows, and we're going to have a fantastic view of our pond through these windows. But didn't you guys make up some small horse windows for the other side over here? Oh, the stable windows. Yes, they're fun. How'd they come out? Great. Let's have a look. Scattered throughout the home, the architects designed in these perfectly square openings. Yeah. And I think they're to simulate the windows and box stalls. Right. Sure. Now, to fill these openings, we've come up with this window. Oh. All right. It's a scaled-down version of all the rest of the windows. We've got our narrow muntins, we've got our flat trim, and we've got our storm glass here. Great. See how it'll look. Of course, this is the inside, but it'll look very similar to this on the outside. Of course, we'll have a piece of trim here, and our clapboards will come up underneath. Great. Now, this doesn't open, does it? No, this one doesn't operate. 
No, but that, there's another window here that caught my eye that does Oh, yeah? Operate. Yeah. This one right here, which is actually a scale up from is the it? one we just sure looked at. Look at that. Same details. Yeah. And this window is going to go up there on the second level. Yeah. Where a double hung window wouldn't work very well. No. But an awning window works nicely because you can tilt it out yeah. and get some ventilation. So this is an awning? Yeah, look at the other side. Look at that. See, there's a crank. There's down a there. crank. You got a screen on the inside. Right. Incredible. And also it's interesting because most awning windows that I've seen are, are rectangular. Right. This one is perfectly square and it's large. Yeah, sure is. Well, it's beginning to look like you can custom order anything. You can. And your architect did. <laughs> Steve, I've grown up in this business, and I've never seen a combination like these windows over here. Well, what makes this one so special? Well, you've got your two double hungs, and on yeah. either side, we've um, included the awnings. Right. And we've pulled the whole thing all together. Uh-huh. And I've never seen a combination quite right like it. What I like about it is that we're going to be able to take it up there. It goes way up on the third floor of the lot and put it in in about 10 minutes because it's all together. Great. Well, thanks very much, Susan. Uh, I've got to catch Tom Worth, but I expect by the end of the afternoon, with all these labor-saving windows, you and uh, Tommy will have them in. Okay, Steve. <laughs> See you, Norm. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Well, it might seem just a little premature to be discussing landscaping before the siding's even up on our barn. But remember, we only have about six weeks before the frost comes. And of course, we've got some budget constraints, too. But luckily, we've got Tom Wor Worth to work all that out. Hi, Tom. How are you, Steve? Good. I understand you've got some de design solutions for us. Well, we've been working away. I think we have some good uh, things to look at. We've got some real challenges here on the site, you know. But I also think we have some terrific opportunities. Well, tell, us, tell us about the challenges and the opportunities. Well, first of all, I think it's pretty obvious. We've got a big mass of uh, structure here looking directly at us. So right. that's one challenge, is how to make that all kind of come down into the scale of this small site. Mm -hmm. uh, two is that we have a street that's pretty busy right mm -hmm. here next to us, so we have to do something to kind of isolate that from the, the residents here. Mm -hmm. Third, we have this old barn garage structure over here that we have to live with for a short while. Mm -hmm. And lastly, we have a pretty tough budget situation, mm -hmm. which is nothing new. As right, you right. Uh, so with all that, why don't we uh, kind of work through what we've, what we've done here. Uh, on this side, We've created a little outdoor space with a stone retaining wall right wonderful. here and a stone terrace. Uh, and on the back side of this retaining wall, we're going to build up a little mound yeah. and plant that with some evergreens. Rather subtle, right. but yet it will create a strong barrier between mm -hmm. the road and the house. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show you uh, that. We also okay. have a, a terrific piece of granite that was here originally as a door sill. Yeah, I remember it. And um, it'd be a shame not to incorporate this yeah, into the landscape, absolutely. you see. So what wow. I'd like to do is to take and turn this up mm -hmm. uh, and have this as the seat mm -hmm. surface and put it into the wall. Now that wall is over here, which is uh, oh, about 15 feet away or so, and it uh -huh. will run this way across the front. I did want to show you uh, here on the plan a little sketch that I've done. If you were inside looking out, you would come out onto this little stone mm -hmm. terrace, and there's a piece of granite, you see, mm -hmm. which would incorporate into the wall to be about mm -hmm. a 16-inch height and the mound of evergreens behind. A little stair goes down the side, and I wanted to show you how we get down to the south okay. side of the house. Well, really what you've done, Tom, is to sort of create an exterior room here. That's, that's the idea. Yeah. We've done that in a series, a series of spaces around the, uh -huh. uh, the bottom. So what about there. the wall before we go to well, the Well, this road. is uh, falling apart right here, as you can see. It's in, it's in pretty bad shape with all the frost teeth behind it. Sure. So I think what we really need to do is to tear this all apart and reconstruct. Uh -huh. And I think uh, Roger Hopkins, our granite man, is going to take and use some of this stone and incorporate it with newer stone mm -hmm. to bring this wall up and bring it across. So we'll have a wall that'll look pretty much like this wall, but a little higher. We're also going to be bringing this grade down. Now on the south side of the building over here, we have a whole nother kind of situation, a whole yeah. nother exposure. Well, it's even more massive here, isn't it? And we have a wonderful opportunity for uh, a garden, you know, with yeah. the sun coming sure on this do. side. We also have some drainage problems. As mm -hmm. you can see, we've got puddling in here, so that's one thing we have to resolve. Right, and all the water's running straight off the roof. We have no gutters. Yeah. So I did want to show you that we've got, on this side of the house, a little spot here for vegetables, and we've put a fence here on this one little side mm -hmm. to kind of contain the, uh, the space, an arbored fence uh, kind of over oh, here great. for roses, and then another uh, stone wall on this side. But uh, one thing I did want to show here, also I have a little sketch, mm -hmm. yeah, um, of how that would look. You That's see, wonderful. so the stone wall, the fencing, and the stone uh -huh. wall on this side. And here's a, a view of the whole yeah. thing looking directly from yeah. the south. 
Well, this is, makes another quite an intimate little area with a completely different purpose for growing vegetables. Right. It's quite sunny and warm here, Yeah, too. it should be pleasant. Now, we do have a, another bit of a problem on this side, on this corner, where you can see this wall is beginning to, to burst out down here, too. Yeah. But we have some great old grapes here that yeah. I understand are very vigorous. So what I'd like to do here is to take this wall and build it out and kind of slope it mm -hmm. down like this, right, in, right down in through here. Mm -hmm. And then we'll take this bank, which forms this, this sort of rear edge of the barn, and bring that around mm -hmm. and have that meet this slope right mm -hmm. here. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to show you is that we have this uh, kind of neat little uh, path. Yeah, I path noticed that. That winds up the bank like this to this mm -hmm. upper area. And I just wanted to illustrate you know, how we make that work. And we'll show you as it's constructed. Okay. But it's a, it's, a, it's a nice little way of getting up Good, well, informally up the slope. Walk us down the garden path. All right. <laughs> well, Tom, you know, the site looks a little rough. But it was only several weeks ago that this whole back acreage was filled with tents of timber framers screaming saws and pounding mallets. So we have cleaned it up a little bit. Good. Sorry. Well, I appreciate that. I uh, wanted to talk about this west side of the house here, Steve, which I really look at as the kind of little private enclave. Uh, this is the family room that looks out uh, right here. You see, we're up about 18 inches or so above right. grade. So I'd like to come down with a couple of wood steps mm -hmm. to this uh, granite uh, platform here. Tom, why, why do you want to come down with steps? I mean, isn't the logical thing to have a, a deck well, that is another alternative, but the thing I object to there is on a deck, inevitably, there's furniture, and you'd be looking out to the view through the furniture, and I, I think that's not good for this spot. We ought to look at the landscape out of this view right here. Uh -huh. So I'd like to take some more uh, sort of pieces of granite and tuck them into this little lawn panel uh, over here, and then heavily plant this edge with maybe two or three more juniper, uh -huh. like this, red cedars, uh -huh. to, to block the view I see. out. So that right. becomes a little private spot. Okay. And also to kind of direct the view in this direction toward the pond, which, as you can see, is really very, very pretty. Yeah. This really is the million-dollar view. It is terrific. Yeah. Uh, let's walk around the side here, where I wanted to show you this little uh, garden that we've, court space that we've designed. And I have a little... Uh, view of it right here that shows you we're standing right here. We're going to use some old granite uh, pieces that we found here on the site as a gate post coming in. I have a little fence kind of on this side mm -hmm. and then a lawn panel in here to this little garden sort of entry court. Uh, and then on this end of the barn uh, over here will be a cutting garden right. with a bench that will view out toward the pond that's also. A, that's a real nice idea. And of course, these granite posts came from our basement. Oh, that's where they're from. Yeah. Oh, terrific. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we can use them again. Yeah. Uh, let's walk up a little further. I wanted to show you how the driveway comes up and meets the uh, other edge of the space. Okay. Now we go into this great big space here. Right. Right. And one of the things that impresses me about your plan is that it's a series of rooms around the whole house. Yeah, and this is the room. primary one that visitors come to see first. And I did want to show you on the plan, too, where the walk ends. This is a brick walk, you see, which makes a connection between the house and the uh, garage. Now, it doesn't really make a connection. It kind of also acts, uh, in addition, it acts as, a, as uh -huh. a kind of terminus for this driveway coming in. So visitors come, park, get out, walk in, come out. Right. And we have it so that they can back up this way and go out like this, uh -huh. which is uh, it's nice to head out in the yeah. traffic instead of backing out. Now, Tom, I see a lot of driveway here. This is presumably driveway here, where they can eventually pull their cars into this into the garage. Of the garage. Yeah. Yeah. Now, aren't we running into quite a bit of money with all this driveway? Well, normally so. But I'll tell you, we've really uncovered something that I'm finding very exciting, Steve. It's a recycled. Uh, a product where old pieces of buildings are taken and crushed up, brick and concrete and asphalt shingles, and ground up in, uh, and impregnated with sort of a cold uh, bituminous, uh, mm -hmm. water-soluble bituminous, and then it's come, it, it comes back to the site and is put down about six inches thick. Uh, we're working on that right now, and I think it's going to be about one-third the price mm -hmm. of, well, right. let's say, maybe one-third less than the price of well, real asphalt. Great. Tom, I love the plan, and it looks wonderful, but i got to pop the $64,000 question to you. Mm -hmm. What's it all going to cost? Well, we've, uh, we've been pretty vigorous on uh, getting donations here, so I think we have a good number of the materials uh, donated. Uh -huh. uh, I think for most of the labor, uh, plus some additional materials such as topsoil, somewhere in the ten dollars to $12,000 range. Well, that's seems, very reasonable. Yeah, that seems incredibly reasonable. And just, what, 5 6% of the total budget? Yeah, yeah. I think normally you'd expect at least twice that, maybe mm -hmm. even two and a half times that for, for the real world, uh, you know, if we were to go out and buy it on the market. Now, what does that do to a retail value of a house? Well, in my opinion, I would say every penny is going to be worth it here because you're really creating a setting for the house that will be useful mm -hmm. and beautiful. Well, great. I really appreciate the work you've done. It looks gorgeous. And I'm going to go talk to the Wickwires right now to 
pop the question of price to them. Yes, sir. Okay. And here, drawing like so many salmon on racks in the sun, are our clabbers. Freshly stained, smooth on one side, rough on the other side, absolutely clear and gorgeous. And over here, our intrepid homeowners, staining away like crazy, contributing the sweat portion of sweat equity. You enjoying sweat equity? Oh, we're having a great time. <laughs> Can't you tell? Yeah, I can see it. Well, you must have learned something about staining clabbers. Why don't you tell me about it? Well, Barb? It's, a, it's a hard job. No, it's not that bad. <laughs> First, we start with bundles of 10 clabbers. And Tommy Silva showed us, helped yeah. us out. I think he felt sorry for us. I First, doubt it. <laughs> First, we brushed the edges. Uh, with the stain, we found that we used to roll it, but we dripped too much. We wasted stain, and we also uh, left marks. Left marks on okay. it. That wasn't so good. So we do each side, right? And then we do put lay them out flat, right? And we roll on, roll the uh, smooth side first. Right. Uh, we're doing both sides to seal mm -hmm. the stain in. Okay. And then we do we do a more careful job with the roller on the rough side. Okay, why the smooth side first, Barb? Because that's going on the back. It's going to be rough side out. Okay, um, now why do you want the rough side out? Well, I, it's more barn looking, I think, and also the rough side makes more interesting shadow patterns. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about that. Okay. What are you using for stain, Barb? It's an oil-based semi-solid pigment, and it's a beautiful barn red color. It goes on very, very well. Yeah. Okay, okay. well... It's gone on, what, about half a dozen bundles so far, and... More than that, more than that. More than that, okay. And uh, the Silva Brothers will dispatch these in probably half hour. Yes. How many more do you have to do? <laughs> <laughs> That's the discouraging part. Uh, we've probably got another 10 to 15 bundles <coughs> here. And Tommy said today that we've got half again as many uh -huh. still to come. Uh, then we have to do the shingles. Yes. Right behind you. Yes, once again. Beautiful, western red cedar, gorgeous, clear. Treat them with respect. We and will. You've got a lot of them to treat with respect because I just ha helped the Silver Brothers <laughs> unload 90 boxes of these. 90. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> now, how are you going to paint these? Well, what Tommy said to do is dip them uh -huh. rather than paint them. So that dip should them. go quicker, yes. But then we fling them like cards. Fling on... them like cards. That's what he said Tom to do. Tom told you to do that. Yes. Oh. We're uh, doing everything Tommy tells us. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> and we should get air circulation underneath so that they will dry uh, rather than laying them so out you're flat. you're playing them on cardboard or something yes. like that. Yeah. yeah. All 90 boxes of them. Uh, I don't know where we're going to find the okay, cardboard well, for that. i got to be around to see this. Yeah, that'll well, take look, a while. On to more serious issues. I've just come down from the mountain talking with Tom Worth. He says you can expect a ten dollars to $12,000 landscape bill and that is with a tremendous amount of donations. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a, an unscheduled budget item. Uh, can you deal with that? Yeah, I think we can. Uh, we've had some of the bills begin to come in now and had some of the estimates tied down a little more firmer fashion. Uh, I think, look? yes, a number of them look uh, quite good from our point of view. The original estimate on the electrical work was 15000 uh, The electrician is now saying seven to 8000 uh, the chimney was 13 in the original estimate. Uh, Tommy says that we can get that done for five to six. Uh, we're saving money uh, painting. Uh, How all much are saving painting? Well, the original estimate was 8,000, both interior and exterior. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, you'll save a lot because those big high cathedral ceilings, you'll be crawling up there, that'll cost you a lot, right? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure that we'll... <laughs> He's reconsidering. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Well, I want to wish you the best of luck with your painting. Meanwhile, I've got to go find Norm and close this one out. Take okay. care. We'll see, see you. Ya. Well, Norm, our homeowners are still comfortable with things. They feel that they can control the budget, and they're contributing their sweat equity as well. Well, that's going to save them money. You bet. So what's in store for next time? Well, next time we're going to pour the concrete slab down in the basement, and we're going to use something we never used before. Concrete that's reinforced with little filaments of fiberglass. Well, that should really be interesting. So until then, I'm Steve Thomas. And I'm Norm Abram. For this old house. All right, help me close this place up. Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs. 
auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. and you go, gosh, I knew I forgot something. Well, of course, the way you do it is you build up the pen of logs and then cut the door through. Again, we're going to do that later. So we've got to cut the door in. We've got to chink it. We've got to put the fireplace on. We're going to have to put the roof on, too. And we're going to have an interesting kind of log gable roof using, uh, we are going to actually undercut into the top of, um, of some of these pieces like you see right here. Unusual thing, but that's because we're doing a log gable roof. Well, we're going to do that next time. I appreciate you staying around and helping me on the log house so far. We'll get together again and finish it up. This is Roy Underhill in the Woodwright Shop. Thanks for joining me. So long. Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by State Farm Insurance Companies. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Additional funding is provided by this and other public television stations. Roy Underhill is the author of the Woodwright's Companion and the Woodwright's Workbook, published by the University of North Carolina Press and available at bookstores and libraries nationwide. This is PBS. Many of today's programs are made possible in part by a grant from the Morley Candy Company. We invite you to stay tuned to CMU Public Television, a public service of Central Michigan University. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. <laughs> That's your last length of pipe, but I don't feel it hitting bottom. Well, it's not supposed to hit bottom, Steve. We also have had this past weekend hundreds and hundreds of visitors. Uh, we had one couple drive through from New Jersey just to find the barn. Is this the way Fred Flintstone got his start? Yabba dabba do. <laughs> Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents. For family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Thank you later. I think that's really going to look great. Good morning. Steve Thomas. Welcome to this old house. Well, it's an unusually balmy late fall day here in New England. And it's a good thing, too, because we still have a lot of outside work to do before the snow flies. We're going to be making our connection at the wellhead. And then our old friend, Roger Hopkins, is going to show us how to cut granite with hand tools. Now, inside, Norm is laying out some of the old barn siding. And he's going to try to figure out how to use it as interior paneling. And Tom Silva is doing some of the final framing on the bathrooms. But first, let's go check in with Dave Haynes. 
Now we've located the well on the extreme western corner of the property. That's to keep it away from the contaminants of any of the neighboring septic fields and to keep the good clear water. Good morning, fellas. Oh, good morning, Steve. Nice to see you again. You got a new face. Yes, my father, Bob Haynes. Hi, Steve. This is, this is your dad. He looks younger Glad than you. Glad to meet you. you. Well, I work him hard to keep him young. This is Scott McDonald. Hi, Scott. Good to see you again. Thank you. Today's the day that we're going to make the connection between the well and the house and actually provide water to the house. Correct. We've got to get the water out of this well into that house. And over here, we've got the well, which we drilled earlier, which we have this steel casing that runs from this point down 70 feet, 10 feet into the solid bedrock down below. Okay, that's the one you drove in with that pneumatic hammer. Correct. And then from that point on, the well continues from surface 445 feet deep overall. Okay. And then since then, the water's infiltrated from that point up to approximately eight feet from the surface. Okay, that's what they call the static water level. Correct. Nobody's pumping it, so the water comes up inside the Correct. Basin. That's where it naturally stable rises off. Now, what are these pipes down in the pit there? Okay, we've got two pipes running from the well here up towards the house. One pipe, this one here, carries the water from the well to the house. The second one acts as your vent and your conduit line. A conduit for the, for the electrical, electrical service. pipe for the wire. Okay. Okay. And okay. Then basically, what we've got to do now is we've got to make up the pumping system and drop it down in the well All right. to supply the water. Show me that. Well, let Bob take hey, over Steve. from here. <clears throat> we have a stainless steel pump. That's a beauty. It's a 100% stainless steel pump. This is your motor. Uh huh. This is your fluid in. And we're going to make this up and put this down in the well. All right, now what drives the water up there? How does this actually pump? The water comes in here, mm -hmm. and these things right here are what they call impellers. Yeah. Each one of these little dishes are right. an impeller. Okay. So that drives the water up through here, up through the pipe, and into the house. Now, how long does a unit like that last? Well, a unit like this should run approximately 15 years. And uh, if everything's maintained properly. The most important part to a pump is not to have them rapid cycle. Okay, so turning on and off. On and off, time. on and off. That ruins your electric motors. All right. It also will burn out your fluid ends. Okay, now what determines whether it turns on or... The, the proper size, size of the pump and the proper size of the tank, and it has to have like 24 or 25 pounds of air maintained in that tank at all times. Okay. So really what you're saying is that the critical thing here is designing the system, system to the house. To the house and the well. Well, Bob, how do you get the water from the top of the pump to the wellhead? Well, see, we have to add pipe to it. That makes sense. I have a little starter piece already made up here. We're going to thread into the top of the pipe. Now, you thread the connection? Yeah, we, we thread it rather than use clamps. Why is that? It's a one horsepower motor, and it has a lot of weight, a lot of snap to it. And threaded is much better than clamped. Okay, so this thing supports the whole weight of this pump. Mm -hmm. Now, what's this thing? Here? This is a torque stop, Steve. Yeah. It's so a one horsepower motor, and this reduces some of the snap when that pump starts in the well. So it's just like your skill saw, when mm -hmm. this thing starts Start. up, it kicks like that. Right, and this holds everything in the center so it don't wear out the wires. I see. All right, good. Now what's the next step here? Well, the next step is we're going to make the wires up. We're going to use... Now you got a big spool of wire here. Correct, that's, that's a thousand feet of 10-3 wire we're going to make up. Okay. And use that some, rides all the way down the well. We're going to use some stake ons and clamp it up. Then we're going to slide a heat shrink on over the connection to now make what, a watertight connection. What is a heat shrink? That's an epoxy filled heat shrink tubing. When we add heat to it, it'll shrink up and have some epoxy in it to make a watertight seal in that well. Okay. To shrink up. Yep. See the epoxy coming yeah. out the end? That makes a nice, tight, forever water tight seal. That's amazing stuff. So even if you immerse this thing in salt water, nothing uh, would that get in there. That will stay water tight forever. Great. Now we're going to put it in the well. Now how do you keep it from dropping down there? Oh, that's a little trick David will show you. All there is to it, Steve. All right. Now this is to uh, what? To protect the wire, so okay. the wire don't chafe on the top of the casing. Now all we have to do is add our pipe on top of it. 
How long are these pipes? 20 foot per section. Yeah. Steve. You just make this up just like you made up the drill pipe on right. the back of your rig. Everything's a little lighter, that's all. All set. Mm-hmm. Got some tape there. No, nope. nope. not until we add the next section, Steve. Okay. So this is the whole process. You just keep yep, going keep down until, until you... we get to the bottom. So each pipe is all made up with rector seal, just all laid yep. out, ready to go. Yep. Now this is this is pretty neat. But tell me, you guys, have you ever dropped a, pi uh, a, a pump down the hole? Yes, I have, Steve. <laughs> How do you get it out? Uh, it's not very easy. Usually you drill them out. Not a pretty sight. Huh? No. You just drill the whole thing in. Yep. Well, it's stainless steel, which is non-magnetic, and plastic's non-magnetic, so you got nothing to grab. So you really weren't kidding. If you do drop a pump, you literally have to bring the rig back, set it up, drop the drill bit down the hole, and grind that pump to yeah. dust. Drill them out. As long as there's, if there's no wire connected to it, that's it. There's no way to get them out. Now, what's this device? This is a wire guy that keeps the wire like the one we put on the bottom of the pump. It keeps it in the center of the well. Okay. To protect the wire, protect the pipe. That makes You've sense. We've actually pulled some out of the hole, Steve, where these little ears have been worn completely right off. So there really is a tremendous amount of whipping action. Yes, there is. Anything we can do to minimize it and help. I can feel this thing is starting to get heavy. I'm glad it's not a thousand feet down. Yeah, you'll That's be right. <laughs> It's heavy, Steve. Well, that's your last length of pipe, but I don't feel it hitting bottom. Well, it's not supposed to hit bottom, Steve. We want to actually hang it in the well. Yeah. What we've done is we, we've got this thing, we're going to set it at 400 feet. Mm -hmm. The well's at 445. Now, what we're going to do is hang the pump at that level, so there'll be 45 feet of hole below it, which will act as a sediment pocket in case any foreign matter should come in with the water formations itself. We've actually calculated mm -hmm. that and gave it some place to go. Now, what's this thing here? Well, this is the top half of the pitless adapter unit. And basically what we have is a unit similar to this. Yeah. We have two piece. This piece here hangs inside the well. Yeah. Okay, with your gasket and everything else. This is your drop pipe, which will be hanging from this piece. We're going to lower that down inside the well, four feet below grade, and it'll actually slip in and hang like that. And you do that with this, with this steel pipe here. That's uh, what they call a pole pipe. That's ingenious. Now this, I have to see, it looks like this would be fairly tricky here to actually maneuver that little flange into the other thing way down the pipe there. Not really, it's pretty simple once you've done it once or twice. That's it. All right. That's it, Steve. All we got to do is cut the wires, splice them, put the cap on, and then we're ready to go inside the house. Great. Now, Dave, both our water line and our conduit containing the three-wire 220 service to the pump, run from the wellhead under the slab here. Come up over here into the control center in the tank where Bob's finishing up right now. We finished hooking it up for you, Steve. Good work. Electrical panel, control box, lightning arrestor. Lightning arrestor, tell me about that. That's to protect the pump motor from high voltage. Mm -hmm. If you get a hit with like lightning. So a house gets hit or the pole outside gets, gets hit. hit. That protects the motor that's in that pump, and we don't want to have to change that motor. So this is sort of like a surge protector on your Absolutely, okay. correct. Pressure switch mm -hmm. starts and stops the pump. Mm -hmm. Pressure gauge so you can see what the pump is doing. Okay. What's this blue cylinder? This blue cylinder is a tank. It catches the water. It's got a big bag inside of it, right. full of air. The pump starts, forces that air bag up to the top of the tank, mm -hmm. reaches 60 pounds, shuts off. When you call for water upstairs, Instead of the pump starting, that airbag forces the water back out. I see. So the airbag compresses like this. Mm -hmm. As you call for water, it expands. It expands, forces the water out. You get a 20-pound drop, pump restart, fills the tank back up again for you. Great. Are we ready to get some water out We're of ready to fire her up. Okay. Are we ready? There she goes, Steve. Mm -hmm. Pump is running. She's pumping water for you. Jumps right up there to, uh, what, 38 pounds? 38 mm -hmm. pounds. She's filling the tank now. You this will go all the way up to 60 pounds? 60 pounds, then the pump will shut off. Okay. We're ready to show you water anytime you're ready. Let's see. All right. I don't know if I'd like to drink this. 
Well, you got to bear in mind, too, that water's been heavily chlorinated. You and dumped chlorine in there? Oh, yeah, we did that at the time we drilled the well. Yeah. And also that that well has been sitting stagnant for uh -huh. a couple million years, too, that we decided to punch a hole in the backyard. Uh -huh. So what do you do, drain the system for a well, while? Well, basically, the thing to do is put the hose outside, let it run for a couple of weeks, and then we'll take and come back and sample it at a later date. Good. Well, I can't thank you guys enough. Welcome, Steve. Pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Meanwhile, I've got to go find Lynn Wickwire, our okay. homeowner. All right. Take care. Thank you much, Steve. Hi, Hi Lynn. How you doing? Good. Hey, how do you like your barn? Oh, I think it's fantastic. Uh, we're just having a great time. It looks the way the barn used to look. Yeah, it sure does. How do the neighbors like it? Oh, they're having a marvelous time. Uh, they all appreciate what uh, has happened, and yeah. they, uh, they think it's a great uh, job. We also have had this past weekend hundreds and hundreds of visitors. Uh, we had one couple drive through from New Jersey oh, just to find the barn. Uh, they've had to do some work because we haven't given the address out. Huh. Uh, no so kidding. people are concerned and they want to see the project. That's great. Hey, I got to ask you, you're all dressed up in a business suit here. Those don't look like the clothes that you would be painting in. Well, uh, I had a meeting with our attorney this morning because a resident of the town has filed an appeal. Wait, an on appeal? I'm we don't have to take the barn down, do we? No, we don't think so. Uh, we hope not. Uh, but the appeal uh, contests the issuance of the building permit by the building inspector. Now, tell me about this one. This is... Well, she uh, alleges two things in her appeal. Number one, that we were defrauding uh, the public and the town, that we knew from the outset that the barn was shot. Hey, defrauding. You know, we had Ted Benson, Tom Silva, and Norm Abram. They all said it had to come down. It was rotten to the core with powder proof beetles. We agree. Uh, we did not know. It's a saga that's been folded over time. We had even reserved a crane, as you know, yeah. to take pieces of the frame down. Yeah. Uh, now, we don't agree issue? with that at all. The second one is an issue of timing. Uh, she states that, or alleges, that uh, the barn was not existing or that it was taken down before the building permit was issued. Uh, but we but have... We did this with the full knowledge and consent of the building department. Absolutely. Uh, we had a demolition permit from the building inspector. He came out beforehand, before the frame came down, and agreed that it was shot. Uh, mm -hmm. We would save what we could, but that it could not be saved and used inside the new barn. Now, where's all this going? Well, the appeal... The hearing on the appeal will be heard in the next couple of weeks, uh -huh. and we will present our evidence uh, and argue the points there, and the Board of Appeals will make a decision sometime thereafter. Well, I'll let you go, and uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Okay, believe me. thanks. Okay. Do you believe that one? Well, onward and upward. i got to go find Norm. Well, Norm, you're not going to believe this one, but we have a citizen who is questioning the validity of our building permit. <laughs> is that right? It seems a little late for that. It sure does. And we're almost ready to move in. Yeah, well, it's something that we're going to watch very closely. But what do you got going here? Well, uh, you know, we wanted to finish the library up using yeah. some of the remnants from the old uh, barn. And I've been digging through the pile this morning, and I, find, I found these nice pine boards. They're rough cut on both sides plane on the back, and we even got some wormholes in it. Yeah. And then uh, they've got some kind of coating on this side. Yeah, is this a lead-based paint? We certainly don't want to introduce that. No, it, see, it flakes off easily. I think it's a calcimite yeah. or something like that. We'll just yeah. wire brush it off. And I think I've got enough in this pile to do the doors that we need for the library. Yeah. And then over here in this pile, I found these, uh, this three by six which I think I'd like to slice in half and, and maybe make some false beam corners in the library. Yeah. Now, you'll have enough even with the rot that's in here? Yeah, it's long enough so I can get a section that's still good. Mm -hmm. And then these, it'd be a shame to waste these. We've yeah. got some 16 and a half inch wide, two inch thick planks. And I think if I rip them in half, I can actually build a bookcase out of them. Yeah, these are real nice. Now, is this all you've salvaged? Well, this would be enough for the bookcase and the doors, and I found some more that we might be able to use for some wainscoting mm -hmm. over near the shed. Let me show you. Okay. A wonderful day, huh, Norm? Sure is. We're not going to get many of these. This is a, this is a gift at it this sure time is. of the year. Look, I've been taking these boards. Why don't you grab a couple of those? I'm lining them up over near the barn. There's quite a few, and this was the vertical siding of boarding that was on the inside of the barn that you like so much. And it's covered with a white 
wash like the other boards, right. and I think we'll just brush that down. Hey, look at this. Nailed in here must have been a map of some place. Can you uh, save that for us? You want to save that? <laughs> yeah, we can save that. We can work around it and maybe put a coat of varnish on it or something to keep it intact. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> So you, do you think that you can reuse these milled edges? Well, see, some of these have a couple tongues on them, and they're, they're in pretty good shape, but the boards that match with it have grooves yeah. on each end, and they're badly damaged. Yeah. So I think what I'll do is just resaw the edges, and then I'll be able to turn them horizontally. Uh -huh. I won't tongue and groove them again, and I'll just do some wainscoting mm -hmm. with them. Now, do you think you'll have enough for the library? Yeah, I think so. Why don't we go in, and I'll show you okay. what we're going to do. Wait a minute. This is brand new. Looks like it's been here for 100 years. Well, that's right. Dick took some of the old beaded board and made this door and, of course, used a window, a mm -hmm. high-tech window, but the boards are what's important. It looks like an old door, but it's actually applied to a new door. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, look inside. Just yeah, a, sure is. Look at that. Inch and three-eighth solid core door mm -hmm. and flush on the inside. Put a little trim around this window and paint it up and it'll look great. Yeah. Sure would be nice. Well, now the library. Okay. Uh, those boards that I've got, the first pile we looked at, we'll use for making the doors. We've got a couple doors right here, the pocket doors. Pocket. I think they'll be smooth on the outside, and then I'll do a Z-brace right. on the inside, as well as on this door right here. Right. Then I'll take uh, some of these boards that I've remilled and run wainscoting horizontally around the walls, mm -hmm. and then down around this side, right up to the outside wall. I'm not going to run it on the outside wall because I think that trying to go around a window that almost goes to the floor is going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So we'll let it end in the corner where we'll have little those little false right. posts, you know, like right. a two-by-two two post. And then you'll run a baseboard across here, the same material? Right, we'll run some rough stock across as a baseboard, and that'll sort of tie everything yeah. together. And then the two-inch plank that I've got out there, that rough plank, I'll make a couple risers, you know, pieces that'll come up maybe about six feet, with dados in them, and then run two-inch thick planks right across, and that'll be the bookshelf. Mm -hmm. No support in the middle? No, with two-inch plank, I don't think it'll be a problem. No, I guess you could load quite <laughs> a few books on yeah. that. Well, how long will this take you to do? Well, it's not going to take long to actually put the materials in place here at the job, but it's going to take me a while back at the shop to remill these boards and make up the doors. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll drop by and give you a hand. Well, you're welcome anytime. But well, meanwhile, I have an appointment with Roger Hopkins. You mean Count Rockula? That's right. Rock Rockula is going to uh, show me how to tear granite in two with my bare hand. Well, if there's anyone who can show you how to work with granite, he's the man. Okay. Good. Catch you later. Okay. Boy, well, the terrace is really shaping up, Roger. We should pretty well wrap it up today. Yeah. What's happened? happening? Well, we have the steps here to work on. Yeah. I had this slab specially uh, sawn up in uh, Vermont yeah. such that we can uh, easily split it up. Now it's nice and smooth on this side. Has this been sawn? Right. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to split this lengthwise along this blue mark and then mm -hmm. we're going to split it across. Uh, can we split it this way as well? Well, not with the hand tools we're going to use because of the way the grain is set. Mm -hmm. How do you do it? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to score a line in with uh, this slab splitter here. This has a specially hardened tip so that it will uh, absorb, you know, create a indentation along here. And I'm going to be the, the hammer man. Okay. What do I do? Just hold it up there like a big cool what, chisel? Well, what you're going to do is hold it vertical and uh, per uh, perpendicular to the, the stone. Yeah. And then you're going to skip every other width of the blade for the first time through, and then we'll we'll come back and hit the spots we haven't hit. All right. Now just keep walking right across. Right. Want to make sure that's perpendicular. Now there okay. we go. Right at the end? Yep. All right. Is this the way Fred Flintstone got his start? Yeah, but uh, I do. <laughs> you ever miss? Not today, I hope. Me Here's too. Like, uh... 
gonna go. From here, from the middle? Uh, just comes back towards me. Starting towards, back here? Yep. Well, actually, we can skip along a little further. All right, good. You'll hear the change in the sound of the stone. It's starting to crack. Yep. Go. One more. That's it. Now, let's see how we did. Pry it apart. Not bad for a couple of minutes' work, huh? Yeah. What's next? Okay, let's hit. Let's hit through this line. I imagine this one will be a little easier. Come directly across okay. over so we get the message into the stone where it's going to end up. Now, on these short ones, you work your way back and forth like this? Not a bad idea. Keep it perpendicular. That's gone. There, there we, we go. go. There you go, Steve. Why don't you give it a try? That's it. Now, as I understand it, the idea of doing this is to give this face a little character, sort of round it out. Right. Well, you can see the relief here, the stones mm -hmm. protruding out. It makes them look a lot more natural. This is wonderful stuff to work. Now, we'll do the other side. Okay. Now, do you start from any particular... Well, you can start right along there at the end. That's it. All right, now keep your line going along this straight. See yeah. how it's getting, getting a little uneven there? Yeah. Now you come back here and just knock that off a little okay. bit. That'll straight. Ah, beautiful. Good, good. That's good. What about the ends, Roger? Okay, we want to join these points and these points here. So you're gonna you're gonna bite in here and aim the chisel down some, okay. and then one swift blow should do it. Set it first. A hard, hard blow. That's it. Beautiful. Okay. That's it. Yep. Well, you might want to dress that up just a hair there. And right up there, yeah. See, now you got a nice, nice straight line. Mm -hmm. Now, I noticed before we set our step that you've been real careful to excavate all the soil. And you've got, just got sand and gravel there. Is it that important? We don't want any water to stay in the soil here. Uh, we want it just to completely drain through so that we have no de freezing thawing action in the mm -hmm. winter where it'll throw the steps out of out of place. This will just drain completely through. Okay, Rich, why don't we start it up and let's bring that step in. Good, Rich. Good. Down a little. Down. All right, let's leave it there, Rich. Okay, pull your bar out. That's it. Switch it around. And yeah, we okay. come right to these yellow marks that you've... Right. I'm right on the yellow line. Yeah, okay, so am I. I think we just drop it right there and check our level. A little high on this end. Okay. Get the, uh, get the claw end of it going under. Claw end under. under. Good. Uh, the level's perfect. We've got just enough pitch so the water will roll off. Great. Let's set the third step. have the level. Well, we've got to bring that up almost that much. Put the bar under it and we'll camp some in. Well, Count Rockula, these stairs are gorgeous. I guess you've got one more to go up here, eh? Right. These ought not to go anywhere for at least a thousand years. I hope not. <laughs> you know, I love the way you've recessed this fixture right into the wall here. Well, this is an ingenious idea out of Vermont. Instead of, uh, building a wall around the light, yeah. why not build the light into the wall? I mean, this is a solid 12 by 12 block, and we have a low voltage lamp in here. For safety. For safety, and for ease of installation. You just mm -hmm. run the cord right through the uh, the wall and onto the transformer. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about this light is that it casts a, 
it can angle down and cast right over all these steps. So it lights the stairs and you don't see the source of the light. Right. Well, Rock, thank you very much. Rock. We didn't get to the framing this time. Maybe we will next time. But next time we're going to start to lay out our kitchen and we're going to start our rough plumbing too. So until then, I'm Steve Thomas for this old house. Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Hey, Norm. Steve? Boy, it's nice and warm down here. And boy, look at the headroom, you know? I know, this is an incredible basement. It's actually a good thing that we had to build on top of those rubble stone foundation walls, or else we never would have got this headroom. That's right, because today in a normal foundation, you end up with less than eight feet, and to pour a tall one costs a lot of extra money, so this is great. I think I'd put a shop on here. Oh, you bet. Right away. Hey, this looks like a nail gun, but uh, no compressor, no hoses. What's the story with this machine? That's right. This is a new type of nail, a relatively new. And it actually has its own self-contained engine. Its own engine? You right. mean cylinders, spark plugs, the whole shot? Pretty much that's the no idea. Kidding. There's a little battery here, which goes, which uh, actually runs a little fan yeah. and, and the spark plug. And that'll last quite a while. And then in here, there's a little fuel cell. So this is the oh. gas tank. That's right, this is the gas tank. There is a two-part fuel in here that gets mixed together and sent out through this nozzle. And as you pull the trigger, it fires the spark plug. Now, the fuel cell is great. It's good for about 1,400 nails yeah. per cell. And the that's... battery's good for about 4,000. Well, that's amazing. Let's see it work. You want to give it a try? Yeah. yeah it just works like a regular nail gun? Yeah, just press it against the 2 by 4 It's got a safety on it. I hear the fan going on? Yeah. Okay, we got our contact. All right. Now, who would use a tool like this? Well, contractors, it's, it's made basically for contractors in a situation where you don't want to lug out the compressor and the hoses and all those things. You only have a few nails to put in, mm -hmm. particularly up on a roof or something, a few sheets of plywood. This is a great tool to have. Great. Well, mind if I borrow it? Uh, you'll have to stand in line. There's a lot of people waiting to use this I one. I bet. <laughs> well, we're really rolling down here. There's all kinds of stuff going yeah. on here. This is... I don't recognize this. It's, uh, it's wire of some sort. That's right. It's, a, it's actually speaker wire. So Wickwire has decided to put a central speaker system in, and you might as well run the wires now. You yeah. Know. You're not going to get a chance later. Well, some of this stuff... This looks like uh, black pipe for gas up here. That's right, it is gas piping. And even though there isn't gas out in the street, uh, the wick wires decided that they wanted to cook with gas. So yeah. that's the piping for a propane hookup, which will go to their stove. Okay, and here's our copper feed lines for our water and our PVC waste line. You know what these are? Yeah, those are actually uh, the ductwork for the air, air heat exchanger, which goes up to this piece of equipment here. And you know, Steve, I'm really glad that you decided to put one of these in because yeah. when we set the panels on this building, I was concerned, and we were all concerned about the air because it's so tight, mm -hmm. and this will do the job. Well, I had a chance to talk with the installer, Rick Hartson, the other day. Let's have a look. Interior air pollution is becoming an increasing concern these days. We have with us Rick Hartson, who's going to explain it all to us. Hi, Rick. Hi, Steve. So what's our problem? Well, the problem is we have too tight of a house. Too tight of a house. Tom Silva's going to be overjoyed to hear he <laughs> built, built it too well. Yeah, that's Why true. is that a problem? Well, being so tight, it creates a lot of indoor pollutants. Um, like how? 
like it doesn't let them escape. Uh, they have, there's cooking odors, there's bathroom odors from aerosol cans, uh, adhesives from countertops, mm -hmm. uh, building materials, they all give off uh, different types of pollutants. I see, so all this stuff sort of collects in a cloud in the house, and because the house is so tight, it can't escape. Correct. What are you going to do to solve that problem for us? Well, what we're going to do is, with this piece of equipment here, we are going to take an exhaust suck the air out of the house and exhaust the polluted, dirty air to the outside. Mm -hmm. And as it goes to the outdoors, it passes over a heat exchanger. Mm -hmm. And this heat exchanger is like a bunch of fins yeah. with a large surface area. And at the same time, it draws fresh, clean air in from the outdoors and passes over that same heat exchanger and absorbs or extracts mm -hmm. the heat from the outgoing air. Now, there's kind of a contradiction here, but here we've built this very tight, very efficient house, and you're coming along and poking a big hole in it, and uh, you're bringing cold air from the outside and pumping it into our house. I mean, doesn't that sort of defeat the whole purpose of an energy efficient house? Well, not really, because with this piece of equipment, we can regain 85% of the heat that we are discharging. Give up a little heat, but that's not bad. Right, right. It's a price you have to pay to have a healthy house. Okay. Now, you're going to connect some duct work up to this and, Correct. and uh, to get it going. Is there any maintenance on this unit? Uh, very little. Um, you have a filter that has to be changed or cleaned. It's, it's washable. And you periodically check it, and if it's dirty, you clean it. Okay. And what does it cost to buy and install <coughs> one of these units? Uh, for this particular system, you're talking three to $4,000. Well, it seems like a hefty chunk of money, but, but one that uh, is necessary for a, a healthy house. Yes, it is. Well, thanks, Rick. I'll let you get back to work. Okay. You know, Norm, what this building needs is a good set of stairs. <laughs> it sure does. But I understand that you're going out to Wisconsin to see them being made next week. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be interesting. No, so bring it won't them be long before no. we have some stairs. Boy, there's a lot going on up here. Oh, uh, there sure is. You know... The drywall contract started a few days ago, and the first thing I do is build these platforms to get up here. Yeah, you know, we must be 18 feet off the deck up here, and it doesn't look like much when you're standing down there, but when you're standing up here looking down, it's pretty high. That's right, and the only way to get up here is to take planks and run them across the beams and lay down sheets of plywood and drag up pipe staging so that you can get way up there at the peak. Not, not a job for your typical homeowner. No, I don't know. what. I don't know what we were thinking of when yeah. we thought they could get up here and, and tape this and stage it and, and do all this work. Now, we're drywalling here. What, uh, what's happening here? Well, it's a, you know, drywalling is basically a three-part process. There's three coats of that mud that goes on. One with a piece of paper tape, which stops the joint from cracking. Right. And then two finished coats that get feathered out and then uh, slightly sanded, and then they'll get painted. I think we can... Now, we've got all this... Every rafter here has been taped off. That's right. See over here, these beams have been covered with this masking paper. Yeah. And look at, I mean, very carefully wrapped so they're right. tight. Not only to protect it from the compound, but later they're going to come in here and spray the paint on yeah. it. Yeah, so. I mean, that, that's an essential part of the job or else you'd ruin our lovely beams. Right. Now, at last count, we had what, 14 skylights? Unless you guys have slipped a few more in. No, it's 14 skylights and that's another area that takes a lot of work. That one is about half completed. Drywall, uh, corner bead, and three coats of mud on yeah. every one of them. Yeah. Now I see there's some drywall going in on this skylight up here. Maybe right. we can see that in a little well, better Roger detail. Up, Roger up here is putting up drywall around the opening, and you have to cut a bunch of small pieces. And what he has to do actually is cut his piece, and then he takes this J bead, and it's actually shaped like a J, and that slips over the top of the drywall and fits up against the skylight, so it gives it a nice right. clean transition. And then then uh, corner beads on the bottom and three coats of mud on every one of these. Yeah. Well, I've done a few skylights, and I can tell you it's a lot of work. It is. Well, there's a lot going on outside, so I'll let you get back to your nice little uh, machine gun there, and I'm going to go check on things out there. Okay. Boy, I'll say there's progress out here. We've got our brick walk laid. We've got our beautiful granite pillars set at the entrance here. More brick here. And here's Roger Cook, our enduring landscape contractor. 
Hi, Roger. How you doing, Steve? What, what are you doing out here on the coldest day of the year, dropping your plants in? It's just timing. It just seems like when we get into these projects, we always end up here in December. It's, it's cold, but we'll be all right. Well, you got some lovely plant material coming off of here. Why don't you give me the tour? I like this one. This is a fern spray cypress. Yeah. It's beautiful. Tom, uh, is this native? No, that was imported from Japan about 150 years ago. Now how big will this get? Probably 25 feet or so. Yeah. Now, what's this next one here? This is a flowering crab called Edna Mullins. It has a nice white flower on it. It has a semi-drooping habit to it. It also has some uh, fruit on it all winter long yeah. that the birds will come to. Oh, that'll be great. So you're going to use that someplace as a feed? Yeah, I think we'll use it as a specimen. Oh, yep. That'll be wonderful. What's and this? It, we have a blue stallion holly. Yeah. This is the male. It's beautiful color to yeah, it. Yeah, I love the sheen on the leaves there. And we also have the females that have a real nice red berry set to them. Winter hardy, and again, something we'll use as a specimen uh -huh. planting. Now, how is all? How are all these plants going to be like dropping into soil? It's about 10 degrees. Yeah. I'll, the temperature of the soil won't affect us. What we're worried about is freezing. So uh -huh. what we're going to do is when we put these in, we're going to put a big six or eight inch layer of mulch on top of them to insulate them. Right. Try to keep them from freezing solid. Uh -huh. And then no problem. They'll just do fine? Yeah, just like they were growing native, so it's no different. Great. Well, I guess Tom Worth's going to show up pretty soon to show us where to put all these. Yeah, things. we're going to lay it out, and he'll be here to straighten us out. Well, until he comes, why don't I give you a hand unloading some Great. Of Well, not only have we picked the coldest day of the year to finish our landscaping, but we're finishing up our granite patio as well. Now, to my mind, these pavers are set a little wide, and the, it's got a big gap here that seems to be filled with loam or dirt or something. Now, let's go over and talk to Nick O'Hara and Brian Griffin and find out why. Hi, Hello, Steve. gentlemen. Hi. Now, why have you set the pavers so wide apart? Steve, because... Uh going to put loam in between the joints there. Loam is going to go in there. Loam. Yeah. Normally, we'd set these uh, pavers on a bed of stone dust. Uh -huh. Because of the loam, we need to set a stone like this up on a pedestal of mortar. And once we have it set, Brian will level it off here. We cut away the mortar, and it enables the landscape, gives them a nice deep joint. Yeah. And it enables the, la the landscape to put um, soil in there. Uh -huh. Now, what I don't understand is why couldn't you do the same thing with stone dust? Well, if we laid the stone on a bed of stone dust, yeah. we can only cut away the depth of the stone because oh, then see. the stone okay. dust would wash away. This way here it enables us to get a nice clean joint. And you, and you run your loam right all the way down, get a nice depth to it. That's correct. And uh, the landscaper will plant grass in the loam and it'll, I guess, grow throughout the patio and sort of soften the look of the granite. That's correct. Now, this is real nice stone here. No, that's a Corinthian granite. Yeah, I know because a couple of weeks ago, John Devine, who's from a local stone yard, came up to help us choose the material for our patio and he brought all his samples with mm -hmm. him. Let's have a look. Well, very soon, our terrace will be paved with some kind of stone. What exactly, we don't know. And that's why John Devine has come. Hi, Steve. You've, uh, you run a showroom in a yard not far from here and you brought some samples for us to look at. Yep, I sure did. What have you got? Well, we've got five different types of paving stone for you to consider. First one is called burgundy. Yeah. That refers to the color of these little knobs here? Exactly. That's actually agate. Yeah. And uh, not quite gem quality, but it uh, adds a lot of interest to the stone. Now, this has got a real pronounced grain. How is this to work for a mason? It's, uh, it's fairly easy to shape the stone, but not really easy to cut it in half or to cut a corner off. So they really have to work with the stone that, that uh, he's given. Okay, so they sort of nibble away at it? Exactly. What about this one here? As far as workability, the same idea. This is called heritage. This has got a real sheen to it here. Very heavy mica content, yes. Uh -huh. and, and I also notice it's real grainy here. That's one of the advantages to that. That uh, You can very easily open up that uh, that seam and get two pieces out of one. So if you have a real thick one, you can split Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yep. Good. Next. Next is a uh, is called garden path stone, and that's a, a blue stone from Pennsylvania. And uh, the nice part about this is it's, uh, it's already pre-weathered, so it, it looks as though it's yeah. been down forever as soon as you put it down. It sure does, and it looks, looks real nice. Okay. The workability is excellent on that mm -hmm. stone also. Okay. Yep. This has got, it almost looks like red stain in it. I'm sure that's an iron content of some type, yeah. That's called Corinthian granite from upstate New York. And again, it's, it's real striated here. Exactly. Very easy to, to split in this plane to get two pieces, but not quite as easy to cut going in the other direction. So again, you have to shape it more than, more than cut it. All right. And our last sample here. Last one is called South Bay Quartzite. And again, that's kind of a, a sandstone, 
fairly easy to work and to, to cut and shape for the mason. Okay. Now, what about cost? Okay. Uh, cost, cost varies. The first two we looked at and the last two are about $3.50 mm -hmm. a square foot. The one in the middle is the bargain. That's about $1.70. Boy, it looks like I've got beer taste on a champagne budget. <laughs> I, I kind of like that one. Okay. That sounds good to me. Okay. Also, we have some brickwork here. Tom Worth has put a brick pathway here in on this plan. Okay. And have you brought some brick samples for us, too? Yeah, i got four things for you to look at there. Now, this has got a real shiny surface on it. What's this? That's called a city hall paver, mm -hmm. and uh, that's kind of the standard around here. It's a very well-known brick and and, uh, and very popular. Now, is this made in a mold? I see. Exactly. It's a sand-molded brick. Uh, the clay is actually put into a mold to get its shape. And what about cost on these? Costs are up around 47, 48 cents Boy, each. Kind of, kind of expensive. How about this one? Okay, that's called a Nantucket. Uh, that again is a sand molded brick. Uh, cost is about the same as the as the city halls, and uh, just a little bit different look, a little bit softer look to it. I notice these are more uniform too. Yes, they are. The the this plant is a little bit more modern than the other one. I bet the masons like these better. A little bit better, absolutely. Okay. Next one is called a Champlain, uh, and those are down around 34 cents each. Is this uh, molded as well? Same molded brick. That's right. The advantage of the molded brick, uh, again, is the, the instant antique uh, look to them. And uh, it, it gives you the, uh, the appearance of being down forever almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And our last one here. Last one is called an autumn blend paver. Uh, that's made by a different process. Uh, those are an extruded brick. Uh, the clay actually comes out of the machine uh, almost like spaghetti mm -hmm. and then uh, is sliced off. Now, on all of these, do we have any problem with freezing and thawing, with the, you know, the bricks spalling and cracking? Okay. They are all designed as a paver, and there is a certain ASTM specification that they have to meet, which they all do meet. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't buy just any brick as a paver. A face brick will not do. That's when you'll get into the problem with freeze and thaw. So they'll all, they're, they're all equal in terms of durability? Absolutely. Well, I kind of like this one here. It's got a real nice look. Yep. And uh, it happens to be one of the least expensive. But oh. uh, can you leave the samples so Tom Worth can have a look at them? We certainly can. No Good. problem at all. Well, thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Take care. Well, not only have Nick and Brian laid our beautiful granite patio, but they've also taken the pavers that we just saw and laid them in this beautiful sweeping walk up to the front door. Nick, how do you get started in a project like this? What we've done here, Steve, is we have a, a bit of gravel, yeah. compacted, and then we put two inches of stone dust on top of that. Uh -huh. And then on the outside edge, yeah. we've used a redwood to form up this walk. Yeah. And that gives us a nice, clean, crisp curve. Yeah, I was admiring that. Thank you. On the inside of that, we place a brick for support. Uh -huh. And we place it on edge like this. And we call this a soldier course. And we pound that in the same level as the walkway. And then when, when the walkway is finished, we strip the, the redwood away and this supports the walkway. Okay, I get the soldier course now. How do you start laying the field? Let me show you up here, Steve. This is a, a running bond pattern. Now, what does that mean? Well, we start off here with a full brick, a half a brick, full brick, half a brick, all the way across the walk, yeah. all the way down through the walk, again, running bond. And because we have a curve here, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to a straight walk, what Brian has done, he has cut into the walk a half brick every now and again. Uh-huh. Oh, I see. So because it's curving, the inside radius is tighter than the outside radius. And in order to compensate for the extra distance the outside bricks have to go, you have to cut these bricks every once in a while. And I guess if you didn't do that, they wouldn't line up as neatly as they have here, and you'd end up with something like this. Which is called a stack bond. And what we have here is a running bond. And this is gorgeous. I'll let you guys get back to work. I have to go off and find Tom Worth. Thank you, Steve. Cheers. Well, here on the west side, things aren't rolling along quite as quickly as they are on the other side. Well, we've still got to rake it up. If the budget allows, we'll put some more granite down, some sod. But here's Tom Worth, freezing, putting in our gray barber. Hi, Tom. Just in the nip of time, I hope. Okay. Well, I think that uh, this really is very appropriate for the character of this barn, Steve, in a sense. It's almost just a farmer went out and cut down these cedar saplings and installed it himself. Yeah. But Doug Floyd has been doing it for us over here. 
Hi, Doug. How do you get this uh, rustic look? Well, it's what, it's what they call uh, hand peeling. Hand yeah. peeling, just like a banana? Just like a banana or an orange. We have the guys in the shop, they take each one of these and they start at one end and they peel it right down. Now, why hand peeling? Well, it gives it that rustic look, and you know, uh -huh. it won't knock off these nubs that you see here like a machine would. I see. Now, Tom, I see you've got this overlap here. Why did you do well, that it, detail? It, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a very pleasant kind of bypass system here in that if you cut them straight, there would only be a little bit of purse against the, uh, the post here. So this is just both aesthetic and practical. So it sort of enhances kind of the look. rustic look, sure too. It does, and a little cut end off of here. Great. Now, we've got another piece of fence over here. Why don't you give me the tour? All righty. Well, this is just a standard picket fence, uh, essentially. Well, it's standard, but you know, I love the proportions. It seems well, just not, right. That's for not her. exactly by accident. It's about three feet high, and we thought it was just the right proportion to frame the edge of this little garden. Yeah. Uh, the picket, though, is is something that we had several choices of. This one I like because it, you know, kind of repeats the barn form. Right. Uh, the other choices were uh, were these ones that were cut somewhat in the same mm -hmm. sort of slope. Uh, some with a a more circular kind of form or a top. And this and one looks like it was just ripped just off a, a tree. Well, it's a very rough split uh, sapling. State. Any problems yeah. putting this fence together? Well, Doug can tell us about that. Well, in the colonial days, these were called pails. Yeah. And they were made by a, 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 a water sawn mill process. Uh huh. And uh, how did that of course, work? Of course, we don't have water sawn mill processing today. We have the circular saw, uh -huh. and we had to develop and ping up a, a, a bandsaw blade in order to get the, the right effect that we wanted. So I, I see what you mean. These marks here were originally made with an up and down saw that was driven by water, and you guys had to repli that's, replicate that. That's right. Now, what that's about right. these galvanized nails? They well, didn't have those in old Williamsburg. No, they didn't. They're galvanized nails to, to take care of the bad weather that we have in New England and don't rust out and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Tom, what's this thing here? This is one of my favorite details right here, Steve. This is a self-closing gate. It's a ball and chain. The weight of the chain uh, of the ball here forces the gate to close automatically. Isn't that, isn't that clever? Nice sound, too. Yeah, isn't it? Now, we have another piece of gate, piece of fence up here, too. Why don't you show yeah, me that? It, uh, it's put right against the granite post up here. Let's take a look. Well, Tom, what did you have in mind up here? Well, as you know, Steve, we found these beautiful old granite posts in the basement. Yeah. And we decided to use them up here to flank our entranceway. That's lovely. So we put them just a little to the edge, outside edge of the brick walk, uh, and then we're bringing the fence section up uh -huh. to help define the court space and attaching it to this granite post. Uh -huh. Now, Doug has developed a neat detail to make the attachment here. Well, let's see that one, Doug. Well, what we've done, Steve, is we've drilled two holes, top and bottom here, and we insert these two pins. Of course, we'll cement those pins in, and then we just lie the fence section right on top of it here, the rails, and then we fasten them from the bottom up on both rails. Out of the weather, eh? Out of the weather. And that's all there is to it? That's all there is to it. A simple, elegant, a perfect Yankee solution. That works. Doug, thanks a lot. Right. Now, Tom, it's 10 degrees, and we still have sod to put down, more trees to go in, and a driveway. How about it? Well, I can promise you the driveway, Steve, for sure. I'm a little worried about the plants and the sodding, I but bet. let's keep our fingers crossed. Maybe we'll get lucky. Yeah, okay. Well, meantime, there's one more thing I have to do, which is head down to the cellar and check in on the brick wires. Uh, you know, I love to see this. Homeowners hard at work on their home. How are, How are you? you folks doing? Good. Glad you came now. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, insulation is not my favorite job, but it looks like you guys have a pretty good system worked out. Yeah, really? we, we do. Uh, I'm up on the ladder. And Barb's down here cutting and then feeding up the pieces to me. Well, Barb, show me your technique. Yeah, I cut them in about 12-foot lengths because that's easy to manage, and then mm -hmm. I just cut them with my trusty knife and use this to as a guide. And it compresses the insulation there, making it yeah. easy to cut. Cut them on a board so I don't hurt the knife. Hand them up to Lynn, and away we go. You just Lynn, put that down. them right into the base. Yeah. And what I use where we don't have the wires to hold it up are these wire supports oh, that are cool. a little longer than each bay. And you just bend them and slide them into place, and they keep it from dropping. Yeah. And we're keeping the vapor barrier close to the heat upstairs. Right. Well, you know, insulating is kind of a long, somewhat tedious process, but 
by the end of it, you will have saved yourself quite a bit of money, and you'll be keeping the heat where you want it, which is oh, upstairs. Yeah. Uh, it builds up her body, too. Yeah. Well, you know, the last time we talked, a homeowner, a, uh, a resident of your town, had filed a complaint uh, with the Board of Appeals contesting the validity yeah. of our building uh, permit. Now, what's happened with that? Well, the Board of Appeals heard the case a couple of weeks ago, and two nights ago, they threw out the case. Threw it out. Yes, right. absolutely. She uh, did not have standing, and therefore the case mean? is finished. Uh, she is not in a grief party. So what does that mean? Well, she's not in a butter or in a butter oven of butter. So that's where it shakes out. That's, that's right. right. Well, we're you finished. Must be really relieved. Absolutely. Well, now there's another matter. You know, we're down maybe to the last 10 percent of the project. We just got a little more work outside, and uh, the drywallers are rolling away up there. We're about ready to start putting in tile. Heat's starting to go in. And this is the time in a project where budget and mm -hmm. reality either meet or collide. So where do we stand on budget? Well, we worked on budget last night, and I put some things together. We're in good shape, we think. We think that it'll work out uh, so we come in right where everybody thought we would. Uh, known expenses to date are 2085. Mm -hmm. Another estimate of things that we have not yet gotten, but we think we're fairly close, another 28,000. Uh -huh. So that what we come up with is 236.5. So it comes in at the 225 plus the contingency. We think we'll be right there. Great. That's uh, remarkable. Yeah, we it's a feel nice very feeling. Good about that. Looks, I bet. Looks like good news on all fronts. And, uh, you know, I won't hold you up any longer, but congratulations on that uh, Peel's decision. Oh, thanks. Bye. Good to see you. You know, I guess a lot of us were fooled by this timber frame. Remember that afternoon it went up? Four hours we had a whole building standing here. I have to admit that I thought it would be two weeks before the Wickwires moved in. Well, it's taken a lot of time and a lot of meticulous craftsmanship to flesh this building out with sensitivity to that frame. But it really won't be long now. Next time, Richard Fusui is going to take us on a trip to Germany in search of the perfect power plant to drive our heating system. Till then, Steve Thomas for this old house. Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. companion volume to This Old House, written by Bob Vila with Jane Davison, is a comprehensive guide for homeowners who want practical advice on how to understand, plan, and manage a home rehabilitation project, using both professional help and their own time and effort. To order your copy of the softcover edition, call 1-800-441-3000. 1995 plus shipping and handling. Credit cards accepted. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. Aren't we letting that naughty tummy of ours get a little bit out of hand? Next on Mystery, Rumpole visits the doctor. No wine. What? No meat. Fish. Eggs. Bread. Butter. Milk. Sugar. Or pastry of any kind.
example in the quality of life on Mystery. Be with us Thursday night at 9 o'clock. This is CMU Public Television, a public service of Central Michigan University. Many of today's programs are made possible in part by a grant from Weyerhaeuser of Grayling. Hello, I'm Bob Thompson, and welcome to the Victory Garden. Today, Peter Seabrook will take us to the spectacular botanic garden at Malahide Castle in Dublin, Ireland. Roger Swain will harvest from the Winter Garden, and Marion makes a hearty Portuguese kale soup. That's all coming right up, so stay tuned. Funding for the Victory Garden is provided by this station and by other public television stations. And by W.R. Grayson Company, makers of Peter's Professional Plant Food and Potting Soil and Peter's Concentrated Liquid Plant Food for all home gardening needs, both indoors and out. By America's largest producer of container-grown plants, Monrovia Nursery Company, supplying garden centers and local nurseries nationwide. And by Mantis Manufacturing Company, makers of a full line of lightweight lawn and garden equipment for the home gardener, including the Mantis 20, the 20-pound 20 rototiller, Our first report today comes from our roving British reporter, Peter Seabrook, who has this story from the Emerald Isle. If you've ever wondered why they call Ireland the Emerald Isle, then this says it all. The grass so green, it looks like green bays, and it stretches right across the land. And here it is, September, the first of the fall colour coming on the cherries, and the last flowers of summer, the pink hydrangeas. And we're pretty close to Dublin, about six miles from the city centre. We've come to Malahide Castle, the seat of the Talbot family for 700 years. But our gardening story starts much more recently than that. It was Lord Milo Talbot, who started in the 30s. His Additional funding is provided by this and other public television stations. Roy Underhill is the author of The Woodwright's Companion and The Woodwright's Workbook, published by the University of North Carolina Press and available at bookstores and libraries nationwide. This is PBS. Many of today's programs are made possible in part by a grant from Hub Supermarket of Prudenville. In 1913, the Paris Premier ended in a riot. There was a most dreadful row. One woman went out of a box and slapped a man who was clapping. Even the dancers hated it. For a company who was used to run ta ta pum pa pa pum pa pa pum pa pa of course it was awfully difficult and they hated it heartily. Controversy, scandal, and so Nijinsky's shocking ballet, The Rite of Spring, was abandoned. But now, dance detectives have reconstructed this legendary work. And after more than half a century, you can decide for yourself. Is it a monstrosity or a masterpiece? See the powerful ballet that made dance history in The Search for Nijinsky's Rite of Spring, next time on Great Performances. Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. We invite you to stay tuned to CMU Public Television, a public service of Central Michigan University. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. Now, Tom, it's 10 degrees and we still have sod to put down. More trees to go in and a driveway? How about it? Well, I can promise you the driveway, Steve, for sure. I'm a little worried about the plants and the sodding. You know, we must be 18 feet off the deck up here, and it doesn't look like much when you're standing down there, but when you're standing up here looking down, it's pretty high. Right. And this is a time in a project where budget and reality either meet or collide. So where do we stand on budget? Funding for this old house is provided by... State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health, like a good neighbor.
State Farm is there. And by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver... <laughs> and the Woodwright's Workbook, published by the University of North Carolina Press and available at bookstores and libraries nationwide. This is PBS. Many of today's programs are made possible in part by a grant from Chemical Bank. Do you think World War II was a good war? This week on Firing Line, author Paul Fussell offers a fascinating view on romanticizing war. But I'm not really saying that it was worse than all other wars. I'm saying that it was by no means the good war without quotation marks. What I'm trying to do is to restore the quotation marks around Studs Terkel's title. Yeah, right. A lot of people like to remove those, but I insist that they be there because yeah. no war can be a good war. It can be a war in a good cause, as this was. Yeah. But all war is wicked, vicious, and criminal, even if necessary. And that, that's really what I was trying to get at. But what well, criminal in execution, mm -hmm. not necessarily in conception or in resolution, right? No, no, no. Killing people is wrong. Everybody knows that. Yeah, right. But a lot of people who don't think about it very imaginably conceive that uh, somehow it is not wrong if you do it for the right reason. Tuesday at 1 p.m. This is CMU Public Television, a public service of Central Michigan University. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. Well, you can't use hot air. You can't use radiant baseboard. You can't use conventional baseboard. What are you going to do? Give them down coats? How are you going to heat the place? You know, Harold, it's a dirty job, and somebody doesn't have to do it. That's correct. Only supervisor. Well, this must be what we came all the way to see. This is it, uh, Richard. Look at it. it looks like it should be in the laundry. It's so uh, clean and neat and orange even. Funding for this old house is provided by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs. Auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hi, I'm Steve Thomas. Welcome to this old house. Well, you can see that uh, we're gaining on this elevation, just about there. We got a big show for you today, and let's start out by finding Norm. Hi, Norm. Hi, Steve. Boy, it reminds me of the Arctic out there, but it sure is toasty in here. Yeah, you won't need a heavy coat That's in here. That's for sure. I mean, the propane heaters are the only thing we're using right now, and it just shows how tight this is. Unbelievable. Is. You know, there's a tremendous amount of progress in here. Oh, there sure is. The drywallers have finished hanging all the gypsum boards yeah. throughout the building. The tapers have been hard at work taping the joints, filling the screw holes. Lovely. Now job. they're ready to start sanding it, sanding it, and in fact, this afternoon, they're going to start putting paint on. So we are cruising. That's right. Now, what's in the office? Well, in this area, which is our kitchen, We've uh, got the cabinets, they're in the basement. We'll set those first thing next week. Mm -hmm. And once that's set, we know where the edge of the, the countertops are and we can start having Rich Tathui's men lay the heating pipe down. Mm -hmm. Now, designing a heating system for this building was actually not an easy task, as uh, Richard Tathui showed us himself last week. Let's have a look. So, Richard, what sort of things did you have to consider when you design a heating system for this place? Well, Steve, certainly in this great room, I had to consider its, its space. I mean, it's two and a half stories high, mm -hmm. and that poses some interesting problems. Traditional wisdom would have been to wrap all around the perimeter with hot air registers. Yeah. In this case, we would have to put them in the floor because this is all that insulation in the outside wall. So you got these registers in the floor yep. pumping out hot yep. air. What's wrong with that? Well, from a delivery standpoint, it's going to want to work its way right up into the building and then fill that entire upper part of the structure before it's going to force the heated air down right. and by the time I get 68 degrees right here uh, that whole upper space is going to be very warm. Okay. Other people with a have hot air systems I think can often complain about that they hear the blower coming mm -hmm. on. Maybe that's not as comfortable. Okay. If you've got allergies, you know. So hot air is out. What yep. next? Well, we could also wrap all the way around with copper fin baseboards. You know, yeah. uh, traditional American copper yeah, fin baseboards. Yeah, I got that in my house. Yeah. What's wrong with that? It can do a good job 
we do come into a bit of a problem here that we're going to have similar heat delivery where the heated air is going to wash okay. up the wall, get up to the top, and drop. So again, same problem as with hot Similar, air. yes. What next? Well, we could consider this radiant style of baseboard, which uh, goes down here and actually heats down low. You know, it, it comes straight at the pe people in the room. And we are going to consider that up in the bedrooms upstairs. Okay. Why don't we use that here? Well, it didn't really have, as you look around the room, the fireplace and the, and the doors and everything, we didn't have enough available wall space to have enough power to be comfortable here. All right, so just not enough horsepower. Right. Well, you can't use hot air. You can't use radiant baseboard. You can't use conventional baseboard. What are you going to do? Give them down coats? How are you going to heat them? Well, we, we don't need to give them down coats. We're going to actually use this entire floor as a radiator. Yeah. The wick wires have decided to go with tile all through the first floor, which is wonderful. Yeah. For two reasons. Yeah. One is that we can put this tubing underneath of the floor, mm -hmm. clip it in a grid system, and then cover it with concrete. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then two, that concrete then becomes the perfect surface for this beautiful tile that's going to go over it. And mm -hmm. the, the floor will always be about 85 to 80 degrees down low. Mm -hmm. Right here, it's going to be 70 degrees, and it's going to be cooler above, just the inverse of all the other delivery systems. I don't know, Richard. Seems like the inverse of the physics that I learned in I school anyway. I look forward to having you walk around in bare feet around here. Well, you know, the other thing is that you have incredible area here. You're going to have tubes through the great room. Yeah. You're going to have tubes all the way in yeah. here. You know, tubes everywhere, filled with hot water, back in here. How are you going to drive all that? Well, w first we had to consider the, uh, the fuel choice. Yeah. Uh, we don't have natural gas into the structure, so that was up. LP tanks we could put, and it'd be a little, little large, I think, mm -hmm. to power it. Electricity, I don't think, is a real option. Mm -hmm. So we thought about oil. Yeah. Now, I haven't been a great fan of oil fired heat equipment because Oil equipment is very efficient when it's first installed, but uh -huh. because of the burning process of oil, it can get dirty until uh -huh. throughout the year and then until it's cleaned again. Uh -huh. We came across a uh, West German manufacturer who has really licked this problem, it seems. Which How do you do that? He's, he's used stainless steel and cast iron. Uh -huh. Now, the stainless steel inside this boiler gets so hot that it's very similar to a self-cleaning oven. Oh, I get it. So no smoke or carbon or, or uh, soot can build up inside. So it, it stays, burns right it stays off. just as efficient as the day you put it in. Right. Now, recently I had a great opportunity to go see their manufacturing facility. You want to go take a look? Sure. Great. What a great day I picked to fly into West Germany. This is the Hessen region, located in the center of the country, northeast of Frankfurt. It's filled with tiny, picturesque villages, surrounded by small, very well-kept farms. What I was looking for was the Castle Valdeck. That's it over there. Now, I'm expecting to meet Harold Prell, my guide into the high-tech world of German heating boilers. Harold! Harold! Richard, we've been expecting you. Harold, 4,000 miles by plane. 80 kilometers by car. Got to be a thousand steps up here to this castle. And now 15 more down to this dungeon. I got to ask, why are we meeting here? Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Well, Richard, I want to prove a point to you. We've got literally thousands of these old historic buildings around which were retrofitting with state-of-the-art modern hydronic heating systems. That's all wrong, good, Harold, but we don't have a castle. We've got a nice post and beam barn in Concord, Massachusetts. Well, Richard, what we can do in this castle, we can certainly do for you in your old house. As a matter of fact, we have a private estate newly built around the corner. Would you like to take a look at I it? I would love to. That would be great. Come along, please. But not these stairs. Well, Richard, this is the only way out of this dungeon. Well, Harold, this is a very fashionable and new neighborhood, it looks like. Yes, those are all custom-built homes in that area here. Custom sounds expensive. Yes, it probably is, but uh, people tend to spend the money. They live longer in the houses. They keep it within the family. They don't move around that, uh, that often. So unlike the states where we go every five to seven years, you guys yes. just stay? Yes, probably the house is more or less handed to the next generation, and uh, they stay in the house. Yeah. Is this the house you want me to look at? Yes, that's the house we're going to have a close inspection on. Boy, the slate roof is just unbelievable. Yes, is that... that's a typical, typical construction for this area here in that neighborhood. Great. Ah, what do we got here? Looks like a big hunk of concrete. Yes, it is. Uh, you precast concrete up here. I wouldn't want to be the heating engineer who has to figure this one out. 
Yeah, there's certainly quite a bit of heat loss and uh, quite a job to heat the place. How are you going to do it? How well, do it uh, in, the, in the main entrance hall, as you can see, we've got uh, a distribution header already sitting here. So is this all underfloor heating? This is partly on the floor, partly radiator, partly convector heating. So it's a mixed system, basically, mixed to accomplish the heating of the house. So where is the underfloor in this? In this the house? underfloor would be in the main entrance hall. It okay. would go into some of the radiators. It yeah. would also go into bathroom areas where there's a lot of tiles oh, used yeah. and things like that. Get nice to just give heat. complementary heat up there. Now, you've got a sea of glass here. How, how would you do yeah, this Yeah, this one? is quite a surface to heat, quite yeah. a large heat loss. Yeah. And as you can see in the floor on here, we've got underneath that cover, we've got uh, basically convector baseboard sunken in. So we have basically here enough coverage for that okay. cold surface. So hot water, run, hot water runs through a fin down inside this thing. That's correct. And washes the window. And, uh, and the depth basically determines the uprise of the hot air. These are, these are what, plastic? Yeah, PVC uh, uh, windows, uh, sliding doors actually, and Seven. reinforced with galvanized steel. Look at that. Boy. Yeah, even the seals are, it's like a fridge yeah. door. Uh, they seal pretty tight and uh, Something. snugly. Great. What is all this over here? Well, this is uh, what they call a cockleoven, a tile stove actually, made mm -hmm. out of individual tiles. And as you can see, there's a built-in uh, bench area here. Mm -hmm. And um, does this it all is, get warm somehow? It's all, it's all warming up basically by natural convection. The, the warm air basically oh. rises. It takes a while for it, about an hour, hour and a half, to really soak it up. But it then radiates the heat for so hours. Where do you, so where do you turn it on? Where do you get it? Well, on oh. the other side, actually, on this side here, uh, there is the, the fueling end of it. Oh, and I see. It's a fire. In this, in this instance here, they left the door mm -hmm. as a glass room, so you can see the, the fire at the same time. I don't know, Harold. Upstairs, I see radiators. I see underfloor heat. The great windows. That stove. Downstairs, I see a huge radiator. It starts to feel like overkill, doesn't it? Yeah, it seems like a lot, Richard. Uh, however, keep the design conditions in mind in the area. Minus 18, minus 20 Fahrenheit. Two feet snow on the ground in the wintertime. Masonry walls in this construction. Concrete ceiling. And we want to keep the place nice and cozy. Keep the chill out of it, the humidity. So you need the power. That's correct. Let me show you the mechanical okay, room. Great. It's always my favorite room. Oh, look at this, Harold. All the pipe is bent and braised. Look at the no fittings. They don't use fittings? Yes, it's all it's all bent. Look at that. And this is a sort of a header arrangement where all the tubes come down and get brazed right in. That yes. is so different from the way we do it. That's something else. Look at this. This is everything's labeled with these. Yeah, it almost looks like institutional yeah, uh, so labels for the homeowner to identify what is what. That's Every house should have uh, the important valves labeled. Right. What do we got here? Domestic hot water, storage tank, indirectly heated by the boiler. Okay, so it gets the heat from the boiler. What's this thing on the front? What's this box? The box on the front here is a heat pump. A heat pump? So what, where does it get its power from? What's its source? It extracts the heat from the room air and transfers it into the tank to boost the domestic hot water temperature. So there's enough heat in this room to heat up this tank? Correct. There is uh, heat loss from the piping. There is heat loss yeah. from every equipment yeah. in that room, which is, again, reutilized. Here. Does it make sense from a cost standpoint? Uh, yes, it actually does. This uh, heat pump application is subsidized by the government. Oh, great. Well, that's a good partner to have, huh? Yes. Say hot water? It certainly is. Well, this must be what we came all the way to see. This is it, uh, Richard. Look at it. It looks like it should be in the laundry. It's so uh, clean and neat and orange, even. Yeah. Your burner in the front. Yeah. Your control panel on the top, which is a control center that for the whole system. Impressive. And your heating boiler. Great. Can we see it work? Not this one, actually. This one is not quite hooked up. But I'd like to take you over to our training and seminar center, which is close by and also take you over to the, to the factory and uh, build a boiler for you. Terrific. Let's go. Good. Let's go. To get to the training center, we passed through a number of lovely old villages with their half-timbered buildings and those slate roofs. The training center itself was quite an operation, complete with a hotel and even a restaurant. Was wird genommen, was wird gemacht? 
Technicians from all over Germany sign up for seminars and hands-on training here. Wow, Harold, look at this place. You can eat off the floor in here. It's unbelievable. So you've got all this stuff hooked up to uh, flu and to the piping and oil and gas? Even the electrical is hooked up. Wow. So after you put them through training upstairs in the classroom, you can really bring them down here and do hands-on stuff? Yes, that's what this room is for. Fantastic. What are we looking at? The top unit, a uh, heating boiler. The bottom unit, a horizontal domestic hot water storage tank. Okay, so boiler and tank. Okay. This one here is a uh, bottom boiler, top storage tank. Mm -hmm. And this one? Two boilers in one for a larger commercial applications on demand, higher BTUs, the top unit kicks in. Great. And what do you got in mind for us? Well, this one here actually uh, finished. Uh, the unit would look something like this one here oh, with yeah. the enclosure panels on, mm -hmm. the trimmings on, the oil burner is on, and your control package right on top of it. It really looks like fine German engineering. Beautiful. How about hot water? What are we going to do? For hot water, we're going to actually take a loop from the boiler and use this stainless steel storage tank and run the loop through the large stainless steel heat exchanger here and the cutaway model is here to show the students Great. the size of it. Great. Well you promised me I'd see how they were made and you're going to build me a boiler. Can we go? Yes. We'll drive right down to the factory. Great. This is something, this huge plant in this little tiny town. How many people are working here? About 2,300. 2,000. How many in the whole town? About 2,000 live in town. <laughs> You've got the whole town. Yes, almost. So, Harold, this looks like the world's largest room. What's happening in here? This is where all the raw material comes in from the German steel mills. Oh, I see. You buy it in rolls. Yes. Is this uh, regular steel? This is uh, carbon steel. Okay. Looks like it's... Uh... How Wait. many... What's this thing weigh? Something it weighs like about uh, 10 metric tons. 10 metric tons? Yes. How many boilers can we get out of 10 metric tons? Depending on the size, approximately 80 units. Hmm. And then it goes up to this? Yeah, it is put onto the, uh, onto the machine oh, arrangement yeah. here. Yeah. You know, that looks like a it is, news print. Yeah, it's uncoiled from here. Yeah. And pulled through? It goes through the machine. It is stretched here. Okay. What, to straighten it? Yes. And then from here, it is sheared off to its exact length. The machine is operated by a machine operator here, oh, which yeah. supervises okay. the operation and watches the machine. Interesting. Then from here, we'll take the bundle oh, yeah. and uh, deposit over here. Yeah. And from here on, we'll take the material and roll it. So what's happening over here, Harold? This is where the pre-cut steel is being processed. Oh, yeah. It's being picked up by the arm lift it over onto the conveyor belt oh, yeah. and from there iron is put into a mold allowed to cool down and then machine surface you can see very close tolerances on the outside that's a beautiful piece well before i left germany i had a chance to see the foundry where these cast iron rings are made a crane fitted with an electric magnet loads scrap iron and other ingredients into a furnace there, it's all melted down and, when needed, poured into heavy crucibles that swing from an overhead track. These are then pushed along by hand to the casting department. There, sand molds are made with a very expensive and complicated looking machine. To make these molds, a master copy of the ring, machined very precisely out of brass, is used to make an impression in blocks of densely packed sand. These sand molds are then flipped into a, a horizontal position and filled with the molten metal. They then proceed along a moving conveyor belt where the metal cools off just enough to remove the sand casting material. Notice that they're still cherry red. These mechanical arms don't seem to feel the heat as they gently load the hot rings onto overhead conveyors. At numerous other stations all along the way, the rings are carefully ground down and machined to very strict tolerances. If they pass all the quality control tests, the completed rings are ready to be shipped to Wiesman's main plant for assembly. Thank you. 
in this section here, he is assembling the individual rings to a predetermined engineering pattern. He's actually aligning the individual fins with each other. In the oven behind him, we preheat the shells, which we manufactured previously to about 700 Fahrenheit. They enlarge due to the temperature. Why do you want to do that? You want them bigger? We want them larger to accept the cast iron assembly here to heat shrink it in place. I see, so they're going to push that right inside it. Yes. Then we take it from here, allow it to cool down, and go into the next manufacturing. Here, you can see why you can't manufacture uh, one drum alone. You have to have individual rings. In this section here, Richard, we assemble the individual items we oh, manufactured yeah. previously. So, yeah, this is the outer out shell yeah. and the inner shell. With the fins, yeah. Yeah, and we put the rear plate and the front plate on. This is the front plate. Okay. See how that fits? That's nice. And from here, we'll take that assembly and spot weld it over there. Oh, yeah. Just to hold the assembly in place. This station here, Richard, is where all these sub assembled boilers come in. Oh, yeah. We're going on to this conveyor yeah. belt here. Yeah. Still spot welded only. Then from here into the machine, the automatic, well, the welding wire is automatically introduced. Yeah. And we do four welds simultaneously at the same time. What, what an unbelievable machine. This is a completed boiler oh, yeah. now, with yeah. all the welding seams in place, you can see. What a work of art. Look at Even the tappings are on okay. for the water side. Oh, I see. Is this what that machine does? Puts yes, all these this machine basically puts all the welding seams in place. Yes. Let's take a look at that. Let's have a look at it, yeah. But it's all automatic, huh? It's all automated, yes. This is the welding robot. You know, Harold, it's a dirty job and somebody doesn't have to do it. That's correct. Only supervising. Here. This is the final inspection here and the completion of the boiler. Yeah. Got the pressure vessel here completed. Yeah. This is the front end of the boiler. Oh, yeah. And we're completing it with a stainless steel combustion chamber, which is fabricated yeah. in a similar manner as the boiler is. Yeah. So this is the combustion chamber. What's yes. the white in the back? The white is an insulation material for the back end of the combustion chamber. Okay, so that fits in there like that. Yeah. So the burner actually fires right into the refractory and get, must get that stainless steel very, very hot. Yes, about 1,100 Fahrenheit. The flue gases come back, turn 180 degrees, and go all the way back through the heat transfer surfaces. So we pretty much have a boiler here, the front plate and the jacket, and we're ready. That's what about my hot water? We'll go and see that in the next plant. Okay, great. Well, Richard, you asked me earlier about domestic hot water production. This is how we do it. Oh, yeah. This stainless steel tank has no end caps on. This way we have a better view inside. Right. The shell is made exactly the same way as the boilers. You see the welding seam on the bottom yeah. here. The outer shell, as well as the large diameter coil, is fabricated from a high-grade stainless steel. Boy, well, that seems it would last just about indefinitely. Yes, even in aggressive water situations. Now, Harold, what kind of boiler temperature, water temperature, do you need to run through this piping from the boiler? We can run as low as 150 Fahrenheit and produce 140 Fahrenheit of domestic hot water inside due to the extensive size and characteristic of that coil. Boy, that's terrific transfer. You know, this looks fairly intricate to make and to bend. Is it tough? It is actually simple if you have the right machine to do it. Can we take a look at it? Yes, certainly we can. Great. So, Richard, this is the way we make the, the coil for that domestic hot water storage mm -hmm. tank. The pipe comes straight out from our own pipe mill, it's welded in here, yeah. and then we drive it into this mechanism here. It is crimped in place to hold it firmly, and we're using for this coil approximately 50 feet of straight pipe length. Look at that. You can see the coil start here. Yeah. Boy, it must take a lot of... Uh, sort of force to get that to bend. Yes, you have to have a lot of uh, pressure on the drive in order to force it through. It's an inch and a quarter diameter coil. 
for you, right? It does make this machine does make it look easy. Yes. What's he doing here, Harold? Over here, we're crimping him off to the side to make the water connections to one side of the tank. So you're making the final bend to make them both line up? Yes. Great. At this station over here, we're immersing the finished coil into the water bath, fill it with air pressure in order to see if we have any leaks. This is what we do as final quality control. Well, I'm glad to see that, Harold. Look at the size of this place. You can actually fit your own train inside your warehouse? Yes, you can. Unbelievable. Tell me about how we're going to get our order. Well, you place the order, we'll put it into the storage for a while, pull the orders, then computerized forklift takes it out, loads it onto the train, it goes to the nearest port, and is shipped overseas. Well, Harold, I can't tell you how impressed I am with not only the manufacturing process, but all the innovation that went into this product. I can't wait for the first cold day when we fire up this boiler in Concord, Massachusetts. Thanks for a great tour and for having us over here. Thank you very much. I'm glad you could make it, Richard. Great. Let's get a cup of coffee. Well, that was a great job, Richard. I can hardly wait for you to crank up that heat. Well, next time, we'll take a look at our kitchen cabinet. And our staircase, which has been made in Wisconsin, will arrive here by truck. Until then, I'm Steve Thomas for This Old House. Funding for this old house is provided by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents. For family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. This Old House, written by Bob Vila with Jane Davison, is a comprehensive guide for homeowners who want practical advice on how to understand, plan, and manage a home rehabilitation project using both professional help and their own time and effort. To order your copy of the softcover edition, call 1-800-441-3000. 1995 plus shipping and handling. Credit cards accepted. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. There's something about a well-designed stair. It's just some particular combination of rise and run that just makes you feel uh, elegant, like Scarlett O'Hara. Now, we have some special considerations over on this elevation. Yes. Uh, how'd that work out? Well, over here, we had this knee brace that we had to design in. I mean, these things are 12 feet high. How are you going to ship all these massive pieces of beautiful oak to Boston? Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents. For family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Hi, I'm Steve Thomas. Welcome to this old house. Well, today we celebrate the arrival of our beautiful oaken staircase, 
which was made for us in Nina, Wisconsin. But before I take you inside to show it to you, let me first take you to frozen Lake Winnebago, one of Wisconsin's picturesque lakes, where I did some of the most exciting and some of the coldest sailing I've ever done. Watch. Okay, here we go. Uh, that was quite a ride there, Don. How yeah. fast were we going? Oh, we were doing about 65, Steve, coming around the point there. Yeah? About how thick was the ice? We got about three inches of ice today. Yeah? Well, gee, you sure <laughs> ruined me for high-speed windsurfing. You know, I could do this all day, but uh, we've got some work to do. Uh, we're supposed to go over to your workshop and see our stairs. They're well, I think still in should, process, huh? I think we should stay out here all afternoon. <laughs> Well, they get it out of me. Seriously, how far is the workshop from here? We got about 10 minutes away. Well, I'll help you pull the sail down. Okay, Steve. Well, I've sailed on a lot of boats, Don, but that ice boat really took the cake. You warmed up yet, Steve? Yeah, what are you going to show me first? Well, before I show you the, this old house stairway, I thought I'd like to show you some of our uh, spiral stairways that we also build here. This happens to be one of our Bay Hill spirals which is going to be shipped over to uh, Hilton Head Island next week. Well, this looks like it could have come right off a ship. Everything is beautifully put together. And, you know, it looks like these treads are slipped down over a solid trunk, almost like a mass of oak. How does it go together? Well, uh, Jim and uh, Kevin are putting one together right over here, Steve. We start out with a column uh, base block. That's this. That's the bottom part. Mm -hmm. And we thread on a column spacer, a tread, a column spacer, and just keep going like that. I see. So it goes together like a necklace. Huh? That's right. The yeah. tread has a dado machined into it, and the column spacer has a shoulder machined onto this it. This is sort of put together like a barrel. Like a barrel, like, like barrel stays. staves almost. Now, does this pipe stay with the stairway? That, that comes with the stairway. And after the all the treads and column spacers are put on, you put a... Uh, landing tread on top and it's bolted and put into compression mm -hmm. and uh, Jim is going to start fanning these treads out and lining the treads up with just a very simple lineup block that we make for these stairways and that's simple and elegant now what about a rail well we're going to put a rail into a stairway right behind you and this stairway you just happens to be going in your neck of the woods and I believe it's going to Hartford Connecticut Yankee country. That's right. And what are all these? Well, these are the rail jigs that we put on the stairway. We put a piece of plastic on the stairway first, mm -hmm. clamp these rail jigs on, and then the, we're going to put a laminated uh, handrail glued up uh, in these uh, rail jigs. So you'll use the stair itself as the jig for the, that's uh, right. for the railing. That's right, Steve. Great. Now, that's quite a bend you're putting in this uh, wood. I'd expect you to use a steam box. No, we don't use any steam boxes here, Steve. We use thin layers of oak with a special glue. Uh, Kevin and Jim are going to clamp this up in the jig here, and we'll leave this clamped up overnight. And when we take the clamps off, it'll hold its, uh, its, its shape very mm -hmm. well. Now, can... the, the, the thin strips are so you can take this real tight radius. That's though. right. I can show you a stairway over here that uh, is ready to uh, take the clamps off. Sure. Here's a stairway that's going over to Pennsylvania, Steve. We glued this rail up yesterday. Pick it up and see how it holds its shape. Well, look at that. That spring is just ironed in there like a permanent on a woman's hair. That's right, Steve. And with all these laminations, this is going to be a real strong rail. Yes, yeah, so and next we'll sand the top and the bottom off. We've got a stairway right over here that I can show you that. Okay. This rail has been sanded from the top and the bottom. We'll ease these corners now a mm -hmm. little bit. Well, you know, I'm really impressed by the consistency of all these parts, and the machining is absolutely gorgeous. How do you do that? 
Well, let's take a walk over to building number one, and I can show you those operations. Okay. Too. This is what we're trying to make here, spiral tread, Steve. These are the finished products, huh? That's right. We've got to put a profile on the edge. We've got to drill the hole for the steel column. And we've got to dado a hole here for the uh, column spacers and drill the holes for the balusters. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you do that? Well, first of all, we edge glue and laminate a blank up. These happen to be oak. It's a two-inch thick blank, which Maybe. has been band-sawed to the approximate shape of the tread. I see. Then what happens to it? Well, we take one of these we, over on the computer-controlled router here. Oh, I see. You just This is a blank that's been laid out on the table here, all ready to go. That's right. This blank will be machined for the, the top of the blank, and this will be machined for the bottom. Oh, I see. And uh, you say router, but this looks like three routers, and they're immense. Well, there are three heads on this on this router. We have a profile for the edge here. Yeah. We have a straight bit for the holes for the... Uh, column spacer in the steel column and a drill bit for the uh, uh, baluster hole. Now you say computer controlled. Where's the computer? Well, let's just take a walk back here, Steve. This is the control panel here, and all the information for this uh, to shape this tread is, mm -hmm. is on this tape here. Mm -hmm. The information is entered into the computer through this tape reader. And then it member, remembers what it has to do. That's right. Great. Can we see it work? You sure can. That is really beautiful. That makes short work of it, huh? Yeah, it's short work and it's very accurate, Steve. What are you going to show me next? Well, let's go over to our circular department. You've seen the spiral, so let's go over there. Okay. You know, Don, it's nice and dry and toasty in here. You'd never know it was ice boating weather outside. No, you wouldn't. And, and dry during the winter is a serious problem for us in here. Why is that? Well, if you get, we don't have the moisture in the air, our wood will start drying out and cracking. So how do you control it? Well, we control that with your humidity control system up there. Those two heads, they're spaced uh, along the whole length of the building. Yeah. And when they're operating, when it calls for moisture, you'll see a real serious uh, stream of fog coming out. Spray of water to, That's to right. humidify. So what's going on in here? Well, this is our circular setup area. This is a beautiful stair. Where's this one headed? Well, this stairway is going to Memphis, Tennessee. This is a rather wide stairway. Can I sure, try it off? Go ahead, Steve. You know, it's, there's something about a well-designed stair. It's just some particular combination of rise and run that just makes you feel uh, elegant, like Scarlett O'Hara. That's right. That's <laughs> right. This stairway features a wrought iron balustrade with a, with a wood handrail cap on it. Great. What's next? Now, this one, Steve, is going to Rochester, New York. This stairway features a mahogany tread. The first four treads are bowed, if you notice the yeah, uh, bowing on the that. front of the tread and riser. You've got a mahogany handrail. We make all these parts right here. And this is what Heidi's been is doing. She's carving these joints out. Heidi's uh -huh. been with us over 11 years. Hi, Heidi. Hi. Well, this is really lovely work. This, this beautiful handrail, the mahogany, really looks yeah. nice. Now, what's next? This stairway over here is going to New York City. This is a little bit different. It's an elliptical stairway. And the uh, walls in this home are all, the curved walls are all up and plastered. Uh -huh. So we had to send one of our men 
to the job site to make full-size uh, templates. Boy, no room for error there's there. There's no room for error on this stairway here. Now this one looks like it's all packed up, and this stairway here is, uh, is getting ready to be shipped. Where's this one going? Uh, this is going to, uh, I think, Nashville, Tennessee, if I'm not mistaken. Uh huh. You know, the thing that impresses me is that you're shipping these things all over the country to homes that are thousands of miles away. How do you know that they're going to fit in these buildings? Well, it takes a lot of communication, Steve, and good plans. And why don't we go up to Drafty and I can show you a little bit about that. Okay. Well, Don, how did you get started in this business? Well, Steve, about 25 years ago, my partner John Dame and I, we started the business in a small garage in Nina. Oh, yeah? That's right. This isn't a garage. No, not anymore. How many people work for you now? We've got about 75 people employed here now. Yeah. I notice you've got a son in the business, too. Yes, I have a son and a daughter, and my partner John Beam has two sons in the business. That's great. It's a real family concern. Yes, it is. How many staircases do you make a year? We build over 1,000 a year now. Wow. So where are we going? Well, this is our drafting department. Steve? Hi, Bill. Hi, Dan. Now, how'd you get started with our staircase? Well, this was the first drawing we received from the architect. This is what uh, our architectural firm sent you. That's correct. Now, can you build a staircase from this drawing? No, we're not going to build off of this drawing. The first thing we're going to do is make a drawing of our interpretation of this drawing, mm -hmm. which this, here's a copy of that. And in turn, we send this off to the architect for his approval. Mm -hmm. We received back a copy that was approved, but with changes. I see. And here's a uh, change right here, provide a stair curb at laminated intersection. Mm -hmm. Now, is this then ready to be to go down into no. production? No. The next thing we do is we'd make what we call a cleaned up set of drawings. And we've incorporated that change in this drawing right here. Mm -hmm. Now, do you take this down to the shop floor, then, and start building the staircase? Well, we can, but in this case, with, on this stairway here, we're going to program our uh, computer-controlled router to make some of these parts for us. Well, how do you do that? We're going to make this part right in here. Let's walk over here by the CAD drafting system. So Bill, programming that router starts with the CAD. That's right. I see. Bill, would you blow this area up for me right here? Well, now, Don, that looks like our drawing there. That's, that's the drawing right, right there okay. in, the, uh, in the memory of the computer. And that's that section of our stair. That's correct. Now, Bill, would you give me a full scale of this area here? OK, Bill, would you give me a hard copy of this now? What we're doing here, Steve, is we're talking to the, the plotter over here, mm -hmm. and that's going to make the drawing for us. How accurate is that plotter? This is within one ten thousandth of an inch. One accuracy. ten thousandth. That's huh? correct. Steve, we're going to take this full-scale drawing that we had done in the drafting department mm -hmm. into the digitizing department. Hi, Tom. Hello. Hi, Tom. Now, I still don't understand this digitizing. Well, this is a special uh, grid, electronic grid board. Or it's sort of like an electronic piece of graphing tape. That's correct. And Tom is going to measure electronically these points on this drawing, the length of the lines, mm -hmm. the radiuses. Now, what's that device he's using? Tom? Well, that's a little electronic keyboard that has a magnifying glass and a crosshair is on. I see. So that communicates with the board itself. That's and correct. It translates all these coordinates. And that's, that's right. And this information is going into the computer over mm -hmm. here, which we'll uh, punch out a uh, tape with. Oh, I see. And this tape will uh, communicate with a computer-controlled router then. I see. Well, now, Don, you've taken me ice boating, you've shown me computers and punch tape routers and all kinds of stuff, but I still haven't seen our stairs. Oh, we've got them. Where are they? Let's go see them. Out this door. Steve, I know I've been keeping you in suspense, but here are the stairways. Boy, this is lovely. This is the landing that sticks out into the great room with this wonderful curve here. Solid red oak, is it, Don? That's right. And these are the stairs that lead up.
first to the landing. And I love how this projects out into the great room. And it's almost like the fan tail of a yacht. And it then is, they continue on up to the uh, master bedroom. Well, you guys really do nice work. Thanks, Steve. And then there'll be another landing here. And I see this unit stacks up on top of this one. That's right, Steve. This goes up to the third floor then. But I hope when I come out, I can have a first floor bedroom. It can be arranged. Okay. We've got a nice library for you to stay in. This stairway was built basically the same way, but we have an open riser concept with two inch thick treads and in the three inch beams and a two inch thick landing platform here. Boy, this landing is really something, you know. It's all lam laminated up out of solid oak. It's all color matched and it's wonderful. You know, I love the open risers because that'll give you a, a nice view up through that great space. Yes, it will. Preserve that sense of openness. And the massiveness of the material, the two inch here and the three inch here, sort of resonates with those massive uh, pine and dug fir beams too. It's really wonderful, very massive look to it. It'll really, I think, go very well. And this curve here really impresses me, this beautiful curving sweep here. How did you do that, Don? Well, we had to build a full scale jig for that a piece. Oh, I see. This is just like those handrails you were That's showing right. me the other day. Yes, uh, Rick is uh, laminating up the uh, baseboard for that unit right, right. now. Right. Now, these stairs are massive. And uh, Federal Express isn't going to take it when you try no. to send it through them. <laughs> the U.S. mail is not going to touch it. I mean, these things are 12 feet high. How are you going to ship all these massive pieces of beautiful oak to Boston. Well, we can break these down into about uh, six pieces, and we have some dedicated workers. And oh, yeah? Little trailers and little trucks that we're going to put them on. You want to see that? Let's I'd love to. Take a look. Sure. Well, Steve, here's a load of stairways that's going to be heading to Florida this weekend. Well, they're just stacked up on these little trailers here. I would have expected a big semi or something. Well, when we first started the business, we tried delivering these stairways with uh, in a semi, oh, yeah. but we couldn't back up right to the job well, site. sure, that makes sense. So we developed these uh, trucks and trailers, and uh, it's a very efficient method of backing right up to the house. Right. Uh, a lot of people think these are rocking horses when they, <laughs> yeah. when they drive by. Steve, I'd like to have you meet my uh, daughter, Sharon, who's in charge of uh, production here. Hi, Sharon. And my partner, son, John Jr., who is uh, Hi, Steve. the uh, national sales manager. Hi, John. Nice to meet you. Well, you're inheriting a proud tradition, because you really do lovely work here, but Actually, it's kind of a problem for me because now I have to go back and tell Tom Silver that he can't build our stair. Well, we understand that you have great craftsmanship back there, but go back and assure Tommy of this. We're building him a wonderful stairway under control conditions with great craftsmen, and we're delivering it to the job site, and uh, we're handling all of that, freeing yeah. him up to be able to trim out the rest of the house with his people. We've got 250 hours into that stair. Boy, yeah. Well, what about cost, John? Well, the cost of our staircase may be a little bit more going in, but we guarantee the cost. Mm -hmm. We guarantee the quality. We guarantee that it's going to work. Oftentimes, a stick-built staircase, uh, the price of the stairway is given, but the costs go up after the mm -hmm. job is done, and sometimes the quality isn't commensurate with the yeah. price. Yeah, well, that's a good point, too. Well, thanks for the tour. Thank you. I, I, I love the work you do here. And you know, I've got an hour before that plane, so... Let's go ice boating. Let's Steve. do it. Nice to meet you. Bye. 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 Hey, you guys. Hi, Norm. Hi, hey, Steve. Wow. So what do you think of our stairway? I'll tell you, the woodworking is beautiful and the finish is perfect. Yeah. Last time I saw this, it was, a, it was standing on the factory floor in Wisconsin. It looks gorgeous here. It sure does. So what do you think of the whole concept of a factory built stair? I don't know. It's a, it's a little disturbing. You know, when I hired carpenters, the ability to build a stair is always the sign of a good yeah. carpenter. And it's sort of the ultimate merit badge that right. you want to get. Right. And to see it built in a factory, well, I guess when I see computer-operated routers in a controlled environment in a place that's meant to build stairs, I can't argue very much. Yeah. Well, I guess the name of the game in carpentry now is production. And it, and it really does free you up to get on with the job and let you nail down the cost absolutely. That's right. With a set up like this, you can get a fixed number on your stair and you know you're going to stay on your schedule. Well, how's it going in? It's going together pretty well. You know, it's a very complicated stair, so you have to save some of the work until after it arrives, like the field cuts that yeah. Tommy's making up there. Yeah. So, Tommy, what do you think of our factory-built stair? Oh, I think they're great. Yeah? Of course, I'm a little upset we didn't get the chance to do it, but then again, we wouldn't have donated it. <laughs> <laughs> so what's that mortise for? 
Well, this is going to be the side of the stair. We're going to let the stair into here, and it's going to run up to that beam up there, yeah, yeah. and then it's going to run like, once again up to the third level. Right. Now, those are open risers on those flights. Yeah, on these two flights, they're open. I think yeah. it's going to be good because it'll let the light in through the house. Yeah, I this agree. Yeah. Boy, this is a heck of a stick here. This will make a nice mast. Where do we get this? Yeah, well, Ted brought this down to a buddy of mine down in Winchington, and he spun it away on his lathe. No kidding. A sing in a single piece? No, it's two pieces. He joined it. Jeez, that's yeah. gorgeous. Well, I'll let you get on with it, Tom. Okay, Steve. So, Norm, what's happening over here? Well, you know, when we started thinking about the design of the stair, we had a couple options. One was to leave it open all the way down into the basement. Yeah. But that would have meant another finished stair all right. the way down, and that was going to be expensive and time consuming. Plus, you'd have like a canyon yawning in this area. That's here, right. Too. And the other option was to close it in, which is what we're going to do. This mm -hmm. will have a partition down here and across here with a door, which leads mm -hmm. to the basement. That's why we had to have these treads closed. Yeah. Well, that makes sense, and that'll finish it off really nicely. Right. Well, how's the rocking and the painting going? Well, the rock is done, and most of the taping and mudding is finished except for a little touch-up. The painters have done all the high painting, and we're at the point now where the homeowners themselves can roll the lower area. Boy, it looks good. Yeah, it does. Now, I was outside, and I noticed that uh, we haven't made any progress on our chimney, but it's been below freezing for two weeks. That's right. It's kind of hard to do masonry when uh, the water freezes all the time. But the inside is finished. The firebox has mm -hmm. been completed. The granite cantilevered uh, hearth here yeah. is done. So it's moving along. So what's next? Well, later next week, we'll be able to start putting some of the trim around the windows and mm -hmm. doors. But I'm a little bit concerned because the day after tomorrow, this whole first floor has to be completely cleaned out, swept, broom clean, so that the plumbers can come in and lay down this grid here, this mesh. They'll staple it down, and then they'll attach all this piping so that we can pour the lightweight concrete for the floor. So Tom is going to have to move it forward on a stair. Well, Tom's doing quite well. Well, I see some cabinets going into the kitchen. Let's go check that out. Okay. Hey, Glenn. How's it going? Oh, it's going just great, Steve. I wish all our kitchens were this easy. <laughs> Norm, I'd like you to meet Glenn Berger. Hi, Norm. Hi, Glenn designed the whole kitchen, and now he's installing it. Show us where you got started. Well, the first thing you want to do is determine your counter height off the floor. And in this case, 37 and a half inches coordinates with the windowsill height. 37 and a half is where the wick wires wanted it, right? That, yes, that's right. Okay, what's next? Well, uh, we find the high spot in the floor, which is over here, mm -hmm. and draw a level line all the way around, uh, and we line up our cabinets with okay. that. How far out were we? About three-eighths of an inch, well within uh, good tolerance. Okay, so now you've got your lines. That gives you a place to lay out your cabinets. What's next? Well, we... Uh, this job required uh, some platforms to be made. We have a two-inch floor with concrete and tile and a little bit more space for the additional height mm -hmm. for the counter. So we have uh, these platforms and the cabinets oh, are placed see. on them. I see. So that gets your cabinets up to the proper height. That's right. Now, what, after you got that, then what do you do? Well, we have this post, which is a given. We designed our cabinets to start from there and work back to the corner. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, started there. So that's another fixed point that you have to lay out from there. That's yeah. right. Now this is kind of an unusual cabinet. Normally this would be two cabinets. This is one cabinet almost six feet long. Yes. This uh, manufacturer gives this option of uh, ganging the cabinets together. Uh, you eliminate some of the seams between them and it's easier to install larger units. Great. Looks good. Now we have some special considerations over on this elevation. Yeah. Uh, how'd that work out? Well over here we had this knee brace that we had to design in and we came up with the idea of coming parallel with it with the top edges of the doors. Now what's this thing here? Uh, this is the pull-out pantry. It doesn't have its pull on it yet. Mm -hmm. But you would use this for storage for canned goods and breads and groceries and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Pretty good hardware. How much weight will that hold? Uh, about 250 pounds. More than enough. You want to take a ride in there? Uh, test it out, right? <laughs> now what's, what about this up here, Glass? Uh, this is a uh, just a decorative panel. Matches the door design. Follows the brace. Uh -huh. Doesn't open. And this is our cutout for our oven? Yes, that's for the oven, and this is for uh, uh, the warming oven. Now, I notice that there's a lot of space back here. Um, in fact, there's about six or eight inches. Is that to give the refrigerator a little more ventilation? Well, actually, the cabinetry is 24 inches deep. That's a standard. And refrigerators can be 28 or even 30 inches mm -hmm. deep from the wall. So we've asked our contractor to build that wall back a little further so that we could have the refrigerator and the cabinetry all line up. So right? that'll give that a nice slick look on that elevation. Yes, it will. What's happening over here? 
Well, over here we had a little puzzle with this beam, and so we solved it by making a tray cabinet that was a little shallower. Mm -hmm. And this aperture here is for a uh, cooktop? Yes, that's for the cooktop and uh, a hood above. Great. And then moving over here, we've got what in here? Well, this is a, a four-drawer base unit. We take the drawers out to make the installation easier. Okay. And this is for the sink? Uh, yeah, this space here is for the dishwasher. Right. This is for the sink. The sink will move over after we cut in a hole for some plumbing. Great. Looks good. Well, I really uh, I look forward to uh, seeing the whole thing done. You guys are doing a great job. Norm, I think we ought to go check out Tommy and see how he's doing. Okay. Thank you. Well, Norm, it won't be long until we can throw this ladder away. Well, that's good. Boy, Tom, you and your brothers do nice work. Oh, thanks, Steve. The guys in Wisconsin at the stairway did a nice job, too. You're, you're a man to admit it. What do you have for us next time, Norm? Well, as I said, we've got to get that piping laid down so we can pour the lightweight concrete. And now, don't you owe us a visit to a plastic house? That's right. You can throw away your carpenter's apron and pick up your glue pot because it looks like the future of housing is in plastic. No wood. No wood. Hated to be the one to break it to you. Okay. Till it, I'm Steve Thomas. And I'm Norm Abram. For this old house. The ice ages that come and go not only change the world climate, they've also carved many of the surface features of our planet. How did the last ice age happen? Could it happen again? Tens of millions of years ago, the Sahara Desert was a lush green land full of life. How are polar glaciers linked to the burning sands of the Sahara Desert? Scientists believe that we are in a unique period in the evolution of our world's climate. Is this global warming a natural cycle, or is it the result of human activity? Join us in a search for ice that flows and ancient riverbeds buried beneath the sands. Riddles of sand and ice, next time on The Miracle Planet. See you at Monday evening at 8 o'clock. This is the CMU Public Television Network. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. The burner is connected. Yeah. All this is brought together. All the piping is into the manifold. Everything is ready to go. So let's do it. One thing. Well, I know what I'd do in a situation like that, but I'm kind of curious to see what the master would do. Steve, this is really exciting. This is alchemy right here. <laughs> this one's trash to me. Yeah, well, to you it does, but this is my chance to turn lead into gold. Oh, uh, yeah? Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Hi, I'm Steve Thomas. Welcome to this old house. Well, it's cold, there's snow on the ground, and the winter's been a chilly one, but our job is moving forward. We're even putting in a driveway. Hey, Steve, Hi, you crazy? Yeah. I mean, it's almost January, and you're putting down a driveway. I thought that uh, the asphalt plants closed after Thanksgiving. <clears throat> the asphalt plants are closed, but this is a whole new process. Let me take you over and introduce you to John Glenn, who's the brains behind the operation. Steve, how's hey, it John? doing? Meet Norm, Norm Major. how are you? Hey, how's it going? Good. Nice and cool out here today. So, fill Norm in on this stuff. Yeah, what was the... Uh, Prep. What kind of prep did you have to do to start? Well, the this first thing, uh, Norm, we had to get in here and get the topsoil off and uh, get down to a solid base. And fortunately, there's great gravel and sand underneath here. And then we brought in the big power roller and we uh, compacted it thoroughly. And then today we brought in from our plant in Charlton uh, the pavement and put down about an eight-inch layer, as okay. you can see. And the roller just finished compacting it. And now we're getting uh, ready to put a chip seal down. What's this stuff? Well, what we do uh, for purposes of aesthetics, instead of just a black paving, yeah. there are options. And this is a natural uh, piece stone that we could apply and, and uh, just seal it right What's in with a roller. And this is a quarry stone. 
a different color and for uh, different preferences. People may rather have this. Tom Worth thought that this would be more in keeping with the uh, natural uh, terrain certainly, here, so we're using this. Certainly much more attractive than just the regular black top driveway. Well, wait till you see when this gets spread out now and rolled in, it's really going to look nice. Okay, so they're going to do that now. Yeah, we're in the process of getting that down right now. Let's watch. So, John, they're just taking a shovel and trying to spread it out evenly, just a thin layer. Right. To cover the uh, base. In a small area like this, we do it by hand. In a bigger area, we do it with a machine. But they'll cast out enough just to cover the surface, and we'll roll it right in. Well, I understand how this works, but what I'm curious about is, what is this base? Well, that's the beauty of this, Norm. Imagine earth that's soaked with oil from leaking tanks. And imagine old asphalt shingles that nobody wants. And then imagine tons and tons of old building rubble, cement, bricks, stuff like that. I get that, but that's all junk. That's what this is. Not long ago, we took a ride out to John Flant, and he showed us the whole operation. Let's watch. Well, this looks like a yellow brick road, John, and uh, I guess you're going to lead us down here. Right? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah, no, it does look like that. I, I like this material here. This is a real nice uh, surface here. It is. It's very uh, aesthetically pleasing. It's a natural stone uh, uh, that we put on top of our uh, paving. Here is a quarry stone. Oh, this is also very nice. That gives you an option of a lighter color or a, uh, uh, a granite-type uh, chip seal. Now, this is over some kind of a hard material. What's that? Right. That's the uh, base paving, a recycled uh, asphalt. A recycled this is actually asphalt, the cake. Huh? If that's the frosting, then oh, this yeah? would be the cake. So what's in this stuff? In here, you'll find recycled concrete chunks, uh, chunks of asphalt from uh, torn up roads. I see a little bit of, I don't know what this is, concrete right. or something. But right. look, here's a brick. Some brick, right. And here's uh, some mica from something. Who and knows? the finest stuff would even be uh, oily soil that we incorporate in the manufacture of the mix. And that would come from uh, removal of underground uh, oil tanks no where kidding. the soil was... Uh, no mixed with oil. Now, what else do you have in here? Oh, we also have other interesting ingredients. For example, uh, ground up roof shingles. Roof shingles. Roof eh? shingles. I gotta see that. Well, let's go. Okay. Well, you really do more than just provide paving materials. You are kind of a waste manager. Yes, Steve. That's a good way to put it. As a matter of fact, here's a pile of shingles here that come from a manufacturer who would ordinarily have to. Uh, dispose of these at considerable cost. Now, for example, these come in here on a daily basis, about 40 ton a day. Yeah. Now, usually, they would take them to a landfill at considerable expense. And you we're take them for nothing? No, we're actually taking them uh, off of his hands for yeah. a fraction of what it would cost him to landfill them, and we can utilize them in our process as a raw material. So there uh, is where the recycling comes in. I see. Let me show so, you a man uh, piece of equipment here that helps us to incorporate this into our uh, product. This, this is, is an evil looking machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you said, like a James Bond uh, piece of equipment. But these whales reduce it in size so that it's uh, able to be incorporated into our yeah. mix. Let me take you over here, show you what this machine reduces it to. This is a pile, huh? Now what? This is that stuff all ground up? Yeah. Here. Here we have the uh, very same shingles, which have been reduced in size. They're of a high quality uh, asphalt to start with and uh, impregnated with all the granules that the roof shingles ordinarily have. And now we've been able to put it into a size that can be readily mixed right in with the asphalt paving that we make. What else do you put in it? Well, let me take you over and show you. Okay. Steve. This is really exciting. This is alchemy right here. Looks <laughs> like trash to me. Yeah, well, to you it does, but this is my chance to turn lead into gold. Oh, yeah? Here you see brick and other rubble, concrete that we run through our process, crush and screen. Let me show you how that's done. This I got to see. The broken bits of concrete and brick and other building debris are dumped into this machine, a very noisy crusher. On the back end of the crusher, the pulverized pieces are separated according to size. 
They'll go into the paving mix later. Now you've seen the larger crushed aggregate. And in order to make a quality asphalt paving, you need some finer particle size. That's this stuff here? Yeah, ordinarily you'd use sand. And in this case, this didn't come off some beach. This finer stuff is from probably some filling station where we had a leaky underground tank and the soil was contaminated. So and again, you're taking material that would be difficult to get rid of anywhere else. It would fill up a landfill and you're recycling it for Absolutely. a good purpose. That's what it's all about. What's next? Let's head over to the layer cake, show you how it's all blended together. Here we are to our wonderful cake mix. Oh, this looks delicious. All those fabulous ingredients you saw us uh, going through the ground up shingles, I the ground up concrete and asphalt, the uh, incorporation of the oily soil, all dry mix right here, ready for the loader to come in and take. He comes in, scoops up a bucket full, brings it across here, loads it into the hopper. From the hopper, it goes up the conveyor belt. Here we have the aggregate coming up the conveyor belt, dropping into the mixing chamber. At the very same time, we have the liquefied asphalt emulsion being pumped over into the same chamber, blending it all together, and dropping out as a finished product. So that's it, huh? Now I see some steam coming off that. Uh, is that the heat that you put in to deliver to the job and roll out hot? Well, actually, that's the beauty of this whole process. It's a cold emulsified asphalt product. There's no heat involved here at all, and it has a considerable shelf life. You can store it for up to six months, take it out with a loader, put it down through a paver, roll it, and you've got your asphalt paving. Great process, John. Thanks for showing it to us, and you're doing a great job cleaning up the environment, too. My pleasure. Boy, John, it looks terrific. Doesn't it? Really does. I think you made a believer out of Norm. Oh, I hope so. Well, look, I want to thank you for everything that you've done for us here and everything that you're doing for the environment, too. My pleasure, Steve. Meanwhile, we got a big tile job going on inside. Let's catch up on that. So I aim it to the corner. Yep. Drop it right down. Huh? Drop it right in. And then check my lines. Just check your joint there and beautiful. Okay. Now, how do I know it's seated? Because when you push on it, you can feel it's not teetering. It's in there. It's snug. Good, that's it, huh? Yep. Well, I've been getting a lesson in laying tile from Joe Ferrani and his brothers. Here you go. Where does this tile come from, Joe? It comes from Mexico, Steve. Yeah. It's a terracotta. It has a, uh, an epoxy sealer on it. And this isn't a, a, yeah, this isn't a glaze. Yeah. It's a sealer. Why well, seal it? it? For maintenance purposes. So if you drop food or something on it, it doesn't right. stain? Right. Very easy to... Uh, maintain. It's very porous. Uh -huh. It would be very difficult for us to work with. If it with, wasn't sealed. Right. It's, it takes water too quick. So your grout would just the dry grout, out incredibly any, fast. You know, right. Good. Now, how do you get started laying a floor like this? We uh, take our measurements. Measure the building. We measure, take a layout, and then after we've uh, determined what will be done, uh -huh. we set our strings. There's a north to south string right That's here. This one right here, and then You've got another one going east to west here. Right. Now, after these strings are set, we uh, take our thin set, and that's this right here. Well, you start by laying your first tiles at the intersection of those Right. Two we start in that intersection, and then we work to the walls. Uh -huh. Oh, I get it. So the whole idea is to have even cuts all the way around. Now, if you start over at the door, for instance, and work your way to this beautiful curving staircase here, you might end up with these ugly little skinny bits of tile. That's right. That's right. Now, what do you set it in? We set it in thin set. And that's this right here. Yeah. Okay. Can you mix this with water? Thin set mortar. It can be mixed with water. We're not using uh, water because the tile is so porous. Yeah. So what do you use? We use this uh, acrylic latex so additive. We call it milk. So it's mother's milk to mason's, huh? Yeah, that's right. So you get it all mixed up, and then it looks like this stuff here. Yep. It's all mixed up to a consistency where it can be uh, notched. I see. This is real rich. That's right. Well, show, me, show, show me how you work this into the floor. Sure. Let me take some out. Now, you're using a pretty aggressive 
trowel there, Joe. Yep. This is a three-quarter inch notch trowel. Now, why such a heavy notch? This notch is, well, it's a very thick piece of tile. Yeah. And oh, I has... see. That's the saying, the thicker the tile, the, the bigger the notch? Exactly. And more importantly, in this situation, you can see it in this one. This tile isn't flat. Yeah. Let me show you. Oh. Both. See how it, now, with that heavy notch, I see. it'll compensate. But where this one is a little bit more than usual, we'll just back butter back this. Butter like right. Fill that small void. And then you just lay it just like you showed me to lay the other one, huh? That's right. And you just set it in. See, and you can, without pushing down too, too yeah. hard, you can feel that it's seated. And it's nice and snug. Yeah. And that's it. Great. Well, give me a lesson in troweling. Sure. Okay. Well, just so work, work some out of that pail. Yeah. That's it. About like that? Yeah. And now, I go smooth side first? Put the smooth side first. Trowel it right into the concrete floor. Now, I noticed you guys make the scraping noise. Right. Whenever. Is, that a, is there a reason for that? Yep. Ra just raise your angle a little bit. Yeah. Like that? Yeah. A little higher. Okay. See? Okay. That's it. There you go. Now, how do I get the notch? Okay, now you just take some more out of the pail. Here, let me give you a hand here. Okay. On the notch side like that? Right. Just do it just the way I showed you. All right. We'll do fine. Same angle? Same angle. See, now you have those notches standing up in the thin set. Reach over here. This one's reasonably flat. And same program here, huh? That's right. Just set that right in there. Aim. Drop, drop it right in. Wiggle. That's it. Hey, you're getting a real good touch there. Good. Hey. That's it. How's that? Beautiful. You're learning fast, Steve. Now here, Joe, we've come to one of our beautiful timber frame posts. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Mark it and cut it? Yep. Take this pencil. Yep. You just set it in there? Just set it. Pull it away from there, give yourself a grout joint. How's that? That looks good. Now, do you want to mark it tight on yep. the post here? Yep. In case we have to cut some more off, we can. Okay. <coughs> same thing here, huh? You do the same, exactly. All right. So this is all by eye. All by eye. How's that? That looks good. No tape measures for you guys. No. Now, where do we cut it? In the library. Let's go. Here we go. Oh. A wet saw. Joe, yeah. I've always wanted one of these. Yeah, I'll bet you did. <laughs> yeah, these are lovely. No teeth on the blade. Huh? No teeth. Diamond impregnated blade. Yeah. It's cooled by water. That, uh, there's a little waterproof pump here. Right. Pumps the water out of this sump. That's right. That's pumps it tube. up through this line. It's just wrapped around this way here yeah. to the back of the blade. And it's, it comes both sides of the blade through two spouts. And that blows, both cools the blade and the work. That's right. Keeps and the blade cool, keeps the cut clean. There you go. There so you how go. do you get started here? Right here, I'll show you. We'll take the... Uh, Got your safety glasses on. Yeah. Now this is sort of like a radial arm saw, but instead of pulling the saw toward the work, you've got the table, which slides the work right into the saw. Yep, exactly. This tile here will slide right through there. Well, let's crank her up and see how she okay. goes. Okay. I'll do the shortcut. Okay. I'll just line this right up. And that pencil line. Okay. You turn this on. When you turn this on, wait for the water to drop and then start your cut. Okay. Well, it cuts like butter. Exactly. Now I'm going to pick this tile up just so I can underscore. Cut the back side. There we go. Now, there's really no danger in that blade because no. uh, you could actually touch that. It, it can be touched. I mean, it, it's not something to, uh -huh. to be touched, but if your hand were to touch it, it would, it's mm -hmm. all right. Okay. okay. Now, why don't you give it a try? All right. So we line it up. Right on that pencil line. Square it on the table. Yep. Okay. Flip it on. Wait for the water. Water. Okay. And then the speed her right in. Now 
Now, I'm not going to be able to tip it up as far as you did. Okay, just pull it up. Because, uh... Back it up. There you go. A little more. I'll hit the arbor That's then. good. That's about it. Okay. That uh, broke off there. Do you have a nipper or something? We can take care of that? That's right. That little piece in there. We can cut this right off. These pair of nippers. Thank you. you just reach in there. You see, it's, could it's, almost use a trim knife on yeah, it. Yeah, it's, so it's very soft. It's like I said earlier. Let's go see if it fits. Okay. Let's see how she sits in there. Hey. How's that? That looks good there. Fine. You made a great cut there, Steve. Hey, had a good teacher. Beautiful. How many more of these do you have to put in? Oh, about another 5,280. Well, uh, I promise I'll come back and help you, but first thing I'm going to check in with Norm and Tommy. The mill work arrived today, and that's going in. Okay. I'll be back. Later. Boy, doesn't this look nice? Hi, Tom. Hi, Steve. You know, we ought to see the job the Ferranis are doing on the tile downstairs. I can't wait to see it finished. It's really nice. Yeah. Well, you guys are trimming out. That must feel good. Yeah, it does. It feels great. Yeah. We, got the, we got all the doors from the millwork company. Yeah. And they come pre-hung, right? Right. Pre-hung and pre-drilled. All, all ready to go. You just got to slide them in and then case them. Right. And uh, Norm, you're working on the windows. Yeah, we're casing out the windows now. We had a couple problems. Oh, yeah? Nothing real serious. Mostly typical. Yeah. You know, the windows, when we got them from the factory, had these applied extension jams, little pieces that went on, and the intention was that this finished edge would be flush with the right. drywall on the inside. Now, those were spec by our architectural firm, right? That's right. This happens all the time. You know, plaster thicknesses are different, mm -hmm. studs vary a little bit, and you end up, they don't quite make it. Right. So we had to take off the ones that came with the windows and make new ones to mm -hmm. go around and build it out flush with the drywall. Generally, you want to build it out to the point that's furthest into the room, like right here, mm -hmm. flush. Okay. Yeah, it's nice and flush. It's not All bad right. along the bottom, but when you get over on this side, look at this, it's yeah. in about 3 sixteenths of an inch. Also, it really falls away. So what do you do? Well, the problem comes when you actually go to put the casings on. You know, when you cut these casings on the miter box, it's 90 degrees from the back of the casing to the little cut. Mm -hmm. So if you put it up there, in order for the joint to fit tightly, the two surfaces have to be 90 degrees to one another. Right. Now, because of that gap, when I nail it against the wall, I might end up with this. Now, couldn't you just uh, backplane that with a little block plane or something? Yeah, you could take a plane and try to plane it back. It takes quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't always come out perfect. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do is actually leave the cut alone and nail them together and get that nice joint. Now, but, what do you do about this? So it gives you... Looks like about a quarter inch here. Tapers off to what? Three sixteenths here. That's right. It's going to vary. <clears throat> what do you do? Cut a shim or something to well, fit back there? <laughs> I've done that before. Yeah, In so fact, I've, I've ripped the shrimp shims, and then because every corner is a little different, mm -hmm. you end up planing them and everything like that. You know, time. in the old days, the carpenters didn't have that problem. They had corner blocks. Mm -hmm. They had three quarters of an inch of plaster where they had wooden grounds which was right. a guide for the plaster mm -hmm. so everything was nice and even today we have more variables to work with the reason i don't like using that piece of wood in there is that two or three years down the road it may shrink mm -hmm. and the paint's going to crack and when you're sitting over there or laying in your bed you're going to look over and see it and you're not right. going to like it well i know what i do in a situation like that but i'm kind of curious to see what the master would do <laughs> well we actually use a product that's been around for only a few years and it's a caulking compound. Now, they've had latex for a long time, yeah. but this is siliconized latex. Now, why wouldn't you use pure silicone here? Pure silicone is unpaintable. Mm -hmm. Paint's not going to stick to it. But silicone has that good property to right. expand and contract, right. and latex is easy to clean up. Mm -hmm. So they've combined both of them in one caulking. So we'll put the casing on, caulk the joint, mm -hmm. should stay fine. Well, I'm glad to see that Norm Abram uses the carpenter spray, too. <laughs> yeah. So this will be... Uh, this will look like this when we're done. And that's right. This is a real sweet joint. You do that on your power miter box? Well, that's the way we used to do it all the time. But, you know, the miter box joint is perfectly acceptable. But over here, Tom has a new tool Leave that it makes to it Silvis. even better. Leave it to the Silvers to find a new tool. <laughs> well, actually, it's not a new tool. It's uh, a tool that's really found in the, in the picture frame shot. Oh, yeah? But we're going to try it and use it on the site. And what we're going to do here is we have sides that are preset 
for for 45 in this particular instance. That's just like, like a big blade here. Yeah. yeah, well, actually, it's a sliding cutter. Mm -hmm. And they're razor sharp, so you yeah. have to really be careful. And you only want to take off a 16th to an 18th mm -hmm. inch. So we're just going to true this miter up. Now, you couldn't actually cut a board no, with this machine. No, definitely you? not. It's mm -hmm. only for shaving it. Mm -hmm. It's like a guillotine. Right, exactly. Well, you can hear the sound of that pine cutter. Nice through. and sweet. Yeah. And we're just going to glue up the, the miter. Boy, that is gorgeous. Look at that. Check it out. Boy, that is gorgeous. That, nice? that is gorgeous. That's the way to go. Now, Norm, how's yours going along here? Well, I'm just about ready. If you could hand me the nail gun, sure. I'm going to nail this one on. Now, you wouldn't actually use a hammer on this. Oh, no, we don't use hammers anymore. Now, what you do to keep it even, though, is when I nail that top edge, I'm going to just shoot one nail in through the side here, keep it nice and flush. Okay, we'll just let that dry. Now, we're picture framing these. We're not putting any window stools on. Uh, well, you know, the windows come in so far that if I put a windowsill that's of any use, it's going to stick way out mm -hmm. beyond any kind of apron piece mm -hmm. underneath it. It might just curl. So I think the picture framing looks much nicer. Plus, I guess it gives it that barn look as sure well. Sure does. Okay. Now, Norm, are you going to stick some nails on the outside edge here? Well, normally you would, and you want to nail way out near the edge here. Mm -hmm. but. With the stress skin panel, all I'm going to be nailing into is the strand board, and the That's nail's right. not going to hold very well. That's right. Now, we do have a 2x4 nailer, but it's back about here, as I remember. That's right. That's fine for the narrow casing, but for this wide one, I don't think we really, you know, need to worry. This caulking actually has good adhesion, so that'll help hold it tight against the wall. So now I just run down the side with the track, put a fairly heavy bead in there, and then I'm just going to take my finger and smooth it out. It. Well, looks real nice. I'll leave you two guys to it. I'm supposed to go down and meet Rich Shuthui in the basement, see if he can fire off that oil burner. Okay. See you, Tom. See you. Hey, Richard, it's cold in here. How about some heat? Well, everybody's screaming for heat. Uh, so what we did is we called the local oil guy and pulled a few favors. He came out and got us a new oil tank. Yeah. He even did the, the pipes for us for the fill in the vent. He even put oil in it for us. Hey, We're ready to go nice over guy. here. There's a new filter. Yeah. The new line is run back over here. Our guy's got the water heater installed and piped up. Gorgeous. All the piping is done to our uh, boiler. I love the color. Isn't it great? Designer colored. The burner is connected. Yeah. All this is brought together. All the piping is into the manifold. Everything is ready to go. So let's do it. One thing. The what? chimney is not done. It's been so cold <laughs> here that the stonemason couldn't finish the chimney going up the side of the house, so we are literally so all still, revved up with no place to go. So we're still without heat. So if you can get any pull with the weatherman, we, it, we just need a break in the weather, and if he can finish it up, then we're ready to fire. Everything's ready to go. Well, we'll hope for a break where we can get it finished up and get some heat in here. Okay. Well, next time, we'll continue with our tiling. Norm has promised us a set of barn board doors for the library, and we'll do some lighting, too. So until then, I'm Steve Thomas for this old house. Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is that the copy of today's project that a measured drawing and a materials list is available. And you'll hear more about that before the program ends. I also want to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read understand and follow all the safety rules that come with each of your power tools. Knowing how to use your tools safely greatly reduces the possibility of personal injury.
And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how I built today's project. Now that's not gonna go anywhere. And when it came time to build our version of the pencil post bed, I made a couple significant changes from the one that I saw at the Shelburne Museum. First of all, I wanted our bed to accommodate a modern box spring and mattress. And those two pieces take about 16 inches in height. If I had set that on the rail system of the one at Shelburne, mattress would have been way too far above the floor. So I lowered the rail system, slightly shortened the legs, and I raised the headboard up because if I didn't raise the headboard up, it would be behind the mattress. Now I did keep the nice tapered post, almost exactly like the one at Shelburne, an inch and an eighth at the top, tapering down to about two and a half inches square where the rails meet it. Now the choice of materials was a little difficult. At first I thought I would use pine, but pine sometimes can be unstable and I didn't want a post that would twist. So I chose poplar, a favorite among woodworkers because it mills nicely and it takes paint very well. And it'll stay stable, it won't twist. Now, the real challenge in this project is how to make this tapered post. It's tapered on four sides and then beveled on the corners, giving me a very elegant and thin post. And to do that, I made myself a jig. The jig looks a little complicated, but it's not too bad. I made it out of some scrap plywood that was sitting around the shop. And the most important feature is this slot right here. And it's made to fit over the rip fence on my table saw. It slips over it in such a way that it's snug enough that it won't move side to side, yet not so tight that I can't slide it back and forth easily. Now I've set a roller out front, so as I use it, it has a place to rest and also another one back here, so as we pull it back, it has something to sit on. Now the post sits in the jig, but it's got, jig has two cleats, one at the back and one up at the front, which are about an inch further apart than the length of my post. And then I made these little hangers. There's a little cleat on it, and it sits over this cross piece, and the bottom of the hanger corresponds with the top of the table saw surface, so they're exactly in the same plane. Now I've taken the hanger and measured up from the bottom one and a quarter inches, which is half the measurement of my post. And this will give me a pivot point, so I'll just fasten a screw to the center of the post. Okay, now I'll take the post and drop it into the jig and fasten this end to the cleat to the right of the blade path. Now I'll go down the other end and swing the post out to this layout line. The hanger should line up there. And that wasn't by accident, that was a line that was established in the making of the prototype. Now what I've done is actually position the post. These lines are layout lines for the lower portion of the post, the leg. And if I was to take a tape measure and measure from the fence to the layout line, see it's seven and three eighths there. It's also seven and three eighths here. Now that means that the layout line is parallel to the blade. I'll just slide this back. And you can start to see how it's gonna cut a taper as it moves along the blade. Okay, now I get up pretty much where my layout lines are. I'm going to have to slide my rip fence in just a little bit. I want the inside edge of the blade to just be on my layout lines. I don't want to taper beyond this point because this is where my rails are going to intersect. I only want to taper down here. Okay, now I just slide it back lift the whole jig slightly and just spin the blank. Now you really get to see the purpose of that pivot point. And I don't even need layout lines anymore. I'll just repeat the process. Well, now I'll just 
cut the other two sides just as I did with those. And then I'll do the other three posts. just completed is the tapering of the four sides of the post. Now I want to bevel the corners. Now to make that cut I have to reposition the post in the hanger and to do that I want to move the screw up about a half an inch and reattach it. And now I'll just reinstall it in the jig on the same marks I used before. Now this line that I'm darkening on my hanger is perpendicular to the saw table. And if I take my post and turn it so that the corner aligns with that pencil line, I know it's at 45 degrees, the bevel that I'm looking for. Oh yeah, now before I do any cutting, I need one more layout line. I'm gonna go down an inch and a quarter from this line, put a mark, and that's the point I wanna stop cutting at because the rest of this area is gonna be scalloped out. Once that's marked, I just turn my post 45 degrees and we'll do a trial cut. Well, now I'll do that to all the corners of all four posts. Well, now I'm ready to taper the upper portion of the post. And it's a very long, gradual taper. But it's done the same way using the jig. I've made a couple adjustments, however. First thing is to take the post and flip it end for end. Now, the back hanger is in exactly the same position it was for the other cuts. But the front hanger here has been moved about two and a quarter inches over to the right. I also had to make a fence adjustment, and I did that the same way as we did for the bottom layer. I slid the whole jig forward and sighted down by the saw blade so that I won't cut beyond this layout line. Other than that, all the steps are exactly the same. Making these pencil posts is the most time-consuming part of this project, but the rest of it will go a lot quicker. Now, the next thing I want to do is finish cutting these scallops out. And to do that, I suppose I could use my hand coping saw, but I'm going to use the band saw. Well, now I'm using my belt sander to remove any of the imperfections left by the saw blade and smooth out the post. Well, now I'm going to take the post and set it in that cradle so that I can sand the beveled edges. Now, the thing that I want to be careful about is that I don't want to run the belt sander so far ahead that I might nick this corner. I'll sand as close as I can and dress the rest of this with my drum sander. Well, I think that's enough for today. Tomorrow, we'll mortise the post, make the rails, and the headboard. Welcome to another wet, damp morning here in New England. We can always use the rain. And anyway, it gives me an excuse to come here in the shop where it's nice and toasty and finish up my pencil post bed. I've been doing a little bit of work this morning, starting to make mortises in the post where the rails will meet. Let me show you over on the bench. First thing that I did was to lay out the location of the mortise on each post. And there's going to be two. One along this side, which could be used to connect a cross rail and another one on the adjacent side for one of the long rails along the side of the bed. Let me show you how I did it. I used my drill press. And the first thing that I did was set it up with a 7 8 inch Forstner bit. And this is a bit that's shaped in such a way that as you cut, you end up with a perfectly flat bottom. I've also adjusted the drill press so that it has a limit. It'll only go down an inch deep in my wood.
Now with a nice sharp chisel, I'm gonna finish cleaning out the mortise. I almost don't even need a hammer with this poplar. There's really not gonna be any surprises. It's nice wood to work with. Just shave down next to my line. Now well, that looks pretty good. Now let me show you the next part of the operation. But before we do it, I'm gonna go back to the prototype. Let's take this corner apart. You know, any bed has to be able to be assembled and disassembled easily so that you can move it from room to room. And there's a lot of different systems that have been used over the years. And let me show you what I've done here. Okay. You can see there's a little bolt sticking out of the end of my rail, the side rail. And actually, it's I call a hanger bolt. It's lagged on one end and it's threaded on the other end. I've lagged it right into the side rail and that'll be permanently set in that position. And each time you assemble it and disassemble it, you just take the threaded end and slide it in and out of the rail. And what you've really got here is two holes, a 3 8 hole for the bolt to come through and a larger counter bore, an inch and an eighth, for the washer and the nut to be recessed in so that they'll be out of sight. This just makes it very easy to take the better part and put it back together. Now, the first thing I want to do is make this counter bore, and I'll do that over at the drill press. Well, that takes care of the counter bore. Now I'll drill the 3 8 inch hole. And remember, it's always better to drill the larger hole first. And that takes care of the 3 8 inch hole. Now here at the foot of the bed, the rail is permanently attached to the post, as well as up at the headboard area. Now if you look over here on the post, you can see a little plug right there. It's actually a bung made out of poplar, which I sanded down after the glue dried. And that's just to fill a hole that was necessary for these two and a half inch bugle head screws that hold it all together. And now I'm going to drill those 3 8 inch counter bores. Well, now that's the hole for the wooden bung. Now I'll change to a smaller bit to make a pilot hole for the screw. Over here at the radial arm saw, I have the stock for the rails. Two shorter pieces for the head and foot rails, and two longer pieces for the side rails. The wood is again poplar. It's six inches wide and an inch and a quarter thick. And what I'm doing is cutting the tenons on each end. I set the radial arm up with a stop block, and what that does is controls the length of my tenon, which I want to be exactly one inch. And then in the radial arm, I've installed this twin blade dado head cutter, and that'll be used to plow out the material. I spent a lot of time setting the height so that I end up with exactly a 7 8 inch thick tenon, so that it'll fit snugly in those mortises that I've made. Take a look at how it's done. Now the next step on the tenon is to make a shoulder cut along the narrow side. I want to remove about 3 8 of an inch material top and bottom. And to do that, I've raised the radial arm saw and installed a higher fence. It'll hold the work steadier and it keeps it perpendicular to the table. And now I'll just nibble away that shoulder. Well, let's see how this is going to fit. Slip it in there. Oh, just snug. That's the way I like to see it. Now, if we tilt this back, you'll notice that this tenon projects into the other mortise. And if I was to try to put the other rail in here, they would bump into one another. So I'm going to relieve that corner, 
by just planing it off with a block plane. Well, I think that should take care of it. Now we're ready for some assembly. Well, now's a good time to sand off all the layout lines. Now here I've set up the two posts that'll be part of the headboard system of the bed. And I've attached the tops together with a temporary cleat. And that'll hold them the right distance apart, which for my bed happens to be 62 and a quarter inches. Now down at the bottom here, I can now install this rail. And I'm just gonna slip it together dry. No glue yet, because I'll have to take it apart one more time. And I'll hold it in place with some screws in the holes that I drilled earlier. Okay, well, you know, I've gone through all this temporary pre-assembly for only one reason, and that's to size my headboard. Because remember, we've got two tapered posts. They get wider as they get up to the top, and every post is going to vary a little bit. So in order to get an exact fit, I have to do this pre-assembly step. Now I'm ready to lay out the location of the headboard, which is nine inches up from the top of that rail, and then another seven inches for the height of the headboard where it intersects the post. Now what I'm going to do is take some very precise measurements between those two points and record them. Okay, that's 59 and 15 sixteenths. See, an eighth of an inch, and that's important. Now over here I have a couple pieces of one by eight poplar that I've edge glued together. And I'll unclamp them now that the glue is dry and lay out the headboard. Okay, that finishes the layout. Now to cut the ends, I'm going to take my bevel gauge and just set it to the angle. It's very slight, but it's important. And then I'm going to take the bevel gauge over to the radial arm and set it. Now I'm going to bring the saw blade out. You can see it's very slight, but it's important. Now we'll swing it over until that fits right. Lock it in, and we're ready to make a cut. Okay, with the ends cut, bring it over to my bench, let it hang out over the edge, clamp it in place with the bench dogs. And now I'm just going to take a circular saw and trim the angles, cutting them strong, leaving the mark. Okay, that'll take care of the sanding of the headboard. Now the only edge I still have to finish is this one right here, the top edge. I could have used the belt sander, but I want to show you something. The joiner does a great job. What I'm doing here is putting some marks for these little biscuits that I'm going to use to actually join the headboard to the post. They're simple, they're fast, and they're very strong. Over here is the tool that I use to cut the slots for the biscuits. What you do is you set the tool on the edge of the board, holding it on this fence, and align the pencil mark I made before with the line that's scribed on the tool. Now on the other side, you'll see there's a slot, and as you operate the tool and pivot it, a blade swings down, cutting a half moon. It's real simple, watch. Okay, now for the corresponding slot in the post. I'm gonna take the fence off of the tool and just use the face of it as a guide.
to align with this pencil mark here, which is the face of the headboard, and once again, the scribe line with the pencil mark I made earlier. Okay, now we're ready for some glue, the biscuits, and we'll clamp it all together. These biscuits are made out of beech wood, and a little bit of glue on them actually makes them swell up, and you'll never get them apart. I've got to work fast now. And now a couple of nice long pipe clamps. The rail joining the two posts at the foot of the bed is assembled just like it was at the head. Some glue and some screws. Now we'll plug those holes with these thongs. A little glue on them, drive them in. After the glue dries, I'll cut them off and sand them smooth. Okay, with that hole drilled, you can now take the bolt and put the lagged end in. And I put a couple nuts on the end and tighten them against one another so that I can use my socket to just spin it into the hole. Slide it back in. Now a washer and a nut. Tighten it down. And I'll do the same thing to the other three connections. Boy, we're moving right along now. One more step. I've got to make and install this cleat right here. It's like a ledge that'll support the box spring. Now this cleat is nothing more than a piece of one and a quarter inch by one inch thick stock that I fasten to the side rail with some glue and some screws. And that about takes care of it. Now remember, the one at the Shelby Museum was kind of a salmon color. What color would you paint this one? Well, this is kind of a buff color. It's not as vivid as that salmon that we saw up in Vermont. But I think it's pretty nice. It should go with just about anything. Well, these covers are a nice finishing touch. Now all I need is a queen-size box spring and mattress, and I'll be ready for a good night's sleep. But not out here, at least not in this kind of weather. Next time, we'll be building this chair table. It's a clever design that they've been building since colonial times. You won't want to miss it. Next time, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop is made possible by... Square D Company. For over 85 years, a source of quality products that make electric power safer to use for businesses and homes throughout the world. Square D. And by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels. Products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the new Yankee workshop with Norm Abram. It was fantastic. The number of tools and the way he used them really does make that job uh, go quite a bit easier. Obviously, it, it, he didn't do it in a half an hour. There was obviously a lot of uh, preparing uh, the, the project, but it was a terrific way to show you how to get involved in work and woodworking. Norm does a terrific job, and of course, you'll see him a little bit later in uh, this old house as well, which is coming on next. If you enjoy this kind of programming, then we're asking you to, to help us out right now during this, our Festival 90. My name is Tom Endress. John Scheffler is here, and we have a great group of operators from the Presqueo Bank. They've driven down from places like Rogers City and Hillman and Lachine and are offering a great challenge grant here this afternoon. 
This is the first year in a couple of years when they've been able to make it because they've been snowed out. So they really, they want to make up for lost time. They want to really be busy down here and they want to talk to you. So why not give us a call and make a pledge and support great programs like the New York Yankee Workshop and this old house on CMU Public Broadcasting. Call now with maybe a pledge of $5 a month, maybe a pledge of $25. But if you enjoy the great how-to programs on Saturday here on CMU Public Broadcasting, then please do your part and give us a call. John Scheffler, how you doing over there, guy? Well, uh, you got some free got, blue cards there and yeah, all kinds yeah, of stuff I, going on. I think the uh, the folding table uh, segment is oh. coming up either next week or the week after. Yeah, well. I, uh, I saw the promo for it I here on the public television ahead. station yesterday, and I thought they meant today was the day, but, well, we'll have to keep watching the, the new Yankee workshop and see what else old Norm comes up with. It'd be nice to have uh, a relative like Norm around, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, so you could make the and, stuff, uh, or, you, or, you should, or so you could borrow the tools? Oh, well, either. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> I borrow some of those tools. I might even be able to make a straight cut on a two-by-four, but... Uh, the kind of carpenter I am, but uh, Norm sure makes things look easy, and and the thing is, when you know how, and he's certainly sharing a lot of that knowledge with us, and the proper tools, which is, of course, okay. the ultimate, uh, of ultimate importance, uh, having the right tools to do the job, uh, when you have people like Norm uh, showing you things like that, well, it's going to make your job go a little bit easier, and uh, we hope that if you are a regular viewer here of the new Yankee Workshop, You'll give us a call and uh, tell us how much you appreciate having that program here on CMU Public Television. 1-800-727-9268. Now, let's see. We have a call which uh, came in from uh, Marion Thompson of Lachine and wants us to say hello to Sue and Kenny. Who are Sue and Kenny? Who are operators here? Oh, down on the far <laughs> side there. Okay. Sue and Kenny. She's we, hiding over here. We said the official how-do there. Then uh, we got a call from uh, Elma Nevins of Posen. All right. All right. Up in the old neck of the woods up there by the uh, Presqu'ile Bank. We also heard from Harold and Joanne Brand of uh, Barrington. And from Hillman, we heard from Roger Longpree. And in Millersburg, David Smale. And we appreciate uh, those calls, which have helped us out here. And uh, hope you'll do your part, too, today. That's right, John. All right. I've got a brand new member of the individual honor roll. We want to show you who that is. Walt and Judy, we appreciate your call, and we're going to be adding your name to the Wall of Fame. And you can join them as well by calling 1-800-727-9268 and put your name up on the Wall of Fame as well. Make a pledge of $200. You can put it on your Visa or MasterCard. Maybe you'd like to uh, pay that off with, uh, say, at $25 a month until it's paid off. That'd be great. Just talk to one of our operators here. We're here to serve you. Public broadcasting, commercial-free public broadcasting deserves your support. Call now at 1-800-727-9268. I also got a call from a great friend of ours, and I really appreciate it. It was good hearing from her. John, you've got some more uh, honor roll cards. Yes, I do. I've got a new one right here uh, from Carl and Audrey Lowe, I believe it Leo. is. Leo? From Leo. Is that Leo, then? <laughs> that was Leo. Carl and Audrey Leo from Roger City. Then uh, Riley and Mary Lou Turcotte, some old friends of ours uh, from Petoskey. And Richard and Norma Straka from Harrison, and Charles and Debbie Beckwith up in uh, Sheboygan. And uh, these will all be going up on our uh, wall of fame here over my uh, left shoulder. We've got a few names over here already, and uh, we'll certainly see that list uh, continue to grow here throughout Festival 90. And we'd like to have your name up there if you and your family enjoy public television and uh, can see fit to uh, donate $200 here as an individual uh, Honor roll, we'd love to have your name printed and share it uh, with all of our viewers around Central and Northern Michigan. Let them know just how much you appreciate our service here. 1-800-727-9268. And uh, there's Tom. He's got the old microphone in his hand, and he's going to meet some more of our operators. Yeah, that's right, John. You know, these people have driven a long way, and, and it's been a couple of years since they've been on, and we want to make sure that, that everybody gets to meet them. So let's meet a few of them right now. Hi, what is your name? Audrey Selke. And Audrey, where do you work? I work at the Presqu'ile Bank, uh, Rogers City Main Office. Okay. And what in the accounting department. In the accounting department. Okay. Keep everything in balance. Good. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Somebody's got to do that. Somebody's got to do Make it. Sure, everything's right. <laughs> right. Okay. Anybody out there you want to say hi to today? I'd like to say hi to my husband, Kadon, and my daughter, Holly, and son, Tom. Okay. And where would you like to get some more calls from today? All over. <laughs> all over. Anywhere. You can just talk to anybody, right? Really? Okay. All I have to do is give you a call. That's right. All right. Thanks for coming in and helping out. Let's see who else is here. Hi, what's your name? Jamie Koenig. 
And Jamie, where do you work? <laughs> I don't work. <laughs> Hmm? I don't work. You don't work. Where do you go to school, Jamie? Hillman. Hillman School? At the community school. Great. Okay. And your dad, of course, works for the bank, right? He's down on phone one over there? Mm-hmm. And before we go, we're going to say hello to uh, John and Cindy Dalkey. They're very, very good. I got the nod from the big guy here on phone one. And that's in Nesson City. All righty. And uh, they also want us to say hello to Tim Treezeis. I believe it is. So we've taken care of that bit of business. And now the next bit of business for us here today is to go see what's happening on this old house right here on CMU Public Television. Stay tuned to CMU Public Television, a public service of Central Michigan University. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. But well, what's this? You've got a big post right in the middle of the doorway here. I mean, I know it's nice red oak and it's nicely checked, but uh, don't you run into it? This looks great. What is this material? You've used it both here on the countertop and also here in the shower stall. The structure itself is the challenge. This is an overwhelming house. It's big, all of the space, these beams, it's aggressive, it's even a little intimidating. Funding for this old house is provided by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes and enamels, products that enrich, protect and preserve the natural beauty of wood and by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hi, I'm Steve Thomas. Welcome to this old house. Well, today is the day we wrap it all up around here, and it's the time in a project when contractors start talking about their punch list all those last minute things they have to do before they can move on to the next job. Earlier I had a chance to catch up with Rich Truthui and see how he's doing on his. Hey Richard. Hi Steve, how are you? So what is this? You keep adding equipment down here. I mean, it's a huge mechanical room. We gotta fill it up, don't we? <laughs> what is this stuff anyway? Well we had a water test done. Yeah. And we found in general the water's very good shape, but it did have high levels of dissolved iron mm -hmm. and manganese. If it had been particles of iron or manganese, we could just put in a sediment filter and we'd be out of it. Mm -hmm. But let me show you what we've done here. This is our regular well tank that's been here all along. I recognize that. Before the tank, we put in this tank, which is going to add air to the water. What does that do? Well, it make, what it does is it makes the iron uh, oxidize, so it becomes particles. Mm -hmm. Once there are particles in the water, we can then treat it. Okay. Over to here, this is a column inside this of this filter media which will extract the iron particles. I see, just like a pool filter. Right. Now, if we didn't do anything to it, it would, uh, it would run for a while and then it could clog up. Mm -hmm. This thing has got an automatic feature in it which will back flush the filter regularly to a drain. So it just pushes all so the stuff out. Yeah. Now, I see you got your boiler running. Yeah, finally. We're very glad to have it going. What's all this stuff? This looks like flexible tubing. Here. Well, these are the oil lines, actually. They're flexible oil lines. And to facilitate accessing inside the boiler, mm -hmm. This door is on a hinge, and this, the serviceman once a year or so could come by and check the inside of it and not have to break all mm -hmm. the connections, so it's a good feature. Nice. First okay. class. So here's our, our control board. This is our manifold for the upstairs baseboard and radiators. Each room is its own zone. Uh -huh. Okay. This is our manifold for the underfloor heating system. Yeah. Now, we need two separate temperatures, and that's why we have the two separate manifolds. Okay, so okay. they run at different temperatures. Right. Now, what's this new manifold over here called snow melting? Well, the carriage house, there is intentions of taking the carriage house down and putting in a driveway or an access mm -hmm. road, which, which would have a steep incline. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we can lay the same sort of tubing underneath the driveway no and run it into here. Now, won't that freeze? Well, it would, but at that point, we'll fill the entire system with, with glycol, with an uh -huh. antifreeze solution. With antifreeze. Mm -hmm. Great. What's this contraption here? I want to show you. We place sensors all around the building. At the tile, or the floor level upstairs, we're about 80 degrees. Boy, that's nice and toasty. At head level, we're about 75 degrees. Very comfortable. Now, all the way up at the peak, which is 20-some-odd uh, feet. That's going to be hot, I bet. It's 71. 
So it's just the inverse of huh. traditional heating. Amazing. And, and we're heating it with today on a mild day about 84 degree water. Now 84 degree water isn't normal boiler temperature 180 degrees? That would be regular base with 180. So we have just this warm blanket circulating all the time. So we have a very comfortable system that's also very efficient. Absolutely. Great. Now how did the heating work up uh, work out on the second floor? Let me take it. We've got uh, both the baseboard and the radius installed. Okay. Well here's Joe Manzi giving our central vacuuming system a test drive. How's it working Joe? It's working great. That's good. There's, there's a lot of work to be done around there here. There sure today. is. You're going to be a popular man. What's this device? Well, this is a, a turbine power brush that runs off the suction of the machine itself. No kidding. Let's see this thing. And it spins, this, by putting it flat, mm -hmm. it spins fast. It works as a uh, generator. So there's a fan in here. Isn't right, it? right. And then uh, with the double row of uh, brushes that mm -hmm. we have here, one row is softer than the other, so it not only beats, agitates, but then it sucks mm -hmm. up everything and brings well, it down. The fan drives a belt and drives this yeah. agitator. Right. Great. And then this new design here gives us an edge cleaner. Mm -hmm. So you can do all the operations with this unit alone rather than changing to another tool to just do the edges. Well, that's a big time saver. You know, and I, I like this low profile because it fits right under furniture, which is terrific. Right. Get rid of all those dust balls down there. Well, I've got a little scene to shoot with Richard here. So uh, maybe we can catch up with you later. Well, I'll go do another Thanks room. Thanks very much. Thanks, How are you going to heat this room, Rich? Well, we could have run underfloor heating up here as well. But what we found is in the bedrooms and uh, some of the remote rooms, people want to be able to turn them up and turn them down. Mm -hmm. So what we decided to go is with this radiant style of baseboard. Now, this is... This looks like a one by six. It really painted it. It uh, looks just like it. And people have actually trimmed it out with quarter round and made it identical Gorgeous. to it. What you'd see behind there is, if I pulled it off, would be this. A wall bracket which mounts it to the wall. And then a piece of extruded aluminum with two tubes built right into it. So this comes in long, continuous runs. That's right, and it's cut and it's tapped. And then we would run a supply and a return tube from our manifold mm -hmm. to each room, connected with compression fittings. So that just screws right mm -hmm. on, you tighten it up. And then to trim out the final piece, we go like this and snaps right over and that's what you see here that's wonderful and there's some trim pieces which soften it at the corner that's really wonderful stuff make it look how'd you make out with the bathroom good each room will be controlled with its own thermostat ah, as well that's very handy yeah, great so you get real comfort room to room the bathroom is all done and uh, working this is how we're heating the bathroom this is a towel warmer you can put a towel on each uh, application but it's also so it's a one radiator. Towel hill, one towel right. here. Unlike most towel warmers, it has enough power to actually heat a bathroom. Hmm. So it, it, it no more unsightly radiators or, or basically in the bathroom. And they get warm, dry towels. Right. Too. Now here's our bathroom. We have uh, the owner wanted a whirlpool uh, as he exercises regularly. And this is our shower control, tub and shower control. This is a pressure balance unit, which means you cannot get scalded in any way. You pick the temperature of the water you want to come out of it, and it'll read right here. And then with this adjustment, you decide whether the water comes out of the tub spout, out of this hand shower, or up out of this shower head. Oh, it's like a water unit. Great? Yeah. great. In this bathroom and everywhere, uh, water conservation is a real issue. And uh, this is a 1.5 gallon per flush toilet. Traditional toilets are 3.5 and, and greater. So tremendous water saving. Right, about How half. Thing work? Well, this is a little different. Yeah. This uses the pressure that we get from the well system to it stores the pressure charge in this tank and then <laughs> uses that and forces the water down. So it, it's, a, it's a 1.6 toilet that actually works. It's a turbocharged toilet. Right. Great. Okay, let me just show you in one other thing that we did from the plumbing standpoint here. Our washer and dryer are up here. So we've got that. We're now in our laundry room. Laundry. We've roughed in our gas for our dryer and where our hoses will connect mm -hmm. for our um, washing machine. Now what's this pan all We about? put in a pan. You know, many people say, ah, I don't need a pan. I'll take the chance. This mm -hmm. is one of the best things. If you're going to put the wash and dryer upstairs, make, make sure, sure you in put In case the, the washer overflows. Right. Or something. And right below it is the library with all those nice bound books. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, this is a real good choice. Now what's all this? So you can take a bath in here? Well, this has a trap in it so that it could take the water away. And that trap over time could evaporate. The water in the trap could evaporate. Oh, I see. Because the trap 
is not being used because right. the drain is not being used. Right. The water would evaporate. Right. And uh, gases from the sewer gases could come gas. up in here. So what this is, this is a trap primer so that any time any fixture is used, in this case we picked the toilet, mm -hmm. when a few drips of water will drip into this to replenish the hmm. water. I've never seen one of those before. It's a good thing to have in this application. What's next? Let me take it over the master. Okay. Aerotrip. This looks great. Isn't that nice? What is this material? You've used it both here on the countertop and also here in the shower stall. What, what caught my eye about this product is that it was a prefabricated unit that, that came in a three walls plus a matching base. It gives us a look of granite in a very easy to install and affordable mm -hmm. package. So I like that. It's really a nice Looks unit. wonderful. Boy, you've done a great job here. Thank you. Can you perform the same miracles out in Santa Fe? Well, I'm looking forward to going there. My bags are packed and I'm ready to go. Okay. Look forward to it, okay. too. Well, Rich Trasui has fared a little better on his punch list than you have on yours, Tom. Well, it's kind of warm in there, you know, Steve. <laughs> this has been the coldest December in 100 years in Boston. Yeah. So we haven't fared too well. Great weather for landscape. But this coming spring, we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. What I thought I'd do is to buzz you quickly through what okay. we have to do. As you know, we're going to fill the joints in our terrace here with, uh, with saw. Yeah, I really think that'll soften up the look. Really pull that whole in. garden together. Yeah, great. And then, you know, right here in this bed, we're going to plant shrubs. Uh -huh. And one thing I've done is picked a perfect plant to hide this beautiful... I was hoping you'd come up with something for that. Yeah. And can you imagine Barbara Wickwire picking her tomatoes from the uh, vegetable garden? I'm going to come gonna... and sample them myself. Terrific. Now, isn't a fence or something going in here? Actually, that's right. 20 feet from the uh, edge of the barn. There'll be a post and rail fence uh -huh. that will sort of signal the edge of this garden. We're going to put roses on that. Great. And hey, look, this is new. Ah, yes. Roger uh, Hopkins snuck by this weekend, and instead of hauling away all this, this granite, built this little wall for us here. You can count on that Count Rockula. Very pleasant surprise. Now, what about all those plants over there, the, the ones that you didn't have a chance to get into the ground this, this season? Well, Roger Cook has very carefully healed them all in, Steve, with mulch around the root balls, mm -hmm. and also he sprayed them with anti-desiccant, which is intended to keep the water from evaporating from the leaves. So we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope yeah. we'll pull through the winter. Yeah. Now, what about this terrace? Well, Steve, just give us a break in the weather, and this Corinthian granite will be installed at the edge of this uh, green yard over here, just a tiny little spot of it in front of the grape arbor. Great. Now, you still owe us a garden here. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for this to happen. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. We'll bring in topsoil, sod in the, uh, in the center space, plants, and flowers in front of the fence. It should Wonderful. be really lovely. Well, it's really unfair to have this be the last view. So I promise that we'll bring the show back sometime in the future, and we'll see it in full bloom. That'd be terrific. By the way, I was curious to know if Ted Benson's been by lately, now that this has been coming, uh, finishing up. Here. Well, sure he has, and he's thrilled with it. But, you know, he's gotten a lot of letters from people who are very interested in post and beam, but they don't have an old barn to restore, and they're interested in building new. So he took us to a place that he built from scratch. Let's have a look. We built this house about four years ago, Steve, for a very wonderful client, and he's quite happy with it. It has about 28, 2,900 square feet, and like the Wickwire barn, it's a timber frame clad with stress skin panel. Boy, you'd never know it from the outside, Ted. Well, let me show you the inside. Okay. One thing the homeowner did want, Steve, was a mud roof. Yeah, boy, that's essential here in New England. You're right. It's, it's a great place to have a buffer between the cold mm -hmm. exterior and the warm interior, and to be able to take off your coat and boots. Yeah, that's wonderful. I wish I had one. Boy, at this end of the space is the kitchen. Yeah, a kitchen, but wouldn't some people want a partition here to block off the kitchen from the dining room? Well, we didn't. Mm -hmm. And with timber frame construction, we can keep this open. Where we normally might have walls and doors, we use instead posts and beams to define the spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something about this room. Maybe it's the proportions that make you feel good to be in here. I'm glad you noticed that, Steve. This is 16 by 32, completely open, two to one, Steve. Two to one. Is that the secret? That's the secret. Now, this is a wonderful idea, too. I love to see this. Masonry mass on the walls, tile floor, simple wood stove, no combustibles, mm -hmm. and radiating heat all the way up through the house. Yeah, I bet you could heat the whole house with this. We can. Yeah. But what's this? You've got a big post right in the middle of the doorway here. I mean, I know it's nice red oak and it's nicely checked, but uh, don't you run into it? Steve, this is a part of the design. It's 
the structure, uh -huh. we have the beam and the post, and we put it here because we wanted to have a transition from the dining room to the adjacent yeah. space. I it's our doorway. That. I can it see just that. happens to be open. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, this room has fabulous views. You know, you really feel like you're tied to the landscape in this room. Well, they, they do have wonderful views here, Steve. And uh, if this were a sunny day, you would notice we're also facing oh, south. Yeah. And with these glass and timbers, we're gathering light mm -hmm. and heat. It is then transferred up through the house. Yeah, with the oil at a buck fifty a gallon this winter, you want to gather all the heat you can. You're right. And with in today's construction, uh -huh. you really have to consider siting. Yeah. If you can face the house yeah. south yeah. and take in that passive solar heat, we need to do it. Yeah, it's too bad we couldn't do that at the wick wires. That's right. You know, we, we had were, to put the great room either on the east or the west side. We, we just couldn't do it. It would have been difficult to turn it, yeah. Steve. You know, Ted, what really always impresses me about these timber frame buildings is the soaring spaces. Every time I go into one, I just I find myself looking up. It's wonderful. That's right, Steve. And there's a little story in this one. Normally, we would have to have a beam tying from this wall to this wall. Mm -hmm. Instead, we used this hammer beam truss that was developed in the early Middle Ages when they were building the great cathedral. No kidding. And we are now transferring the forces through the beams, and we can eliminate hmm. the tie. That's great. It's a design yeah. element. Well, what's this? A conventional fireplace sucking all the heat out of your tight, energy-efficient house? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a fan of fireplaces because they are inefficient, Steve. Yeah. But I'm a fan of romance, yeah. and that's why this is here. Yeah. Well, I guess that's why the wick wires put it in, too. I, I guess so. This is another lovely room. It's uh, same proportions as the other one? 16 by 32. Yeah. All open. Com completely open, yeah. post defining the spaces. And typically, this might have been a living room with couches and chairs. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that requirement. We have a pool table instead, and that's fun. Well, that's pretty essential for some people, I guess. I think so. You know, I'm curious to see how this theme plays out upstairs. Well, let me show you. Okay. The open plan works beautifully downstairs, but isn't it much more of a challenge upstairs where you have to enclose spaces like bathrooms and bedrooms? Oh, well, sure it is. Uh, we still left this hallway open to the peak yeah. for drama and for definition. Yeah. Yeah. But let me show you the master bedroom. Boy, look at this. What do you think of this, Steve? Very, very dramatic. Very nice. You see, what happened here, Steve, is that we had very simple design requirements and a clean slate, and we could do what we wanted with timbers and spaces. So we have this. Mm -hmm. You didn't have that option yeah. at the Wickwire Bar. That's right, because we had to put the master bedroom on the second floor, and if you have a master bedroom on the second floor, you can't have this cathedral ceiling. Exactly. It works great here, Ted. Well, now, how have you handled the plumbing in this building? As simply as possible. Let me show you. Here, we have a bathroom. Mm -hmm. Beneath it on the first floor is another bathroom. Mm -hmm. We have one plumbing core. I see. All of the pipes are handled right here. That's it. Simple. Very simple. What else do you have on this floor? Well, right here, we've got another bedroom. On the right. And uh, over here, although this could be a bedroom, they've left it open as a sitting area and an entertainment room. Yeah. And out here, you've got a balcony with views onto the great space and that wonderful hammer, hammer beam. Right. Well, I'm beginning to get your religion, Ted. You believe that a timber frame is wonderful, whether for an old barn like the Wickwires or for a new home, such as this one. You finally caught on, Steve. <laughs> Listen, timber frames have been around for 2,000 years. And with good craftsmanship, and with a great use of timbers and spaces, I'm sure it's going to be around for another 2,000. Well, I want to thank you for showing us this place, and thanks for the wonderful job you did on the Wickwire Barn. You're sure welcome. Well, that's Ted Benson. He does nice work. Well, one of the last jobs to be completed around here was actually one of the most complex, the stair rail. Earlier today, Tom and Norm met with a man who made it. Well, Tom, you know, I'm sure glad that this steel railing system was a subcontract. Yeah, I am too, Norm. We wouldn't want to have to mess around with this stuff with routers and planes. Sure. Mike Garciello built this for us. Maybe you can explain, Mike, how you did it. Yes, Tom. The most important thing for this type of a stairway is to get proper field dimensions. You measure it once, and you measure it again to avoid mistakes. 
so you don't get here with a, a railing that's too long or too sharp like a wooden rail you can add on. Right. Now, the raw material <clears throat> here that you started with looks like some kind of square stock. What it's is all it? inch and a half square tubing with a heavy wall thickness. It comes in bar length. And that's how we... Uh, so you just cut it and weld it, and uh, basically, and you put it together at the shop, and it comes come back to us. Exactly. Engineering makes drawings for the shop. And they cut the pieces. And the welds now, I assume these pieces are joined together by welding, and because welding. the weld is rough, you grind it smooth so you can't see the joints. Yes, they did a real neat job in the welding and the grinding. At every, at every joint, you see that. And when it that's arrived here, it was already painted. Where did that happen? After we fabricate it, it goes to the local painter. He sandblasts it, primes it, and puts a good finished coat on it. Okay, so this is a back to us. standard paint job, but I understand that the railing out back is something a little different. It is. Can we yes, see that? Certainly. Tom, this little deck off the master bedroom is a nice touch. Yeah, isn't it, Norm? It looks great. Solid railing. It is. So what's different about this, Mike? This is a color galvanized finish. What's that mean? It means it's, it's embedded in zinc in these huge tanks. So it's a molten material, and they, after you fabricate it, they sink it in, and it coats the inside and the outside right. of all this. So it'll never rust. Exactly. What about the color? So when the product is still warm, it has a polyvinyl finish sprayed onto it, and make it so it will adhere real well. It'll last forever. Last forever. That's great. Okay, guys. This is the time in the project that we like most, when we turn the home over to the interior designers. And we have with us one of the best in the business, Jean Lamont. Hi, Steve. What do you think of the setting, Jean? It's beautiful. This old house has done it again. It's a wonderful house. Well, oh, thanks. You know, we faced a lot of challenges. And you must have faced a lot of challenges, too, as you did the interior design. We did. We really did. Well, what were they? The space itself is the challenge. This house is very large. The space is visually active. It's aggressive. It could almost be considered intimidating. Well, how have you solved those problems? With the selection of the pieces, everything had to be big. Big like this chest, very visually active, like this uh, graphic quilt above it. The large sofa, huge. It's textured white, so it's not dull to look at, but it's still very big. The table is big. Even the accessories are. This is no place for a bunch of tiny little things. So the secret is big and textured. Exactly. Now, have you carried that theme over? Uh, to the dining room here? We certainly have. Uh, we did it here by anchoring the table down with the area rug. The first thing is we had to carve the space out of this huge area. We did it with the area rug, then this very, very large handcrafted table, and behind it, this wonderful big painted piece that takes your eye right up to that beam where we wanted the eye to stop. So that's keeping sort of a visual ceiling. Yes. Okay. We purposely didn't put anything up above that beam so that the eye would stay down here on the living level. Mm -hmm. Now what about our library? It's an entirely different room. Right, sure. Very small, very cozy, and we made it look even smaller with this dark brick red paint. Again, cozy, mm -hmm. comfortable feeling room. A functioning uh, sleep room, uh, guest room, and also a wonderful library. I love the intimacy. I could spend uh, several hours mm -hmm. of a sunny afternoon in here reading. I could too, or a nice evening. Now how about the family room? Let's go look. And here's where old meets new Steve. We've got here the inevitable high-tech kitchen yeah. with its white tile, its stainless steel. It's beautiful, but it could be a little cold. So we softened it with these shaker bar stools and with some kitchen accessories to warm it up. Nice old wooden pieces and crockery pieces, some earthy tones to give it just a little more warmth. Yeah, they really stand out against that tile, too. Mm -hmm. Now over here, our job became a little more challenging. This is the transitional zone, and we have here a contemporary table, but these Windsor side chairs, very historic in line, but they're painted white, so they've got this nice, crisp, contemporary look. Yeah, I think it works well. Mm -hmm. But when we get into here, there is no question about it. This is traditional. Here we have wonderful old pieces. God, this piece is wonderful. Isn't it nice? Yeah. But this one is also very nice, very old, but inside it could contain all the electronic equipment that a family would want in the 1990s. Nice trick. It is. Let's see the second floor. Sure, come on. Bedrooms require some special considerations and design. In here, the key word is serenity. We have this beautiful pencil post bed, handcrafted by a local craftsperson. Lovely. And over here, a very nice sitting area. It's quiet, it's comfortable. The decorating here isn't flamboyant or dramatic. The colors are neutral. 
It's just very restful. A good place to relax. I think it's just perfect. Now, what have you done on the third floor? Oh, we have some fun up there. Come on, let's okay. take a look. Well, Jean, on this flight of stairs, you can really celebrate the beauty of our timber frame. Mm, can't you, though? What would you do with a space like this? Well, quite frankly, I wouldn't do anything to it. That space is so visually active that I couldn't think of anything to improve it. Yeah. It's perfect just the way it is. Uh, I agree. What about the bedroom? Oh, we had some fun in here. Starting with this window treatment. What do you think of that? I like it. I like it very much. What is it? Well, it's a length of fabric, and it's just looped through three grapevine wreaths attached to the wall. That's great. And it's coordinated with the little paisley table skirt and pillow shams, and that all works with our plaid daybed cover. You know, I love the sense of intimacy of this room, especially coming mm -hmm. off the great space. It's nice. Yeah. Very cozy. I think you and your colleagues have done a splendid job with the place, and thank I, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. But I have one more errand, and that's to go find our homeowners and see what their reaction is. Okay, Steve. Hey, Johnny. Hi, Count? You guys did great work on this project. Hi, Tommy. Hi, uh, Norm? Steve. Barb and Lynn. How are you? The place looks great. Yes, we're and you so guys excited. made it through. Yep, we made it through with friends and neighbors helping us paint over the weekend. We're out of old clothes. And out of friends. Oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> we owe a few back. <laughs> Would you do it again? In a flash. Yeah. Terrific experience. Uh, it mixed craftsmanship and art. Yeah. Uh, the quality of work, the Silva Brothers, the timber frame. Yeah. Everybody who worked on it did a wonderful job. Uh, we couldn't be any happier. Yeah. Just great. A lot of craftsmen put a lot of soul into this project. The oh, yes. Spirit of community throughout the whole thing, yeah. and we totally enjoyed it. Well, I hope you celebrate in a minute, but I want to chat with Norm for a second. So, we got a date in Santa Fe. That's right. A you know bit. anything about Adobe? Well, you know, we did an Adobe project a few years ago. And we learned a little bit about it. But I'm out of practice. Maybe we could do some more. Well, I suspect you can sling mud with the best of them, man. <laughs> and that, of course, is... It's done. Bug control and more. Priced at $19.95 plus handling, the softcover edition can be ordered by calling 1-800-441-3000. Credit cards accepted. Also available in bookstores. Hi, I'm Katie O'Mara. Join us tonight on CMU Public Television for Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau at 8 p.m. Tonight, famed underwater explorer Captain Jacques Cousteau wonders if man could, under special circumstances, develop a friendly relationship with an animal that is usually hunted by man. And then at 9 p.m. is the Lawrence Welk Show. Join Lawrence and his friends for a fun-filled evening featuring music of the Academy Awards. And then at 10 p.m. is Austin City Limits with special guests, the Forrester sisters, Tom Bess and Lane Brady. And ending our evening at 11 p.m. is the final program in the series Late Night America with Dennis Holy. That's tonight on CMU Public Television. TV worth watching. We invite you to stay tuned to CMU Public Television, a public service of Central Michigan University. Local broadcast of the new Yankee Workshop is made possible in part by a grant from the Tool House of Gladwin. Located next to Ace Hardware on North Silverleaf, the Tool House features Delta Power Tools along with most major brands of woodworking power equipment, hand tools, and supplies. Hi, I'm Norm Abram, and this is the new Yankee Workshop, where for the next 13 weeks, we'll be building pieces of furniture like these you see around me. Now, the idea of the show is that you can build these pieces of furniture right in your own home workshop, and then enjoy them for many years. In a moment, I'd like to show you the collection, and then we'll get started on our first project right here in the new Yankee Workshop. The new Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram and is made possible by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes and enamels, products that enrich, protect and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by Square D Company, a manufacturer of electrical and electronic products for homes, businesses and industry worldwide. Square D, dedicated to growth, committed to quality. 
Well, the collection includes this chest of drawers, a Shaker classic, and a cherry trestle table modeled after an antique we found on the island of Nantucket. And over here, we'll build a hutch inspired by a visit to old Sturbridge Village. Come on inside, I'll show you the rest of the collection. Well, here you see a desk made from maple, not yet complete, but you get the general idea. And over here, a bathroom vanity made from white oak and inspired by the dry sinks of the past. Here we have a pine corner cupboard, a nice bookcase, and a workbench. And over here on the other side of the shop, another classic, a drop leaf table made from ash. And another piece, the blanket chest made from pine but lined with cedar. And over here, another classic piece, the shaker bedside table. But today's project is a medicine cabinet, inspired by a couple pieces we found at the Hancock Shaker Village in Western Massachusetts. Take a look. The idea of a private bath to these 19th century Shakers was virtually an unknown. They shared everything. For instance, this retiring room or bedroom was shared by four sisters and we've been told that they were satisfied just having a table with a basin and a pitcher filled with water along with a bar of very harsh looking soap and down below on a little swivel to keep it out of the way the chamber pot another thing that surprises me is that for four sisters they were only allowed one small looking glass or mirror and they just hung it on these classic shaker pegs that were all around the room. And look at over here, they even hung a chair up on it that wasn't being used. Now we looked all over the museum to try to find a cabinet or a chest with a mirror on it. We found plenty of little ones like this and even some bigger ones like this one, which is nicely made of pine with shelves on the inside and a very nice overhang detail at the top but we couldn't find any with a mirror on them. So maybe there's a way that I can combine the looking glass with a nice cabinet like this and come up with something that even a Shaker sister would accept. An awful big order, though. What a wonderful place. Now, before we begin, I'd like to reassure you that if you'd like to make an exact copy of today's project, a measured drawing is available. And you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, here's how I built this medicine cabinet. Well, for my medicine cabinet, I think I'm going to use some red oak because it's that hard wood that can take all the abuse that that cabinet's going to get while it's being used. So I went down to my hardwood supplier and picked up some 1x6 to make the case of the cabinet. And then I ripped some stock down to 2 inches, one set for the face frame, one set for the frame on the door. Then I picked up some quarter-inch oak plywood, and uh, I was a little bit shocked at the price of it, but it's going to do a great job, and it looks good. One piece is going to be for the back of the mirror, and one piece is going to be for the back of the cabinet. Then I picked up a piece of oak about eight inches wide, and that'll be the top shelf. Now let's go over to the prototype and take a look and see how this thing is built. The case is put together with these finger joints. And I have one up here that's not glued up, and I can show you how it works. It's just little fingers, actually, that stick out and interlock with one another. And it's not only an attractive joint, but it's a very strong joint because there's an extraordinary amount of glue surface area. Now, to make the joint, we're going to use the table saw. And it's set up with a dado head cutter, and in this case, a two-blade cutter, which is adjustable for varying widths of material that you want to remove. And the real key to making the joint, this little jig. Not something that I just made up, you know, on my own. It's something that's been around cabinet shops for a long, long time. And it's pretty simple to make. It's just a piece of wood with a couple dados cut in it. One here, three-eighths of an inch wide. Then a three-eighths of an inch space. And another dado, three-eighths of an inch, which is filled with this little pin, which I screwed on from the bottom. And what you do is, using your T-square, you take the jig and you fasten it to your T-square with a couple screws. 
and I'll show you how this works. The first cut you make is with a little guide stick, a 3 eighths of an inch thick guide stick, and you put that up against the pin, slide a piece of material in, and make that first cut on one piece. Then, butt that piece up against the pin, and take your next piece, and without that little guide stick, slip it up against the pin. Pass through, it cuts both pieces at the same time. And after each pass, you just move over one slot, drop it down over the pin, and make the next pass. And when you're finished at the end, you'll get two pieces of wood that'll fit together perfectly, and a joint that's not, not many other joints that are stronger than this. So let's do some for real. Let's take a look inside our prototype medicine cabinet. And you'll see that before I can assemble this case, I have to drill some holes in the side pieces like these. And that's for these little clips that go in. They're shelf clips, and they'll help hold up our glass shelves. Now, there's quite a few holes to drill, and you want them to come out exactly spaced, so it's worth setting up a jig over here on the drill press. And what I did is took a piece of one by four, and put markings at every inch all the way down the length of it. Then, when I fastened it to my rip fence, I just made sure it was squarely aligned with the drill bit. Then I made an adjustment to the drill press so that when I drill down, it won't go through, it'll just drill the right depth. And using a quarter inch brad point bit, I'll be able to drill my holes. Now, I didn't want to start right at the bottom because you're never gonna have a shelf that close to the bottom. So I felt that four inches away, would be the appropriate distance. So I've put an S here to mark my starting point. And then over here on the other side, I've put another S for my stop point. Okay, a little bit of yellow glue spread out with my brush here. And I'll be able to fit these corners together using a little gentle persuasion from my rubber mallet. Well, I think I better check that case for square before the glue sets up. Let's see, I'll set this on the inside yeah, a little bit. Okay. Now, I didn't forget the clamps. I think the joints are tight enough that it's going to hold itself together. But I do want to let the glue set up, so I'll let that stay there. And we'll go back over here and look at the prototype. And I think we'll start working on this face frame. This is what the door hangs on. And these joints down here are made by using half lap joints. And if we look at the outside of the cabinet here, and I'll wet the joint a little bit so you can see it better. You can see that it sticks through half the thickness of the material. And I'll make that joint over on my radial arm saw, where I've set up the dado head cutter and then adjusted the height of the saw so that it's going to remove just half the thickness of the material. And I put guidelines of where I want to stop making the cuts. Okay, a little more yellow glue on this half lap joint. Set those together. Now I'm gonna drill some little pilot holes, really necessary with this oak. Whenever we nail or 
put screws in. We drill little pilot holes. Now these screws are not going to show because they're on the back side of the face frame and they're really only here to hold the joint together while the glue sets up. But with the glue set up on my case, I'm ready to sand out those box joints. But I have a little bit of a problem in that there's some little spaces here. I'm going to show you a little trick I learned how to fix those. You take some glue and you put a little bit in each one of those cracks. Then you can take the bag off your sander and dump out some sawdust, the same oak. And then just take that and spread it in all those little gaps. And then when you run the sander over it again, no one's ever going to know those spaces were there. Okay, the next thing that I want to do is put a rabbet in the back of my case to accept the plywood that's going to go in here. And to do that, I use my router with a 3 8 inch rabbeting bit. And I'll just plunge in and go around. Now, the problem is, is that I have a narrow board here for the router to sit on. So I'll hold it steady and just go slowly. Now the wrapping bit doesn't give me a square corner here. It leaves a little bit of a radius there. So I'll clean out that area with a nice sharp chisel. A little more yellow carpenter's glue, and I'm ready to put the back on. Of course, making sure that the oak side is facing the inside of the case. And I'll fasten it in place using some one-inch drywall screws. Remember, none of these are going to show because this cabinet will be screwed onto a wall somewhere. Well, meanwhile, we'll put a little more glue on the front edges of the cabinet, and we're ready to set the face frame. Now, I'll hold the face frame even with the top of the case and about an inch over each side and the bottom. And I've pre-drilled a hole here to fasten it with some four penny finish nails. We drive the nails in, set them, and later they'll be filled so that they don't show. Well, now I'm ready to start working on the door for the medicine cabinet. I could have joined the pieces together with a half lap joint like I did on the face frame, but the trouble with that is when I open the door, I will see those screws that are in the back of a half lap. So I chose to do a mortise joint, a through mortise. And if I wet the end of this here, you can see a little bit better where the mortise comes through. And that's held in place by a couple dowels. Now, another thing I'm gonna have to do is put a groove in all these pieces to hold the mirror in place. And that's the first step in the operation. I've got my pieces and I've set up the saw with the dado head cutter again. And it's set up to be a little bit more than a quarter of an inch wide. And it's about 7 sixteenths of an inch high, centered in each piece. The next thing to do is put a mortise at the top and bottom of each style. And that's best done by just using an ordinary saw blade in the table saw, because the dado head just doesn't come up high enough for this deep of a mortise. Well, next I want to make these tenons, which fit into the mortises I just did. Now, the first thing I want to do is make this shoulder cut right here. So I've set up the saw, and I've got the blade at the right height, and then I've added this gauge block. And what that does is it 
sets me up so that I make the cut in the correct place. Plus, this setup gives me some additional safety because whenever you use a T-square in combination with a rip fence, you always stand the chance of kickback. What this does is sets me up, and then when I get beyond it, I have clear space in here, so I won't have, I shouldn't have any problems with kickback. Okay, that's it for the shoulder cut. Now I need to make the cheek cut, which is along this direction right here. And I've readjusted the saw, moved the fence a little bit closer, and now we're ready to do that. Okay, with the frame dry fit together, I'll bring it over and set it on my face frame because I know my face frame is square. I just want to check the door frame and that lines up pretty good. I've also marked on these corners where I want to drill the holes for the quarter inch dowels which will hold everything together. And I'm ready to drill those over here on the drill press where I've set up a quarter inch brad point bit and I've Clamp the piece of wood to the table, and that's so that when the bit passes all the way through, it won't splinter out on the bottom. Well, the next thing to do is to put a quarter inch round over on the inside of the door frame. And to do that, I'll use this router bit. But I have a problem. The bit has a little ball bearing on it, and that's really a guide. It has to ride up against the material. And because I've already grooved the door, there's no place for it to ride. So what I've done is made some filler strips, which I'll just stick in the grooves. And now the bearing has a place to ride, and I'll have no problems. Now I'm just going to slide the mirror in. I've already pinned the joints down here at the bottom. And I've got some glue on the top joint, so I'll just get those set in here like this. And now I'm going to have to stand it up to drive that the rest of the way down. And Boy, hammers and mirrors. I hope I don't end up with seven years' bad luck. Okay. Now, I can set it back down flat, take these little quarter-inch dowels and just put a little bit of glue on them, and then drive those in through my pre-drilled holes. Now, the best way to remove the excess hardwood dowel is just to use the belt sander. Now let's look back at our prototype, and you'll see that the outside edges of the door are also rounded over. And that's a 3 8 inch radius round over, and I've set up a bit in my router, and I'm ready to run that. Okay, the next thing I want to do is attach the door to the face frame. And I'm going to use an inch and a half brass plated piano hinge to do that. Now, I suppose I could just surface mount the hinge to the door in the face frame, but I don't think that looks very good. So I use a full mortise, which is much neater and very professional. Now, I suppose you could chisel that out, but it's not an easy thing to do, especially on oak. So I have a way to do that, and I'll show you. The first thing you do is you set the hinge on the back of the door and using a sharp utility knife, scribe the end points of the hinge. Then, I'm going to take a router, 
which is set up with this half inch mortising bit and that cuts a very smooth surface on the bottom of the mortise and I've set it up in my router with this guide fence which controls the width of the cut. Now I'm going to have to cut the ends freehand following those scribe marks but that's not too bad I just have to be careful. Well, that does a real nice job making a smooth cut. And again, it would be very difficult to chisel this out by hand. The thing I want to make sure, though, is that I keep the router base perfectly flat on the door style. Because if I allow it to tip, it's going to chew out the edge of the door and I'm going to ruin it. Now, all I have to do is remove this little piece that's left in the corner. And then I'll do exactly the same thing to the face frame. Okay, with the hinge attached to the door, I'll clamp it to the face frame of my case, and then being sure to pre-drill some holes in this hard oak, just fasten it with the screws. Oh, that seems to fit pretty good. Now, there's one more thing I want to do, though, to the inside of this door. I don't want to see the back side of this mirror. So I've cut another piece of the quarter-inch oak plywood and that fits in between the styles and rails of the door frame. And I'll attach that to the mirror with a special mastic that I'll get at my glass center. But I don't want to do that right now. I want to coat the back side of this plywood with a sealer before I fasten it so that it won't absorb any moisture and swell up. Now the next thing I want to do is make this little shelf that goes on the top. And that's just our piece of eight inch oak, which has had the corners rounded off and then eased. Well, the first thing I want to do is knock off these corners. And I'm just going to use a good old American quarter for a template. Okay, and then I'll just take my drum sander and remove the material. Well, now I just have to route the rest of it. Now this router is mounted underneath a router table and I've set it up with a 3 8 inch radius roundover bit with a pilot bearing. Okay, to attach the top element to the case, I first drill a hole using a countersink bit. And then I'll fasten it with a one inch screw. Then I'll take a oak bung and apply a little bit of glue to it. And that gets set in this hole. Then I'll take my belt sander and sand off any of the excess bung. And this piece is ready for some finish. The key to getting a nice finish on any of these pieces is to do them in an environment that's as dust free as possible. That's why I've set up an area that's outside of the shop where all the dust is. And I've done all my sanding out there. And the last thing that I'm gonna do is do the final cleanup right here with a tack cloth. It's really just a piece of material like cheese cloth and it's been treated with some, some kind of a resin that makes it tacky and that'll pick up any of the remaining residue that might be left on the piece. Now this first coat is just a sanding sealer. And what it does is it penetrates the wood. And when it's dry, I'll sand it with a very fine sandpaper and it'll give me a perfectly smooth base for the finished coat. Well, it's starting to look pretty good already. I'll let this dry for a couple hours and then I'll be ready to sand it. Well, after the sanding sealer dried, I took the medicine cabinet back into the shop and I was able to lightly sand it with some 320 wet dry sandpaper. And when you do that, you end up with a little bit of residue here. And I vacuumed most of it off, and the last thing to do is remove the rest of the residue with a tack cloth. And now I have a nice smooth surface for the final coats. But before I put the final coat on, now that this piece of oak veneer plywood has been sealed on both sides, I'm going to stick it to the back of the mirror.
This is just a mirror adhesive that I got from my glass shop. This is the first coat of finish, a satin polyurethane. And I'll do a coat, let it dry, a little light sanding, and a second coat as the final finish. Now the key to a nice urethane job is to stir, not shake the can of finish. And as you apply it, use long strokes. Don't go over it a whole bunch of times. And the finishing touch, a little white porcelain knob. And with that, I don't think the medicine cabinet turned out too badly at all. Next time, we're going to build this workbench, something that every home workshop needs. Till then, I'm Norm Abram for the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop is made possible by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels. Products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by Square D Company, a manufacturer of electrical and electronic products for homes, businesses, and industry worldwide. Square D, dedicated to growth, committed to quality. Norm Abram is the author of the book, The New Yankee Workshop, which is available in bookstores and libraries nationwide. drawing of this medicine cabinet, please send $5 to New Yankee Workshop, Box E, Bedford, Mass, 01730. Local broadcast of the New Yankee Workshop is made possible in part by a grant from the Tool House of Gladwin, located next to Ace Hardware on North Silverleaf, the tool house features Delta power tools along with most major brands of woodworking power equipment, hand tools, and supplies. Many of today's programs are made possible in part by a grant from Long and Wetzel Company of Mount Pleasant. Stay tuned to CMU Public Television, a public service of Central Michigan University. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. What exactly are you planning to do with well, this barn. We're, we're not doing ex any excavation on the till at all. We're just we're staying within the footprint of the barn and merely restoring the barn. Oh, what a beautiful space. So, Jack, you build this one for 28000 too? <laughs> <laughs> so the structure is really worse than we thought. Much worse than we ever thought. In fact, I dragged one of the beams out here. Funding for this old house is provided by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains clear finishes and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hi, I'm Steve Thomas. Welcome to this old house. Well, you remember that last week, our master carpenter, Norm Abram, and our general contractor, Tom Silva condemned our wonderful old barn. They said, it's got to come down before we can build anything up. And they gave me the wonderful task of telling our homeowners, the Wickwires. This week, progress is well underway. It looks like the roof's off and all kinds of stuff is happening inside. Let's go find Norm. Norm. Hey, Steve. How are you? Good. Well, we're rolling, it looks like. What's oh, going yeah. on? Well, we've got a professional demolition crew here. You can see they're knocking some of the boards off the roof, and I am glad we have pros. Usually I mean, the homeowner does this, right? That's right. Usually the homeowner does this. 
but this is a job that you really have to know what you're doing. This thing is coming apart very easily, and the, the frame is not very solid. So you got to know where to stand. Uh, you got to have the right equipment. And these guys have, you know, the bars and the tools, and they've got a lift over here, which is really a feature that I think makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. What it allows them to do, it's like a, it's a scissors platform, and they're sitting on what's left, probably the most solid part of the building, the floor. And this gets them up close to the work so that they can be standing on something solid rather than walking around on top of the roof mm -hmm. or whatever, you know. So they get the right tools. Now, I noticed back there we have a come-along that's chained to a, a beam here. What's, yeah. what's going on with this? <laughs> well, they started to find that as they removed the skin of the building that it was starting to move and shake. So to hold things together, they've used some chains and come-alongs, and I think they're going to have to nail some braces on as they remove the skin to hold it together. Otherwise, the whole frame's just going to fall over. So the structure is really worse than you thought. Much worse than we ever thought. In fact, I dragged one of the beams out here. Let's flip it over. This is lovely. Try, just pick it up first. Try to pick it up. <laughs> this is like Not, half the weight that it should be. That's right. It's like styrofoam. And you can see the powder post beetle activity. I mean, it's just sawdust. Boy, this is just... And a lot of dry rot. So we're finding this throughout the barn. It is not in good shape. So we really made the right decision. Definitely, without a doubt. Now, what's happening with all this material? We've got a lot of uh, debris that we've got to get rid of. That's right. Well, if you remember, there was one dumpster that's already been removed from the site, and that was the things that were stored in mm -hmm. the barn by the wick wires. This is number this two? This is number two, and number three is around the corner. How many more are we going to need? Well, this is I'm thinking, pretty expensive. Yeah, it? I'm thinking about three or four, so there's a fair amount of expense involved in mm -hmm. the removal of the debris. But we are going to save the beams. We are. What's this, Steve? Well, Some we've diapers? got uh, yeah, we've got diapers, we've got pipe wrenches, we've got probes, safety glasses. And, and who are all these people uh, we've here? We've got bright colored tape, we've got men in red suits. This is a tank removal and cleaning company that has come to remove our little farm gasoline storage tank that was buried there. All these people for a little farm gas pump. Right. It's not like the old days. I bet you used to, you used to do it differently before, huh? Probably, yeah. 15, 20 years ago, I suppose you would use the gas in the tank, and then you'd dig it up, or maybe not dig it up at all, and then throw it out in the field somewhere. It's not going to happen here. Those days are gone. Uh, I had a conversation recently with an official from a state agency. She was very concerned that nothing that we did on our construction site wash into our wetlands. We've got our pond back mm -hmm. there that we saw. We've got a pond across the street here, and there's another one over there. And she was really concerned that anything that we might do might have an impact. And, and where do we stand on that? We're clean on that. We're far enough away, and, and we're really not going to have an impact on that. So our wetlands. construction is fine. We're OK, and I was relieved to find that out. She grabbed me on the underground oh, storage really? tank. So this is going to be a big deal. It's a big deal. Let's have a look. So Arlene, what do you think of our pond? Well, the pond looks to be pretty healthy. Um, looks like the water is fairly clear, and I hear a lot of birds and wildlife around. I even noticed you've got a good, fairly good crop of uh, freshwater shellfish here. And I noticed that there's an awful lot of water insects along the surface, and I even see some evidence that there's a pretty good fish population here. So it looks like this pond is pretty healthy and has been pretty well protected. Mm -hmm. What are the department's general concerns? Well, the problem is that uh, most wetlands haven't been protected like this one has. Mm -hmm. In fact, in this country, over half of all wetlands have been filled. And uh, in the old days, wetlands were thought to be useless, mosquito-infested swamps that were only good for um, filling in mm -hmm. and, and converting to more, quote-unquote, useful purposes. And since then, we found that wetlands are extremely valuable for pollution control, for flood control, uh, for fisheries and wildlife. Uh, shellfish, and it's really important to the economy. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that wetlands uh, really help filter and cleanse our drinking water supplies. And we've lost an awful lot of drinking water supplies to contamination, so to the extent that we can protect these wetland areas, we'll be protecting our own drinking water supplies. So what about our situation here? How do we stand? Well, it looks like uh, you've got a small fringe of wetlands along the boundary of this pond. In fact, it looks like there's a surveyor's flag right on the shrub, and that's, that delineates the edge of this wetland. So it looks like you've got a 10 to 20 foot strip of uh, nice, healthy, vegetated wetland bordering on the pond. And um, as long as you're not going to be doing any work within 100 feet of this flag, I don't see that there would be any problem. Mm -hmm. what, what exactly are you planning to do 
with well, this we're, barn. We're not doing ex any excavation on this hill at all. We're just we're staying within the footprint of the barn and merely restoring the barn. Uh -huh. So there, nothing is going to happen here at all. Well, what we would be concerned about is if you are going to be disturbing any of the soil, if any of this grass uh, mm -hmm. would be removed, any of the topsoil removed, or any construction debris stored in this area. What we'd like to see is the, this entire 100-foot buffer zone between the wetland and the barn uh, be maintained in its natural state. Well, <clears throat> would you put up any kind of protection or...? Well, the only, the only thing that uh, might be suggested is if you are going to be storing any construction debris or in any way altering the top of this slope, uh, what might be a good idea is to have a row of staked hay bales around the toe of the slope. That mm -hmm. way, if any of this debris or sediment washes down the hill, it wouldn't make its way into the pond. But since we're not doing that, it sounds like uh, we're, just, we're pretty good just as we are. Well, except for one thing. <laughs> I noticed as I drove in, there was an old gas tank at the top of the hill. Oh, that, that hasn't been used for years. Well, do you mind if we take a look at it? Really? No. Let's go. Sure hope we can save this, Harleen, because it's one of the most picturesque elements on the site. Well, you might be able to save the pump that's on the top of the ground. The problem, though, is what's going on underneath. <clears throat> really? I don't... I don't think there's anything going on underneath. Well, the problem is that there's uh, probably an abandoned steel tank that's still on the ground. This whole pump looks to be, uh, God, 60, 80 years old. And most of the tanks that are put in the ground are bare steel. And the mm -hmm. problem is they corrode just the same way that this, this old pump here is mm -hmm. corroding. You can see it around the bottom. So why can't we just grab it with a backhoe and throw it in the dumpster and well, get it out of here? Well, not quite that easy. You want to make sure that if there's any gasoline left in the bottom of the tank, it doesn't... Um, come out of the tank and into the ground where it would migrate into that pond. So you want to make sure you go to the fire department and get a permit and get a licensed contractor to properly remove this. And we wouldn't want you to, for instance, dispose of it in that dumpster mm -hmm. there. We'd want to make sure that it was taken to the right place so it wouldn't have any potential of contaminating uh, groundwater. Well, you've made my day, Arlene. Well, we've got to do things right. Yeah, I know you do. Thanks very much. Okay, let's go. Hook it up. Steve, you're right. This is going to be a big deal. Yeah, I want you to meet Rick Bell. He's the manager of the company. Hi, Rick. Rick. Hi. How are you? Welcome on board. Hi, Steve. What do we got going here? Well, we have a 500-gallon gas tank. How okay. do you know it's 500 gallons? Well, we've uh, tape measured it from the grade down, and it appears to be a four-foot tank. Uh -huh. Standard size for that would be about 500 and gallons. And it's got gasoline in it? It has gasoline in it. This is obviously a hose. It's going to this big truck. What, yes. What's this all about? The, this uh, vacuum truck? Uh, Stainless steel, 3,000-gallon vacuum truck. So this will handle any kind of nasty stuff you put in it, right? Yes, it will. Okay. So, Rick, what do we got to go in here? Well, we've removed the product from the tank, and we've added some water to rinse the tank. This is the first rinse. Uh, we'll suck it out, and then we'll break dry ice into small chunks and drop it down the top of the tank. What's the dry ice for? The dry ice puts a, a CO2 blanket inside the tank in order to displace the oxygen in there so that uh, we don't have to worry about an explosion. Rick, what's, what's this fellow doing here? Well, he's placarding the vehicle to indicate the gas and water that we'll be transporting this morning. The placard number 1993 is for a gasoline mixture that we'll be uh, moving this morning, and uh, if he was using some other flammable or some other combustible, he'd have a different number. It's like you have the tank exposed, Dave. Any surprises here? Or is this about what you expected? Just about uh, what we anticipated. The tank looks to be intact. Looks yeah. to be the 500-gallon size that we anticipated. Let's, uh, let's get some readings on this soil, make sure we don't have any contamination. Now, Rick, what, what is this instrument? Well, this is uh, an instrument that measures the level of hydrocarbon in the air above the soil. It's an indication if there's any contamination in the soil that we'd have to be careful of and would have to handle as a remediation project. Mm -hmm. And how does it look? Check right here. You're getting any readings there, Glenn? No. Soil appears to be clean so far. Rick, it looks like the chief of the Concord Fire Department has arrived. What's his interest in our proceedings today? Well, the chief is here to issue us a permit to remove the tank. We made application to remove the tank earlier this morning, 
and he's come out this morning to inspect the tank to make sure there were no holes in the tank and also to inspect the base of the hole to make sure there was no contamination in the ground. Um, and all our paperwork is in place to handle the uh, liquid being hauled off the site. Rick, it seemed to go pretty well today. Let's say a typical home homeowner wanted to remove his oil tank. About how much would it cost him? Well, 2000 to 2500 would be a good budget number. If there are no problems. With no complications, exactly. Thanks a lot for sharing your crew and your expertise with us. Thank you. It's been you. a pleasure. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Rick. Norm, let's go check out the barn. OK. Norm, I don't know if you could pay me any amount of money to do demolition again. Well, you don't like the bats, the dust, the bees, the bees, the uh, taking a dive from one of these rotten timbers up here. Needless to say, all the rusty nails that you can get tetanus from. That's right. But even as this place is going down, we can see the new one starting to shape, take shape uh, on paper. That's right. You had a chance to go down to Nantucket and meet with Jock Giffen. Yeah, I had. I went down with the Wickwires yesterday. Beautiful day. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, what do you nice. think of it? Lovely. It's amazing to think that somebody as rotten as Captain Ahab could have sailed from such a picturesque place as Nantucket. Look, here's 58 Main Street. That's Jock's office. That's fine. That'll be good. Here's Jock here for now. Jock, I recognize you from your many appearances on this old house. Steve Thomas. Hi, Steve. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. I brought with me Barb Wickwire. Hi, Barb. Hi, Jack. Welcome to Nantucket. Thank Barb's you. Barb's got a barn. Great. Well, let's come in and talk about it. Good. Do you have a good state trip down? Good trip. Good. Jock, Barb and her husband Lynn live on a beautiful piece of property in Concord, Massachusetts. Now, on this property, there's a barn built in about 1835. The barn is in rough shape. And what they want to do is, is convert the barn into a residence. So we've come here for design. Great. Well, I've seen the photographs. It looks like a very exciting project. And uh, let's, you know, let's uh, talk about it. Have you ever lived in a barn before, Barbara? Not ever, no. no. Uh, you visited people that have lived in barns? Yes, yes. yeah. And we've, it's a romantic notion, I think, we have, living in a barn and using that big space, um, keeping the outside of the barn looking like a barn and having a modern interior. Is that reasonable architecturally? Absolutely. We, you know, it's the uh, post and beam framing is very popular in the country now. Uh, we do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. it. It is a wonderful idea. Very open living. Uh, in fact, here on Nantucket, we've got a couple of examples. We did uh, two barns. One is, uh, is, is very simple. It's retained its barnness. We haven't changed it that much. The other one has been very highly finished, and I'd love to show you both of them. And uh, that would be a good place to start, I think. I think we should go take a look right now. Great. Let's go. Well, Jock, is this what they call a million-dollar view? No, I think it probably is. This is Pulpus Harbor, which is a, uh, a relatively shallow little harbor that, that opens up into Nantucket Harbor. So it's a couple of miles out of town. But this is what I want you to see. This is the, this is the barn that was being taken apart uh, by my neighbor in Pennsylvania. That, uh, I stepped in and offered to take it off his hands for him. And we took it down and uh, had, the, had some new siding milled at a sawmill there, loaded it all up on a truck and brought it up here and reassembled it. How long ago was that? That was uh, 1970, yeah. 19 years ago. Just Steve. out of curiosity, Jack, how much uh, was this project to build in 1970? Uh, I think the whole thing, including the appliances, the, you know, the the everything, lighting, wiring, plumbing, was $28,000, Steve. $28,000. Incredible. Well, let's go inside. On your right, we have the kitchen. It's a uh, wonderful, open, simple, utilitarian kitchen. As you can see, everything is right here, and it opens right up onto the, the great room. Well, this is a great room, John. These must be the chestnut uh, posts and beams that you were talking about. Yep. All the way from Pennsylvania. They look like they're hewn with a broad axe, and then the rafters look like they're mill sawn up there. What, what would that have been that way in the original structure? No, the the rafters would probably be uh, uh, they are they are new and different. The old barn had uh, 
small caliper trees just flattened on one side for mm -hmm. the raptors, but we couldn't mm -hmm. get those. But the walls are just the way the old barn would have been, which is just uh, vertical, rough sawn, hmm. very, uh, very simple, has a nice rustic quality to it, I think. What about these lovely recessed windows, Jack? Great idea. Yeah, they did that for two reasons, Barbara. The first reason is just to get the glazing off the outside surface of the, of the building to, to maintain the barn quality, mm -hmm. the look of the barn from the outside. Now, the second reason is that on all of these openings that are recessed, we've got an exterior door so that we can uh, get in and out without you know, being out of the rain, keeping the doors out of the weather. I like this idea. Do you think we might be able to incorporate it in our barn? I don't see why not. We should look at it. Chuck, what's the function of these catwalks that I see running around the building here? Well, uh, the master bedroom is at this end, and the children's bedrooms are at that end, and the catwalk uh, connects them, uh, adds, a, adds a little drama. And I think that the parents uh, feel a little relieved to have that kind of connection with the, the children and, and still be separate. So we uh -huh. sort of got the best of both, I think. Uh -huh. uh, Served by these two sets of stairs here. here. Yeah. What about the sailcloth? Well, the sailcloth, I think, is a very good solution to, the, to uh, how to, to do the, the, the balusters, the, the railings to make that uh, walkway safe for children. One, you know, the traditional way is to put little uh, vertical balusters all the way up and around. And I think that using the sailcloth here was a really very creative solution to that. It, it really seems to fit in here and uh, uh, looks great. I think. Mm -hmm. What's back the in here? Nature of the island, too. This is, uh, Frank is a, is a writer, so we had to have uh, a place for books and a place to read books. This is on those uh, cold and gray days that we get here from time to time, a place to curl up with a, a good book in front of a fire. Moby so, Dick. Moby Dick, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Nice to have cozy spaces when you have great spaces like this, too. Yeah. Now, Jack, the floors are, are rough on oak as well? Absolutely, yeah, the same. Uh, I think they're just very reminiscent of what, a, what would have been in the barn originally. Mm -hmm. They uh, unfinished, untreated, and uh, just a uh, real solid deck, too. Yeah. Yeah. I like the size of the boards. Yeah. I think it's worked, worked well. Yeah. It's great. Jack, so. how do you heat a place like this? Oh, I'm glad you asked, Barbara. That's a tough one. Um, this house, of course, was built as a summer house. Uh, it wasn't meant to be heated and, uh, and isn't heated. Uh, it's difficult to heat a high space like this. I think what we should do is go look at the other barn I mentioned because we did address the heating issue there. It is heated and it is insulated, and you can do it. Great, let's run over and have a look. Great. Well, this is the place. Wonderful. Much different treatment uh, than the last one. Totally different structure. Uh, it doesn't really look like a barn. How would you describe it? Well, the owner does call it a barn, Steve, although no animals have ever lived here. But it's a, it's a new building. It's a very good example, I think, of the uh, timber frame building. I think an unusual feature is the, uh, the stones on the outside, mm -hmm. the stone facade. Kind of reminds me of the cobbles outside your office on Main Street. Yeah, exactly. Let's go in. Oh, what a beautiful space. So, Jack, did you build this one for 28000 too? <laughs> <laughs> well, that probably cost a little more than that, uh, Steve. But anyway. I like it. It's, it's beautiful. There's a foyer here with stairs down to two bedrooms underneath. Uh, and four steps up here to the, uh, the main room here, which is, in fact, a guest house and a summer house, guest house, uh, but it is fully winterized, fully heated, and uh, we've got a working fireplace here. Uh, we've got some, some of those stones that you saw on the outside of the building, and that's, I think, quite handsome. Uh, it's got a fabulous view of the Nantucket mm -hmm. Harbor down there. Beautiful. And, uh, oh, a only, gorgeous only deck. Only million dollar views for Jack. That's there. right. <laughs> uh, gorgeous deck. You know, a lot of, a lot of light, a lot of windows. It's really a beautiful room, I think. I notice, you know, you got all these windows here, but I also notice a bunch of artificial lights here, these tracks. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. The, at night, you know, when you don't have the natural light coming in, the lighting is very important in a big open space like this. It's uh, difficult to do well, I think, and we've uh, spent a lot of time here on it. We've put track lights in on top of these timbers with, uh, uh, as you can see, quite a few individual fixtures and that gives us the flexibility. We can move the lights around and, and uh, get it the way we 
think is nicest. All these pictures must be very expensive. Well, there's certainly a lot of them, Barbara. Mm -hmm. How do you dust it? <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe you invite over your tall friend. Uh -huh. Jock, the frame just knocks me out. I mean, I, I just, I'm just standing here just sort of looking around in awe at the frame. Yeah. And, um, it's beautiful. Yeah. It, it is. is this Longway Southern Pine? Is that what the, yes. the wood is? Yes. It's actually 150-year-old uh, recycled uh, yellow pine from, from the old mill buildings. They've uh, salvaged it, recut it, resurfaced it, and, uh, you know, cut it into the, the frame you, that you see. Did you see this a lot in uh, industrial buildings? Weren't these used all over the place? Yes, they were. It was very, very, uh, very American wood. Um, you know, I'd like you to really uh, take a look at the, the craftsmanship uh, was built. This was done by Ted Benson, and he did a beautiful job. This, these joints are fabulous. They, uh, you know, all mortise and tenon, but but beautifully cut. The joints are very true, as you can see. I'm especially impressed by these, where this gable comes into the main frame. That that angle, uh, these angle joints are incredibly difficult to do. Okay. They were. Uh, they. Uh, it, it looks easy when you do it well, but it's uh, it's really beautiful. In fact, this little. This little gable Ted was so proud of that he included it uh, as a the cover photograph of his book, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the best book ever done on timber frame housing. And it's uh, uh, you know, I, Do you think he's somebody that we could get for the Wickwires? I think we really ought to talk to him. He he he'd be wonderful if we could do that. He's mm -hmm. a very a wonderful guy. I I just the frame just knocks me out. I love it. I really love it. Um, Jack, I have a question about the windows. I noticed that they're all very low. Yes. I think that this, the, you know, when you get a high space like this, to keep the human quality of it, to mm -hmm. make it uh, really cozy, we've kept the windows down, a slower windowsill, keep the heads down, uh, so that when you're sitting down, the room is much friendlier and nicer. I think it's very important. But let me show you the bedrooms here, upstairs. Good. Um, it's, you know, in a timber frame house, it's just, you know, it's tricky to do. Uh, Jock, one of the things that's impressing me is that I was not aware um, about how important the timber frame structure is in the whole visual quality of a space like this. Yeah, well, I'm glad. It's been very helpful to have a look at it then. Mm -hmm. And the view from up here is even more extraordinary. And again, I'm, just, I'm so impressed with the frame here. But I was wondering, uh, what would the southern pine have looked like without the pickling? Well, it would have been much darker, Steve. It, uh much darker. So I guess the, the thinking behind that was to try to get it to blend in with the plaster walls and reduce the visual activity of the exactly, frame. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at the, we got two bedrooms here. Each has its own bath, mm -hmm. as you can see down there with a closet. And then the, the bedroom itself, which the timber framing is exposed in. And I guess you should, you should note that the you know, windows, putting a window uh, in a timber frame is, is limited. You can't put a window anywhere, obviously not where the where the frames are. Well, I like the use of the timber frame as a headboard. Very impressive. And I really like the cedar decking here, which just soars up and really opens this room up. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think with it, without the, you know, raising the ceiling makes a what would have been a small room a lot bigger, a lot more spacious, and I think that's in keeping with a sort of timber frame idea. Mm -hmm. so, and off here we have a little little balcony. Oh, yeah, nice. Oh, yeah, is this the... Oh. This is, this is one of your signatures, isn't it, Jock? I seem to recall several of these on this old house project. Well, it might be true. Uh, I do favor balconies off bedrooms, but... It gives uh, you a... it seems very luxurious. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fun to... fun to do. The floors are, again, southern pine, Jock? Yes, more yellow pine, uh, treated much the way the posts are, mm -hmm. pickled. Um, They've been also, you know, uh, bunged down, screwed and bunged. You can see the little bungs mm -hmm. there. And then finished with a coat of polyurethane. I'm very impressed with Ted Benson's work. Do you think he might be interested in our little project in Concord? Well, Ted is a, uh, you know, a good friend of the show, and I'm sure we can twist his arm and get him involved. It that'd, would be a good idea. That'd be great. Well, we've got work to do. Your husband comes in this afternoon. Yeah. Guess we better go back to the office, sit down, start to make a list of the things we want to put in this building. Great. Let's get to it. Let's go. Well, what did you think of that great timber frame building on Nantucket? That was a beautiful project. And, you know, Ted Benson is no stranger to this old house. Several years ago, he was on the show teaching novices how to timber frame up in Brunswick, Maine. Well, I saw it. It was great. And next time, Ted's going to be with us himself. We're going to have a crane on the side, as I understand it. 
and he's going to personally supervise dismantling our timber frame to see how much we can actually use. Yeah, well, I wouldn't hold your breath too long. I don't know how many timbers he's going to really be able to get out of that barn. You're finally starting to convince even me, Norm. <laughs> anyway, next week, we're going to have a look at the plan. We're going to see how much of this barn we can actually reuse. Until then, I'm Steve Thomas. And I'm Norm Abram. For this old house. Funding for this old house is provided by Parks Corporation, makers of Carver Trip wood stains, clear finishes, and enamels, products that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by State Farm Insurance and the more than 17,000 State Farm agents for family insurance needs, auto, home, life, and health. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. volume to This Old House, written by Bob Vila with Jane Davison, is a comprehensive guide for homeowners who want practical advice on how to understand, plan, and manage a home rehabilitation project using both professional help and their own time and effort. To order your copy of the softcover edition, call 1-800-441-3000. 1995 plus shipping and handling. Credit cards accepted. From energy-efficient vinyl windows and insulated doors to vinyl siding, we're Northern Michigan's largest home for energy-efficient and maintenance products. We're Astro Building Products, South Airport Road, Traverse City. In 1980, 